and it's day two of the DreamHack Dallas Open featuring Brawlhalla. Live from inside the Dallas Convention Center, it's the day for our singles competition. Teams and players from all around have joined us in sunny Dallas, Texas for some Brawlhalla competition as teams and players battle their way through the open pools and bracket for their shots at $70,000. Welcome everyone, I'm your host, Win Ann, better known as White Sheepy, and alongside me once again, it's Duke, Sparky, and of course, Remy. Uh, guys, yesterday we saw some crazy, amazing gameplay um, as we narrowed down our top four in doubles. So guys, what are your first thoughts uh, going into day two with the singles competition as we find our top eight? I'm gonna start with you, Duke. Well, uh, I think we put out a lot of predictions yesterday, and most of them have pretty much been blown up. And I feel like that's kind of been something that's very interesting about coming into this weekend is like, uh, is there that consistency? We kind of talked about it yesterday, right? Is like, how is the consistency? Who's going to be the one who continually is trickling to the top? And so far, it doesn't really seem to be the case, at least in 2v2s, right? The San Diego team that won is already out of the tournament for today. The top two seeds of today or of the tournament this weekend for 2v2s are out of the tournament. So I'm kind of expecting something similar in 1v1s as well. So it's always interesting given that we, uh, of course, have to do 2v2s on one day and then 1v1s on the other day, because regardless of what order we do it in, one always has implications on the other, because the people who do poorly in 2v2s have to carry that into the next day for 1v1s. Players like Boomy, players like Sandstorm have to carry their seemingly disappointing performance into the next day. Same thing goes for players who do really well in the tournament. Lores, Knees, Luna, players like that coming off of incredible performances yesterday, bringing that into 1v1s as well, having that confidence, but also what happens today? Does a poor performance today shake you into 2v2s on Sunday? Do you have that top four from 2v2s and be like, okay, I'm in this spot? Instead of dividing my attention between twos and ones, I'm really, you know what? I'm just going to focus on twos because that's where I'm top four. So there's a lot of like variables up in the air and a lot of implications that come from having to split up the game modes into two different days. That's definitely something that you can always tell takes effect. And uh, last at San Diego, we did see that Megdi was the only player that ended up playing and that Sunday final for both game modes. Now, I'm thinking personally that we might see something like that here again. Uh, I do have Godly in the top of my predictions and he is in the 2v2 sides of it, but it would not be surprising to see him fall out of the ones early, especially the way he was talking earlier in those pull setups. It might, it might happen and we might be seeing like another um, type of event where we have single people in both game modes, you know, towards yep. the end of it. It's a Sunday. People are focused on what they are in. They have to push for that 2v2 synergy. Uh, if they made it into top four of twos, they want to focus on that. They want to get that dub home. But you know people like Boomy, they fell out early. Sandstorm fell out early in the 2v2s. Now it's 1v1s. They're going to focus, drive hard on that. It's like Sparky said, when you have the opportunity on that one game mode, that's where you're going to put your balls on. Well, we're going to see what happens today. I want to also just kind of talk about and highlight yesterday. You know, yesterday we narrowed down our final four in the doubles competition. So, you know, let's take a look back at some of that action now. Guys, what do you think of this? This is Act No Blaze versus Luna and Snowy. I mean, an absolutely amazing set. Went to game number five and had a, a pretty interesting finish at the end of it because Acto and Blaze end up going to the elimination side. And then again, that match with them versus uh, Knees and Loris. Absolutely insane set. If you missed it, I highly recommend you go back and watch it because that was another one where uh, I think a lot of people expected one uh, outcome and a completely different one ended up happening. Yeah, if we're looking at just South America alone, it's like you have Fiend and Use, you have Wesley and Sack, and then you know you have the cross-region team of Young, Lores, and Knees. Everybody thought, or at least I certainly thought, like, okay, Fiend and Use, if there's one team in the top four, it's going to be Fiend and Use. That didn't happen. Then I was like, okay, all right, Wesley and Sack, you know, still not a bad runner-up for that, so they're going to be the South American team in top two, in top four of 2v2. Nope, that didn't happen at all either. It was Lores and Knees. So there's a lot of interesting narratives going on in South America with shakeups, of course, of course, Luna and Snowy knocking out Boomy and Sandstorm 3-1. Got to watch that earlier uh, yesterday. It was on the one of the matches over there. That was insane to see, seeing them play so well and then continuing that through the bracket. So there are a lot of really interesting narratives going on. And then Godly and Fozy, Akno and Blaze, they want San Diego and they're nowhere to be found in the top four. So we have a lot of shakeups in every single region. 
Now, Godly and Fozzy, I did have those guys on number one in my prediction, so I'm very happy they ended up making that top four spot. And this Knees and uh, Laura's team, I had the pleasure of casting them earlier uh, that day, and they were playing out of their minds. Laura is doing a lot of work on that team. Uh, showing South America still has what it takes, even when they have to pull a teammate across the world. That's a team you can't even practice with. And they're sitting here top four three Dallas. That's insane to me. Well, of course, you know, we're talking about the players, we're talking about doubles. Well, obviously, we have the top players here right now, literally playing in pools for their singles. So, yesterday, they were playing as a team, but today, it's pretty much every man for themselves, right, guys? So, you know what? Let's start off by talking about Godly and Sparky. I'm going to look at you. Tell me about Godly in today's singles competition. Godly's firing all cylinders this weekend, man. He's going to be feeling good after the 2v2 placements that he got yesterday alongside Fozy. He's going to be feeling good, and I think he's going to be going into this one with a lot more confidence than maybe he normally has. Because again, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go back to what I just said of if we're looking at DreamHack San Diego, didn't do so well. Came off a bad performance there. Ended up getting seventh in two v twos and then ninth in one v ones. So not making it in the top four for two v twos seemed like it really hurt him for one v ones. Are we going to see the exact opposite of that happening this time, where he has made it in the top four? He's totally fired up. He's ready to go into one v ones. Focused on today because that's the beauty of splitting up those game modes into two days. It's a double-edged sword. It can be tough sometimes, but also today, Saturday, he only has to worry about one v ones. All of his focus can be on on 1v1s and making it to the end of the bracket. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. That's kind of been <laughs> the story for Godly. Yep, that's been his story. For a while now, is every time there's these high expectations for him, he ends up just shy of the finish line. At BCX, he beat out Luna, his main competition, ended up falling to Impala. Even at the Spring Royale recently, right, he goes into the Grand Finals, and it's used out of nowhere. South America was able to take home a gold medal before EU in 1v1s. Godly has been so close to that finish line that this year it's really a question of, oh, is, is it going to be this tournament? When is it going to happen? It's going to happen eventually, but the question is, when is it going to happen? And uh, who knows? It could be Dallas. And there he is right there. You see him on the screen. Young Godly. He's been waiting for that victory. Hey, Godly. What's up, man? I don't know if... Yeah, he can hear us. There he is. <laughs> we love Godly. He's, he's, he's one of my favorite players, for sure. Uh, he's an entertaining player to watch. For sure. And he puts himself out there vocally a lot more than pretty much any other player at this point. And, like, sometimes that's it's going to bite him in the butt, and he takes some punishment for that. But that means he's such a fun player to watch. So enjoyable to have banter with. That's why, like, low-key, I'm a Godly hater, because he's just fun. He's just fun. Hey, man. And I i mean, it's Mr. PR1 himself. It so, is. I mean, we'll see how well he does today. Now, we still have other players to talk about and take a deep dive on. Now, Remy, I'm going to look at you because I know you are a champion yourself playing Brawlhalla, competing in it. Um, tell me a little bit about Impala. What are your thoughts? Impala is a very special case and special person because you don't just come out of nowhere and win BCX unless your name was LDZ, right? <laughs> so seeing as Impala did what was unheard of there, people were already ragging on there going like, all right, that's that's maybe it's a fluke victory, right? The that was that, that was me. Yeah, I was that this person. guy. I was this that guy person. Was a hater. <laughs> he saw the trophy get lifted up and he's still hating. Yeah, that's imp that's impressive. For hate. real, that's a one hater. <laughs> yes, sir. Now moving on to Winter Championships, they saw he was gonna come back in. It's the Winter's curse. You know, you don't win BCX and win Winters. He kept he kept it correct, right? He didn't win Winters. He, he didn't even make the Royale placing top four in that in that tournament, but he did come back strong in San Diego. Sure, the bracket got reset, but after that, it didn't even look close anymore. And Paula is feeling confident. He's feeling strong, and he's one of those players that stay on their character. He's been playing this Kaya since he got the game, and he makes it look very good. The ins and outs of the characters are really pushed through when you look at Impala play, and his road here has been a dominant one. Both the lands that have happened so far in this, like, I don't want to say year because it was a separate year, but this, like, quarter of Brawlhalla, he's been the one dominating them, and that's probably why he's going to come in here, PR1 NA. And that's one of the hardest things that you can possibly do in virtually any career, trade, profession, what have you. Getting to the top spot is almost impossible. Staying at the top spot. And that's why I was an Impala denier, because we have seen people make it into that top spot. And they deserve all the praise in the world for that. But it's so difficult to maintain that top spot. And that's why I'm no longer an Impala denier after San Diego happened. 
That's what really blew my mind, because what did he do? He came in with the same Kaya. Kaya got, you know, some nerfs. They weren't major nerfs changing anything up, but he came in with that Kaya that we already knew about. People had seen footage of that Kaya. They had time to prepare for it, and it was still too much for them. Definitely. You see that at BCX. All right, it's your first time playing Kaya. Even Godly was saying that. He said, I lost to Akno's Kaya. I didn't think I'd see it again at BCX. Okay, no more excuses now. San Diego, you've seen it. He's still beating you guys. What are you going to do now? Ooh, good question, good question, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see it today too. Um, and as a big Kaya fan, I'm, I love it. I'm excited. Um, so our next player, I know you had regrets yesterday about it, and you know it's okay. It's okay. Things can change. We learn from our mistakes. from our mistakes. Let's okay. talk about Luna Duke. It, it's it's tough as a Luna fan. I really wanted, like, I was ready to just be really hard on him and be like, you know what, you done felled off, and I, you got to, you know, get back up on the horse and start putting in that grind. And I think, you know, I'm not his dad, but I'm pretty sure he's out there being <laughs> like, yeah, you know what, you're right. Like, bro, I got to go back in and put the work. And clearly he's been putting in the work, and that's what I saw yesterday is somebody who put in the time, has been putting in that effort. Yeah, the meta shifted. He's not playing that Lucian anymore, but he's still managing to stay on top, and I I think yesterday was kind of this reaffirmation for all of us Luna fans out there that, you know what, all right, he's back on top. Let's keep an eye on this guy. So, of course, I got I got big uh, dreams for this guy here today, considering his plays yesterday in 2v2s. Like Sparky said, how people do in 2v2s influences how you feel in 1v1s. The amount of respect NA pros have for Luna always impresses me. It's huge. Anyone you talk to, you go, all right, who are you worried about losing in this tournament? Players are confident. They'll go, uh, I don't think anyone can beat me. Except Luna. He's <laughs> always the guy that people are talking about. I've never seen anyone work harder, practice harder, because he's the guy that every single tournament, the placement went up. We saw him get second uh, to Snowy. Next tournament, win. The placements were going up every single time till he had that win streak. And yeah, like Duke said, he's sort of kind of, you know, started taking the backtrack, losing some more, but he was still hungry. He may have lost BCX, but he came back, he won the Royale. He may have won San Diego. He's here at DreamHack Dallas. What does he want? I mean, uh, he didn't win San Diego. He's here at DreamHack Dallas. What does he want to do? He's going for that gold. Yeah, I, uh, eyes on the prize. Um, and he's sitting at PR2 too. And I, I really do agree that like what we have already been discussing, like just the way you feel about your doubles placement is going to really influence you and maybe probably motivate you and how you're going to do and your singles. Now, Remy, I'm actually going to go back to you because I know you talked to this person. Tell me about Sandstorm. Sandstorm has been hungry since BCX. Now, he didn't get to play the game a lot before that. He was focusing on other things, but he made sure he grinded for BCX. He came out there, and then he realized the game wasn't as easy as he thought it'd be. He realized it wasn't the same scene that he left, and he said, okay, I actually have to grind for this. Now, we've been, I've been talking to uh, Taza about it. His placements have just been going up as well, kind of like that Luna story where Winter Championships, you come and you get fifth, fourth at uh, Spring Championships. He's not making these Royales, and he is not happy about that. He told me that too. Uh, Dallas, I mean, yeah, uh, San Diego, he got that second place spot. Now, that's like I'm saying, he's climbing up these ladders. He's climbing up these spots. He says he can get first at this land, and I believe it. That guy's been practicing hard. He has that Mordex in the pocket. He knows what he wants to play. He's confident, and I, I'm full on with it. I, I love the confidence from him. I said Boomy and Sandstorm are going to win yesterday, and then they kind of got washed. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything about Sandstorm today. Go, Duke, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at, at, at the end of the day, everybody knows. Everybody at home, if you've been watching Brahalla for more than a couple months, you know, like, this is still the GOAT. He's the guy who has the most accolades in terms of Brahalla history. Yeah, he's been out of the game for a little bit, but it's really like coming back and looking at him, putting in that work to see how if he's going to come out strong. You can't forget the GOAT. He has made such a legacy, a legend of himself in Brawlhalla. You cannot forget him. And Remy, if you say he's hungry, I believe you. I believe that state. I saw it. I believe it. He took a year off. He's PR6, guys. <laughs> yeah, he's PR6. <laughs> All right, so Loris is our next player. I want to hear your thoughts about this. Sparky, tell me about Loris and South America, honestly. Loris went from being a last chance qualifier winner in 2021 to top fouring in 2v2 yesterday. He is the best placing South American in 2v2s at DreamHack Dallas. Even in mid-2022, he was a top 16 player only in his region, not even the world. He got 17th at the 2022 South American Spring Championship. That was not that long ago. That's a year ago. But all of a sudden, July of 2022, at the Summer Championship, he figured something out. All of a sudden, he was, boom, fifth in summers, 
fifth in Autumns. 13th, uh-oh, no, not in his region. 13th at the World Championship in 1v1. Fourth at Springs this year and fourth at San Diego. He has had such a quick rise from being a top 16 player in South America to being a threat on the global stage. I cannot talk about how impressed I am with Laura's enough. It's fantastic to see literally the rise and grind. And you know, as we're talking about South American players, there is another South American player we should also take a deep look at. So Duke, I'm looking at you, tell me about use. I think if anyone out there is uh, hopeful for a South American W here at DreamHack Dallas, they're likely looking at this guy, Use. He didn't have the best performance at San Diego, although he still managed to get into the top eight of things. Uh, but he also came out of San Diego and was like, you know what, I don't really like Greatsword on land. And then we saw him at the Spring Royale going undefeated in sets. He was able to go home the victor, taking home that gold medal in 1v1s over NA, something that basically had never happened before this guy is insane and the big question is is he gonna be playing that vector again this weekend at dreamhack dallas because a people have had time to watch it b vectors changed a little bit that down sig is not the same down sig that he had at the spring royale but at the end of the day people are gonna be looking at this guy in particular to be the favorite of the south americans now, now you did something that you're not supposed to do that you're really not allowed to do oh he leapfrogged europe to take a 1v1 title from North America. Europe's been at the grind for a long time, and then all of a sudden, you shows up and, and cuts in line, and nobody is able to stop him. I think that'll continue here. I think Vector is a great legend choice for him. Excited to see the new D-Sig and how he uses that. Matchup and experience could hurt quite a few people here if he brings out the great sword and if he brings out the Vector. This is a good time for South America, for sure. Um, we got one more player to really talk about here. And Remy, I'm looking at you. Tell me about Knees. Knees is a wild card in that kind of way where you see him in his region, and he always does really, really well work. He uh, He's ended up at both Royales, right? So that must mean he's top three in EU every single time if he's going to both Royales. But when he gets to these Royales, something's changed. We saw him at the Winter Royale, and he didn't have the tournament he wanted, and he didn't let that get to him. He went back, he said, oh, I'll come back to this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna this time prove myself, do what I can do. And in the Spring Royales, he did look better. These blasters that he's been working on, he's been kicking consistent with it, he has the Lucian in his pocket. He has the Nyx in his pocket. We're seeing him play the cross in doubles. So he has these blasters figured out. He knows what he wants to play. And I think even though he he isn't getting the wins he wants to, he's pushing that stride and he has players worried about him. They're always looking at him. They know, all right, Nice is a problem. He is a threat, something we can lose to. We need to worry about him. I think the streets are ready for Nice enjoyers to eat. I think it, it might be Nice enjoyers time to eat because they've been <laughs> at it for a while. And uh, I'm talking especially Polymonto. You're seeing Nice right there over in the pools That's the Lord area. Rocks. Yeah, that's the Lord that's Brax. Yes. Yeah. See? I told you Lord Brax was meta. <laughs> I told you. Oh I didn't. God. What? Oh, maybe was it Taza? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Who are you yelling at? My bad. My bad. I'm, yell I'm yelling at Taza. We're not the same. <laughs> my, my bad. Yep. Sorry, I'm, I'm feeling a little combative this weekend. I'm sorry. <laughs> look, what happened? That he was, me. look, he said Brax, and that's all, that was oh that, that was my CIA sleeper agent <laughs> trigger <laughs> phrase. And I'm ready to start swinging. <laughs> sorry, sorry, everybody at home. You I'll control see, myself. He's practicing that lance with that new combo that they added on yep. that nine decks, Lord Brax. He really yeah, wants Taza. to see that if he can bring that into the 1v1 scene, and it's keeping those blasts so I already talked about. So, knees, I. Anytime you can get the camera on a player in training room, you already know that they're looking for this tournament. They're excited. Oh my God, I'm 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 wheeling. <laughs> you just went sorry, off. I didn't, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Dude. I'm sorry. He but. turned and started. I was like, I'm, I don't remember saying anything bad about Brax, but I, I'm but sorry. <laughs> You're right. I'm sorry. What is incredible is that we have these literally top players all here in one single location battling it out to get to that top eight spot. Of course, I know they want the championship too. So guys, now we've talked about the players. We did a di deep dive with them. We got to know your predictions, okay? We, we always want to see what you guys are going to say about their wins and losses. So I'm going to actually start this way, okay? So okay. Duke, 
What's your predictions for this weekend for okay. singles? Uh, in third place, I got to put the GOAT on the board. You got to put him up in there. And of course, he's been on that grind. I have a lot of faith in him. I'm putting in that sandstorm. In second place, I, I again, I kind of can't be a denier of Impala anymore. I got to put him on the board. But of course, in first place, I'm not making that mistake again. I'm not keeping Luna off my board. I'm putting him at the top. I saw his plays in 2v2s. I got to believe in him. And I respect the grind so much. Gotta that believe. dude is going in. He's putting in the hours. And I want to see it pay off. I want to see him at that top. For me, in third place, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it quietly, and no no one, and just keep this keep this between us. Yeah, okay. Be lucky. I, okay. In third place, the goat, sandstorm. <laughs> no one tell him. No one tell him. <laughs> in second place, I'm no longer an Apollo denier. I got Impala in second place as well. In first place, it's Godly. He's coming home. This is the one. It was not a question of if. It was always a question of when. I think now is the time. Now is the hour. Godly is going to be hoisting up that trophy and obtaining the gold medal here at DreamHack Dallas. Wow. I'm going to be a little different from you, Sparky. I think Godly is going to be on that podium spot, but I'm going to put him right down there in that third spot. I think uh, the people I have above him are just better. And Paula, Ooh. he's been grinding. He's consistent. He's probably arguably PR1. The, not arguably PR1, but arguably <laughs> the best player in North America right now. But there's a certain confidence that Sandstorm brought to me. He brought to me personally. He told me, I'm going to win this tournament. I believe him. I, I mean, if, if a guy's walking up to you and saying, I'm going to win the tournament, that's something I do. So I have to believe Bro, him. Bro, Snowy's point, right? told me that like a <laughs> million <laughs> times. Snowy's a liar. <laughs> that is true. He's like champion, that's right? true. So I think he's going to lift that trophy up at the end of this weekend. And that's why I'm going to put him first in my, uh, in my predictions. I am I'm kind of just seeing all the, the graphics when they you know play out. Y'all, every one of y'all had Impala a second. So I'm 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 interested to see. I don't know. I don't know. There's there there's something in me that's like, you know what, Impala could take this. So we'll just have to see. But those were y'all's prediction. Chat, okay, throughout the weekend, we're always gonna keep asking y'all, please let us know what you think. Who's gonna win? Who's gonna take the championship? Who's gonna take the W, okay? Um, so be sure to cast your vote and engage with us online, all right? Put, you know, put in your chat points, prediction, you know, tag us uh, at, uh, what, hashtag DreamHack Dallas, hashtag Brahalla, whatever. Tell us, what are your predictions, chat? And of course, I don't want you guys to miss any of the other action that's going on. We actually have another side stream going on action. It's happening live, twitch.tv slash pro brawlhalla. It's our side stream, don't miss out. We got so much going on, so it's hard to get everything on one stream. Okay, so I got a couple more things I gotta tell you guys about. Chat, you know how it is. Mama Sheepy's always looking out for you. Let's talk about that merch. Look, I even have it right here. Look, let's talk about this merch, okay? I know the camera's not on me anymore, but don't worry, I have the shirt on too. The shirt, the Brahalla Dallas exclusive shirt guys the merchandise oh whoa they put it back on me look look right here right here look at this look at this beautiful shirt it's actually extremely comfortable i've already worn this this is actually uh, this is pretty much my shirt okay so anyways we have merchandise this merchandise on site both the new logo and the legacy logo as well we also got bundle deals going on live as well customized jerseys you can get that online now for a limited time and then the Dallas T that I just showed y'all, that's available until next Friday, okay? Free shipping for those who are purchasing in venue this weekend. Don't miss out on the merch, guys. I Wait, know you guys free shipping like everywhere? I, I, free shipping for everywhere? I'm not Yo, quite the, sure. It the, just the, says the free EU shipping. The kids need to get on that. I'm just, it just says the free EU shipping for those purchasing that. in venue this weekend. That's what I'm, I'm just reading what, what the points Wait, I got. Who, so, put, put up the Bovar oh. Pog. Put up the Bovar Bo Pog. Bovar Pog yeah, give for us free Bovar shipping. Pog. Do they have free it still? Free shipping, please. Bovar Pog? They, yeah, just thought a second. Oh, there we go. There go. Okay. Free shipping. Free shipping. is pretty Pog. But yes, my point is, guys, really don't miss out. You guys are always asking for merch. Please get it. Get it while you can. Limited time. Now, talking about dream hacks and things like that, the next dream hack, dream hack Valencia, is only about a month away. Register now. Tickets and registration, all that is open. Uh, go to start.gg slash dhval23 to register. And if you are actually thinking of going to dream hack Valencia, please, now is the time to register. It's time to find your hotel, your flight, your passport. Get all that fixed and ready for DreamHack Valencia. Of course, we would love to see you guys come out there. Um, so yes, now is the time. Okay, 
A couple more quick announcements here. We are super excited to announce that we, Brahalla, will be part of Ubisoft Forward. So, obviously, I can't say too much more. I can't say exactly what we're revealing, but we can't wait for y'all to see what's coming to Brahalla. So, you guys, make sure to tune in on June 12th. June 12th, 10 a.m. Pacific Time or 1 p.m. Eastern Time to Ubisoft Forward, and we'll see you guys there. Don't miss out. We are revealing something. I just can't say too much more than that. Tune in June 12th, okay, guys? Okay, so that's pretty much all the different announcements I got to make here. Um, we're about to head into the first match of the day. It's going to be Godly versus Jet Bean. We're going to have a new round of folks here as well. So we're going to take a short break, get the players going and ready. When we come back, I'm going to have Duke. I'm going to have Tazi here breaking it down. And so we're going to be ready to kick off day two at DreamHack Dallas. Don't go anywhere. Toast here, DreamHack Dallas. How are y'all doing? First out here on the floor interview, I'm here with, can you introduce yourself? Slow Motion. All right, Slow Motion, tell me what you're most excited for. Excited to see, I mean, everybody. I mean, just being able to get everybody back, everybody back together, back under the roof again, and uh, interested to see who takes home some uh, trophies this weekend, Ben. Awesome, are you competing this weekend? I am, I am. Uh, my first uh, set is gonna be against Cody and Faison, so that's gonna be a good one. Woo! Right today. Who's your teammate? Uh, toxic. Okay. Okay. And how do you how do you feel it's gonna go? Like what what are you feeling? What's the vibes right now? Um, I figured I'm just gonna troll and just make him go the full eight minutes and just uh, have fun with it. An agent of chaos. What are you most looking forward to this weekend here at DreamHack Dallas? Uh, watching champions raise uh, trophies over their heads, seeing who uh, takes it home. Love it. Thank you so much. No problem, toast.
Welcome back, everyone. We are here on day two of our singles competition at DreamHack Dallas. And Duke, Taza, Remy, what's up? Taza, we haven't heard from you yet, so I actually want to come go to you, ask you how you're feeling. What are your predictions? Tell me your thoughts. What am I? Oh, my gosh. You're asking so, me like that. That's it's like a lot, a lot of questions. Lot. OK. It's yeah. a lot of questions. My thoughts are going into this, there are a lot of players who are barely getting by with wins that I feel like they should have been 3-0-ing, and so that's making my predictions feel a little differently. I was looking at the bracket. I was seeing some upsets. I think Sprite took a win over Blaze, 3-1, and then brought experience to game five. So I've been following these things in pools that we haven't been seeing on stream. As for my predictions, well, I had Sandstorm up pretty high. <laughs> and then Remy told what's me some news. <laughs> like, what's, wait, what's this news? You, didn't you put Sandstorm at the top? Sandstorm owes me a lot of money. Oh. <laughs> so Pugsy, I think, was it Pugsy? Yeah, it yeah, was Pugsy. Pugsy. Pugsy I just got news that Pugsy did just oh. beat Sandstorm. Yeah, so that's like, I mean, he's not out, but like, yeah. now I'm not really sure what to think. Well, Wait, who told him? Who quit. told him Sparky's prediction? What is your prediction? Taza, what is your what prediction? What are my predictions? Yes. I don't really, I don't think. Okay, fine. Before this news happened, I was going to have Sandstorm winning the tournament, Impala at second, and then Laura's at third. Okay, Ooh, interesting. Interesting that you yeah. also put Impala in second. That's yep. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. But, okay, the game is actually ready, so you know what? Duke, Taza, I'm going to let you guys take the action away. Well, of course, we've got up next Godly versus Jetbean. Jetbean, oh. kind of notable in the sense of like he was that surprise online North American player who mm. kind of snuck out some wins over people that at the time people were kind of like, you shouldn't be beating this person. But now he's kind of like, okay, let's see what Jetbean can do. Can he actually take down someone like Godly? With the upsets that have been happening this weekend, there's still kind of that chance. Yeah, uh, this was a conversation that Sparky, Rem, and I were having uh, yesterday in doubles when, Jet, when Jetbean was on the stream. Because I ah. think you said that he, Jetbean's one of those players. And in fact, we were able to see probably the five or six North American players that have now all like, okay, now that you have made it into top eight in ones, we now have to like acknowledge that you could be anybody at any time. Yeah. I think we saw Clem on stream a little bit earlier as well. He's one of those players I'd put in that category, and Jetbean's definitely up there. And then seeing Jetbean go up against Godly will be really exciting because, like you said, I think he has the ability to make any player sweat, but when it's a player of Godly's caliber, there's very few players that can do that to begin with. So I imagine this is going to be a very uphill battle for him. My question right now is, what is Godly playing? It looks like it's the Mordex. I was curious if he was going to play the Terrace that he had in the 2v2 space, uh, but it looks like it's all about that Mordex. We're seeing a lot of chatter about Mordex being kind of the pick for the weekend. Yeah. Um, and that chatter is coming out from uh, a lot of different players as well. The past few events, for example, when talking about Sandstorm again, he's had like a different legend prepared. Yeah. And going into this one, he's kind of like, I'm all in on the, on the Mordex. There's a lot of other players of the same. Um, talking to players from Europe as well. Oh, that sounds really fantastic. There's a lot of EU players. Maybe not a lot, but there's a few. I know that I talked to EU players that said this before. They're like, Godly, why don't you just go all in on the Mordex? Why don't you just start with the Mordex? Because he's played so many different legends, but they're thinking that a Mordex is what it's going to need for him to really get that first land win. And so seeing him opening up with this against Jeffrey is really cool. But Jeffrey on the other side, fighting him with the Ditto, even though it's an epic cross with Tide Long, it's the same kid. Well, the big question is, like, I think there's a lot of North American Mordexes. Obviously, there's a lot of Mordexes in general. He's, like, yes. one of the most played legends. But, like, at top level EU, are there that many Mordexes that Godly can mirror match? Like, how much experience oh, does you he saying, have in that mirror match? I mean, he is, I guess he's the top. He is the top yeah. Mordex, right? But, like, relatively, he didn't, like, get his name on the character is what I think you're getting. At. And you're right. But outside of, of Knees and, I guess, Fridazol, Scythe hasn't really played that much in the region. So you make a good point there as we're going further into this game with one. Um, and Brawlhaven is a, a, a stage that we're going to be seeing a lot more of today just because we simply can't have it in 2v2s. And it will be interesting to see how many players leave this stage open for those really early knockouts. Like, we saw Godly with that down and say, oh, Jet Bean gets up with the Nair but doesn't get the knockout right afterwards. Yeah, wasn't able to follow up with like a side air, something with a little bit more variable force. There's the side air. Finally cleans up that stock, but like we Jet Bean's the, taking a lot longer to the get The double stocks. godly vision on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Losing that stock and just flying above the right. There goes Jet Bean off the top though. Under two minutes. Uh, godly keeping the solidly in his favor. And I I imagine that he's getting ready to go towards a two stock here. Let's see what Jet Bean can do with the gong. Oh, I thought the gong was prime, but it's actually side these sides right now. Yeah, I feel like Jetbean's leaning more and more into this scythe as this game has progressed. Like, didn't really feel the gauntlets early on, and now it's just all about this scythe for him. Yeah, nice neutral light into side air. Let's see what Jetbean's able to do here while he's on ground. 
Downer starts, but Godly just dodges straight up, gets the revenge hit with that neutral light. And now Jeppin in this edge guard scenario where if Godly catches one landing with an ounce sig, I mean it's the same deal, but he goes for the sire instead. That's the wow, wow. He, okay. did. he was celebrating, I, I was like, I, I really was like, I was like, that's the wrong way to use the down sig, but no, letting that out. Uh, seeing that he didn't have the jumps to make it back, and that's gonna be game one for Godly. Did zero damage. That's how good of a player he is. <laughs> zero damage gets the win. <laughs> That's, that's Godly right. famously, uh, he's won a tournament while D DC'd, right? Not one of he won a, a game. Oh, while DC'd the match in, against in Machete. Yeah, said, famously. Oh, so he can, he in theory has won while doing zero damage. Right? Yeah. For those that don't know, Godly's internet crapped out, but then the bot won, and so he got the game win. That's how good he is. That's my hero. Yeah, and there he is. Now he's going to Apocalypse here in uh, game number two. Luckily, right, we don't have to really worry about his uh, personal connection going down. Uh, as we're going into game number two here against Jet Bean, who's staying with the mirror match. I do like I like this map swamp. That soft platform is going to help Jet Bean a lot more, especially because like that's one of the things that was really struggling or a struggle point for him was trying to find a landing point against Godly once yeah. he was off stage. Yeah, and Godly, when he was airborne without the platform, was not going to hit the sky. Oh, oh that's, the, that's like a carbon copy of game one. <laughs> same exact Almost the same timing, too. I think the one difference is that Godly has a little bit more damage. Jeff B used that platform to get that string, uh, that classic side string where you're just kind of like not bringing them back to the stage, so you ladder them up to the top oh. until they can't get any more. And Jeff B with his own down, so he a weapon throw. Godly can make it back. Oh, Goes to the ground like to catch the neutral stick, and I think. I, I like that too. If Jetbean didn't dodge in the way that he did, I think that would have connected and would have been able to get a chase dodge back. Or were you talking about what you like what Jetbean did? No, I like what Jetbean did. Like, yeah. obviously, a great attempt from Godly coming in, gravity cancel, neutral stick if he gets the hit, chase dodge up. But I like that Jetbean uh, went down low enough and then spot dodged where he did, where it's like, hey, there's a potential here where if I need to, I can kind of convert this into some more damage. I'm like in perfect position for a punish. But he also recognized, oh, that's all of Godly's movement. I don't have to do anything else. Yeah, Jetbean much better in game two here. Godly getting that delayed recovery read, though. It's not going to take him off the top. Side light in the down light, trying to get those dodge down reads that Godly uh, put out in game number one, and Godly just mixing it up too well. Jet being now going down the one stock once again. Oh, weapon spawns delayed because of the juggling from Godly. Haven't seen too much from Ooh. Jet Bean's gauntlets, but. That was something. Yeah. I, he got the recovery, not knocking out as early as he'd like on oh, Apocalypse. Touch. Yeah, that's rough. And Godly is getting so much damage off of that whip. Look at this. He could just take the stock off of that. Jeffy sweating back to the stage, puts out a down to catch a landing, and Godly dodges right past it. Has the scythe now. And that neutral light and recovery almost connects. Jeff Bean gets the side there, but this entire time, Jeff Bean's just struggling to finish off the stock that he could have just had if that chase dodge came through. Oh. Man. Every time he misses the opportunity to get that KO, he's going to just be reli reliving yeah. that miss chase dodge, and it, it'll eat away at a lot of players. But he does manage to get that recovery. Going to juggle for a bit, and yeah, going to be sticking with the scythe. So took uh, went from white to orange there off of that, and it's a big deal for Gauntlets because Gauntlets don't have anything guaranteed off of that side light. Uh, as, as, as much as Godly wants to make you think otherwise with how often he follows yeah. up with it. So that down light is really the only way that you can get that knockout off the top. Uh, Jet Bean, however, staying in this, does dodge down. Godly doesn't get the read that time through the recovery, but that neutral light will send Jet Bean far. And that means a number of moves coming out from Godly here on the board X will be able to finish it. Sider just barely not knocking out because it bounces to the stage. Is this going to be it, dude? It's it's close. Yeah. Especially, the, again, that soft platform's wow. on the other side. So Jepping just struggles to find a landing point when he's stuck on that corner. Godly's so good at just covering all of his options. It's been a few months, so I don't feel like it's as relevant to say, haha, Gauntlet Neutral, I actually knocked out. <laughs> yeah. But but that was but still. A, it was a lot of damage that was on Jet Bean for that to happen. Because the 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 way that the force scales on that is so much less than it used to be to be in the past. When I think about how it used to be like the power of Axe Neutral, I was like, wow, Gauntlet's really had they had it, it all. Really had everything. Uh, but there was that dodge that you were talking about that was so well placed by Jet Bean. Because like most players would immediately buffer the unarmed downlight, yeah. and then that gets caught by the neutral signature. And he just dodged after he evaluated that Godly could not make it back. Three, it's like he got two, in position one, to, to bait out the end sig, and then he had a perfect position afterwards with that spot dodge. I, I just really like the decision there. Didn't really lead to uh, too much else, but now we're here in game three. Godly could kind of walk away with this one if he gets another big lead into that down sig on the first stock. And I think that 
Uh, Jeffin agrees with the, the sentiment that you had about the platform. I think it helped him quite a bit. It dealt with the air problems that he was having. And outside of dropping that, that, uh, that was a great interesting from Godly. Outside of dropping that recovery, Jeffin was keeping it pretty close. Godly's just like, if you drop your guaranteed punish against me, you're going to take 800 damage for it. And that's exactly what we saw in game two. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what happens a lot at high levels. Not going to finish off that first stock with the down stick. This time it's a recovery, but still, Godly just maintaining that initial stock lead. But, like, at high level, you know you can't give an inch to any of these players because they're going to take it and they're going to push it as far as they possibly can. Yeah. Nice falling there from Jet Bean. Can you get something? Okay, does dodge down, picks up the slice. I can't believe the air didn't connect, and Godly ends up dodging right on that platform, gets the neutral light, airs it back to the side of the stage, and the down six starts pressuring Jet Bean there. They're having those uh, signatures where there's just no chance for your opponent to punish you, even if it whips, is such a great position to be in. Uh, and Godly with that slider has himself in that position once more. Ground pound goes a little too low as Jet Bean reco recovers high, but this is all Godly, this entire stock here. And Jet Bean's already behind one. Yeah, this is just getting worse and worse for Jet Bean. He's, he's trading out with Godly, but he's basically a full stock behind. So this uh, is going to get dire if he doesn't get this stock soon. Dare goes for the weapon toss. Okay. okay. We'll convert to a KO. It's a nice modification off of the uh, the Sandstorm where you do that down air into stage yeah. ground pound. It was like, force was a little too high, but he got the weapon throw right afterwards and got it. That slide charge down heavy. Nicely done. Okay. Swiping him off the right side of the stage. Jet Bean now on winner's bracket stock here against Godly in game three. Look at Godly in the bottom left, cool, calm, and collected. This is just like, this is a day in the ranked lobby for him right now. He's just, like, this is just nothing to him. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like for Godly in particular, you could say that about any. Yeah, that's <laughs> any true. Sort of, sort of He's a pretty bracket. stoic uh, yeah. in-game player. Yeah, but when it comes to this one in particular, he is just playing to his game plan. Um, Jet Bean has not broken it in a way that's made him have to panic at all. That neutral light, so well pivoted. Let's see, recovery just forcing the dodge from Jet Bean, and now Jet Bean throwing that weapon away. Even if he picks up a scythe, he takes up so much damage for it. Dodges up to avoid one Sarah, but still on the side of the stage. Down stick will send him flying to the left. Godly knows that's game. Takes 3-0 over Jet Bean and moves further on into the winner's bracket. Really clean play from Godly. Like, I think almost every single situation where he was able to force Jet Bean off stage, it was a struggle for Jet Bean to come back up. He just could not get past the down six from, uh, from Godly or even like those jump side airs that covered the high recovery. So Jet Bean just uh, could not find a way back up. Yeah, looking at the replays here. This is the first down sig. It is the first down sig of the game. Sends him flying. Uh, and usually you're going to be seeing uh, there, there is active input to that down signature, uh, which means that you could send them flying in that spiking hitbox or you can off throw the top up. of the stage. You rarely see that unless you're dead center. Yeah, it's like yeah. W either if it's going to bounce them off the main stage or like the very rare, like you've done this vertical gauntlet play and you get a gravity cancel down sig read and you catch them, then you'll go for the vertical toss. But generally people are going for that downward toss. Oh. And there we go. Yeah, look at that. Godly kicking him off the right side of the stage. That down, that down heavy was crazy. But yeah, opening it up with the with the Mordex ditto here at the very beginning between Jet Bean and Godly was was interesting. And being able just to see the difference on how far one player was able to push his opening, in this case Godly, over the other was was very interesting to see. I think Jet Bean held his own against a player like Godly quite well, despite the 3-0. Yeah, I mean, he, he did uh, he did what he could. I think, like, if he cleans up those edge guards, then everything is, is going to be a lot better for him in the, that kind of matchup. But also, it's like, it's a ditto. It's kind of rare to do a lot of dittos, um, unless the meta is really heavily in favor of, like, a single character. Mm -hmm. So you, it's not like a thing that you have to practice that often, but still. Uh, it would be a good overall change if he can uh, find his way back up on stage. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Remy? Well, uh, I think that game came down to a lot of the fact that Godly knew his KO options way better than uh, Jet Bean did on the character. We saw a lot more signatures come out from Godly in the first place, right? We saw that side sig on the right side of the stage, and uh, there were a lot of moments where we saw him go for the down sig to confirm the edge guard. Now, he didn't want to push him off stage, but uh, Jet Bean didn't, could never really find an opportunity to get back on the ground without having to be near the edge, and every single time it happened, we saw maybe three KOs where Godly would just straight up down sig him, send him off the stage with the active in. 
input and just take the stock for himself there. And then on Jet Bean's side, he had trouble finding these stocks. They were trading evenly for some parts of the map, but as soon as Gali saw, oh, I can knock you out here, all right, your stock's gone. And Jet Bean just didn't have that same uh, that same information, that same drive that uh, Godly Yeah, I feel like yeah. it says a lot about the the pressure from Godly when it comes to covering landings when the only safe place that you feel like you can land is not on the stage. And yeah. that's that's not really a great place to be uh, when, when you are playing a 1v1 where it's kind of like, okay, because your, your jumps are going to go eventually. You start seeing those exclamation points come up, and then you have to touch the stage eventually. And if you do that, and Godly's like, well, once you land, I'm going to hit you. That's, the Apocalypse uh, pick help both the moving platform so he right. could find another place yeah. to land. But when the platform wasn't there, we saw the same weaknesses. The side stick came out to catch his landing. The down stick came out to catch his landing. Godly just knew exactly where to place those things, mm -hmm. and it benefited him so much. I am curious how like a tri-platform map or a bi-platform, like a Miami Dome, would have done for that. But you know, you can, all, you can only uh, right. say what if so often. You get your three chances, and yeah. then that's it. Well, that's going to be Godly moving on to the winner's bracket, and we're going to be having another match coming up pretty soon. This oh, right it's there. Boomy, Boomy and Fozy. Fozy. Okay, so we've got... This is like... Uh, we we just had NA versus EU, mm -hmm. but this is like another tier of NA versus is EU. I, oh, what, are you, what, are, what are you thinking? I think, like, emotionally, I want to say that with the amount of history that is behind both of these names, mm -hmm. but also, like, I... If you pull up Boomy's PR right now, I, I don't think it's that drastically high compared to Jet Beans. Yeah, I think it, it could it, even be below Jet Beans. Like, I, I, I think in the moment, I give the edge to Fozy. When I look at the history of the two players, Remy, I'm thinking like uh, Boomy and Fozy are like they're they're the twos specific yeah. players. In These guys the are definitely known more for their two v two game plan. They're meeting up here. I mean, they've played each other enough times in twos. They did get that grand finals matchup at BCX. So coming off to here, removing the doubles aspect where it's alright the team play, and now they have to go for their individual characters and matchups. And I know that Boomy has been saying he's still playing Thea. He doesn't really want to play anything else. That's all he did practice for the time he did practice. Cool. And Fozy plays out Ryan, so he has that Lance knowledge and matchup. So it's going to be hard for Boomy to chip in there. Now, do you think that Fozy is going to be leading in with the the Orion or a Lance Legend going into ones? Because I know that both Boomy and Fozy do play very different Legends in a two space than they do in a single space. Yeah, I think Fozy might kick it off with the Orion just yeah. because we did see those Lance buffs come through. And uh, the Gauntlets, they've been getting hit, like we mentioned. Some people are still picking them, obviously, because they are still very strong. Mm -hmm. But Fozy mainly focused on them in twos. So seeing as the Lance got buffed, that's his main weapon. Spear is still stable. He's probably going to open up with the Orion. And, Whoa. Uh, we're seeing a Caspian pick, Ooh, actually. That, okay. That's completely out of left field for me. Yeah. I mean, we've been kind of seeing Caspians not. come into the meta a lot. Like, I realize what it is. It? What? It's three, the three defense two, on Thea. One, Eight force one. Caspian. That's Inside to Honestly, dox out at yellow. Ca Caspian signatures to take out Thea early is definitely a possibility. It's a counter pick. It's it's interesting that Boomy is sticking with his Thea just because like on on like social media, Boomy's been the biggest like Thea denier. He's like, this character is so bad. He's screaming for buffs because it's his main. Okay, uh, that, no, that's true. That's, <laughs> that's he, he sees Thea and he's like, this is exactly how I want to play Brawlhalla, but the character's not as good as I need her to be. That's what he's saying. And he gets, oh, the neutral thing okay. actually baiting both myself and Fos into thinking that that was for that stock. But look how much damage he's already taken. Right? This is, uh, Caspian is the hardest hitting Qatar legend in the game and also one of the few Qatar legends that has a ranged signature, which happens to also knock out incredibly early. But he's on the gauntlets right now. Yeah, I mean, that side sig is also a, a devastating signature if Fozy manages to pull that one off. But Boomy's done a really good job bringing this one back. Ooh. Doesn't Chops. get punished for it. This is really like a knowledge check for Fozy, right? Like, yeah. does he know how to punish these signatures from Thea? Because if you're not ready for it, they can trip you up a lot. Yeah, D Light Sider coming through there. Goes for the edge guard here with the Sire. No, puts out the side light instead. Gets hit by that down light into recovery. And just like that, Boomy goes down the first stock here in game one. Fozy gonna juggle for a little bit. Looks like he wants to stick with these Qatars. It's interesting because like he has the gauntlets from his Zario play in 2v2s, uh -huh. but it seems like he wants the Qatars a little bit more for 1v1s. Yeah, even though um, Fozy ended up picking something that Remy and I both weren't talking about, I do think that it is the Qatar focus here, despite the gauntlets being a thing. That was a great uh, finisher from Boomy there. But uh, I guess it could be either way. I, I really do think that when looking at this pick, it's like uh, fozy has got a pretty uh, diverse legend pool. And when he's looking at a matchup that's as low defense as Thea is, I think Boomy didn't take a four defense stance. I think he's just on uh, on default. I had to check that after the game. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. Because Fozy, w with Caspian, you could send Onyx flying in orange with, yeah. with the right side thing. Those, those Caspian six, we've seen them be very strong. 
But right now, Boomy just trying to make sure he doesn't get hit by anything. Gets some yeah. hits in on the Fozy right now. Nice little side air. Ooh, Sarah comes through that side. So just barely misses it. Boomy just walks by as if nothing happens. Dodges away from that neutral signature. And Fozy falls in with the downer. Gets the Sarah. The neutral signature dodges out of the way quite well. And Boomy is actually playing around the Caspian signature from Fozy quite effortlessly. And Boomy, but the way he's doing it, I can't believe he dodged all the way around the down. And then he gets the neutral signature. But the, it just doesn't have that knockout power that other characters have. You really got to make sure you ramp up that damage before you go out for the knockout. She is the fastest legend in the game coming in at I move movement speed, but that means she has some of the weakest hitting moves as well as some of the lowest defense yeah. that you can have. It's uh, it's definitely, uh, but the, but the force isn't so bad, right? You just you, you don't have a scenario right here like you do with Caspian. But so far, Boomy's doing great getting these straight hits. That's three times now that he's going around Fozzy. Then the gravity cancel neutral like catches Fozzy on the dodge. He goes for the grab for the finish though. there and just barely misses. Oh, I do not. I do not blame Boomy going out all the way for that, right? That ground yeah. pound hits and he gets the upper edge of that uh, that spike. That's it for Fozzy's last stock. I mean, the second that GC end light hits, like, you know Boomy's seeing red. He's wanting to get that one final blow. A side air could have done it. Ground, air, uh, ground pound could have done it. He just didn't find that mark. Yeah. He's done a great job of avoiding all these down six so far. In fact, has Fozzy hit a signature this game? I wonder. The neutral that comes through there, and I'm like, because I, when, I, when I cast Fozzy in doubles, I talk a lot about how the signature accuracy is yeah. so high. Um, but Boomy has yet to fall victim to a single one. I mean, it is. Oh, oh God! Oh, oh, charge! Charged it up and everything. Oh, Boomy oh. able to take the game off of Fozzy. And uh, like you said, I think it's a lot harder to get away with doing a lot of signatures in 1v1s because you're not having, like, your teammate there to cover. You're not having, like, the, the sheer, like, quote unquote, chaos that's forcing people to go high. So yeah. you can do a lot more of those end sigs. I know the damage says it's 434, but I think the numbers are reversed there. Yeah, it was like 594 damage coming out from Boomy on the Thea that time. And we were talking about how it's. Uh, the, the signatures don't Three, get very far two, away, but one, you get done a lot of damage. Like, it's just one of those things where you just have to do a little bit more damage than other legends to be able to get those knockouts when you get the signature. Well, here we go, into game number two. No swaps, same map, same picks. Yeah. Bozy gonna try to find a little bit more momentum this time. Right, and now I'm curious how that's gonna play out, because, like, if you're... I really do think a very huge reason why you pick Caspian just for the signature knockout. Oh, oh touch! He didn't touch the side of the wall and he falls down. But but as I was saying with the with the with the legend pick, if you're not connecting with the signatures, I do feel like guitars and gauntlets do a little bit too much of the same thing in the matchup, right? Like usually you pick Caspian for whatever weapon that you're comfortable with, and then you go for those knockouts with the signatures. Oh, and Fozzy with the gauntlets on the side of the stage could get the edge card here. can still touch. Yep, ground wow. pound turns it around. Boomy gets back up safely. Okay, that was a bit of a surprise to me that Fozzy went that deep. I, I think it's like another strength that Thea has is that all of her signatures are basically recovery tools as yeah, well as knockout move tools. Her around. I think like as a boots. And glance, you have that neutral sig on both of them. You get the side sig, actually, yeah, the side sig on both of them. You get the down sig. Honestly, she's a very mobile legend. We see her slide across the stage there with that side sig. I really feel like that, right, that like edge guard situation was just Fozzy not knowing the matchup, right? Like most people, if you know Thea's end sig, you know, wait that out and then you punish afterwards. But still gets a nice little side air there to take down Boomy's second stock. Yeah, Boomy now uh, at a significant deficit there, goes unarmed, gets hit by the gauntlet downer, D-like ground pound tags on some more damage, and he holds on to that down stick. So that down stick has a property, um, like Koji side stick on sword, it's just way more dramatic because you get that first dash, mm -hmm. and then you charge the second dash. So you could let it rip right away, get a fast back and forth just like, like that. that to get Posey off the right side of the stage, or you could hold a little bit, try to get a mix-up if they're going to dodge down, dodge in place, react to the startup rather than finish. Yeah, you'll see a lot of people, uh, when they're playing Thea, right, they'll do that initial throw out and they'll just charge it for a little bit because people want to come in, try to punish it, and then they end up getting caught by that second swing. Boomy's now even things up, but Fozzy gets a good guitar string in there. Let's see if we can find. At this point in time, Side Sick does knock out. Oh, Boomy, you're off stage. He's got to be careful. He's Real already low. lost two stocks to being in this position. Switches over to the Lance, burns up the down, like gets the read of the nice. dodge in place with the Sair, but no end sig afterwards and dodges up to avoid the neutral sig from Fozzy. Oh, oh it's just scary. Oh! <laughs> Missed the down sig, but it's all just to okay. reposition for the ground pound. Let's talk about that down sig okay. at the very end. That is incredibly tight on the timing to do, right? Yes. Because in order to get it to where, because you have to like, 
pivot, slide charge pivot the down signature in a way to where you're still aiming away from the side of the wall. And then you get that whole entire duration of the charge because it's not gravity canceled, right? So you're really holding on the side of the wall there. And Fozzy did the right thing. He waited for a while, but that doesn't mean it's that any easier to get back to the stage. And hopefully we'll be able to see that highlight in just a little bit because that's crazy. Because if you mess that up, you just go back on stage with the down sync, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to see this right here, I think. No, this is the uh, second stop three, of Fozzy. Two, Wait, one, we're roll. not going to say it. Oh, Tragedy as Fozzy. Fozzy swaps. Switches over to the Wushong. Uh, Rano being picked out here on the Brawl Haven. And I don't know, right? Like, it's like, I, I mean, I do know. I get the swap because he didn't land a single signature. So the point of the Caspian's kind of defeated. But uh, as, as far as the stage goes, with how Boots are getting these knockouts, we'll see if it benefits him at all. Because now his back's against the wall here as Boots on the verge of uh, putting him into the Elimination Dragon. I, I kind of like the swap to this Wu Shang just because, like, again, the, the Spear Nair is a really good tool against weapons that like to stack up, like these Boots. And of course, if you're playing right, you can play around that uh, Lance as well, get a lot of those down lines if someone likes to go for those Sarah approaches. Yeah, nice knockout by Fozzy though, takes Boomy off the top of that recovery. This is a similar position that Boomy was in on the Demon Island game before this. He was able to bring it back, but Fozzy getting a huge... Whoa, Whoa okay, that... That's supposed to be a GC? I wonder if it was supposed to be a recovery. Either way, he ground pounds low, doesn't get punished for it, manages to make it back and take, get some damage on the Boomy as Boomy's continuing to struggle to get these neutral wins. These down things are coming through and Fozzy's dodging all of them. And to stay. Oh. That three defense, I, I'm feeling that one yeah. right there. Wow. I didn't even know Wushan could knock out that early. <laughs> I think against uh, most other characters, he can. Yeah, but okay. That's Small Brawl Haven and Thea, so that is a uh, very quick knockout potential. Uh, so it's three stocks to one off of the switch. Every, that was beautiful. The combo there with the Nair and the mix-up right there. And so Boots Nair, I think the only other there's a few Nairs that act, that act like how Boots Neutral Air does with not high knockback scaling, like Nax, Nair, and Or. Um, but Boots is particularly tricky because of the kind of follow-up you can get after that. And that recovery was fantastic. Yeah, it's a really good setup tool. Like, he could have gone straight down line into the recovery, oh. but he went in that extra attack, gives him a little bit of a pop-up as well as that damage. And he turned it around, goes for an end light there. Thought Ooh. for sure he was going to go for another GC down light, but ah. Fozzy is going to clean that one up. And yeah, Fozzy puts himself on the board with the swap to the Wushong. Yeah, Fozzy sees Boomy trying to go in a little bit too hard there with that down air. Charges the down signature, sends him right off the left side of the stage, and that's going to be game three going over to Fozzy. Avoiding that reverse, uh, or avoiding that 3-0 possibility and bringing up the possibility of reverse 3-0. I still think the damage comes the swap, but uh, I wonder if to be staying on Wushong for the rest. I mean, I guess he, I guess he is, right? Yeah. Because uh, I think Caspian, while theoretical, failed because Boomy just played around the signature so well. And so now Fozzy's like, okay, I've got my setups off my light attacks this time. We saw a lot more neutral signatures connect. Um, and even the down at the end, right? That's stuff that that's working out really well for Fozzy here. I feel like he just straight up used more signatures on Wushong as well. Like, well, he did a bunch of he, those neutral signs. They did hit, and, right? And he. I, don't, I still think he used more on Caspian. It just didn't feel that way because we never saw them connect. Um, still here. Great lead for Boomy. Neutral stick disarms Fozzy. Edge guard opportunity. Could fall off the side air here, and that could be huge. Especially if he doesn't use the active input. Okay. He gets the strength of, it, of that hit. Just goes out there, throws he up the, the down side again. I wonder if he tried, and that down air was a mistake. Oh, oh, he dodged Fozzy. Okay, Fozzy played dodge. around that because he was waiting for it. He's like, the move's going to end eventually. He does it again. He sees the startup, and then he goes in forward. But if Boomy just lets it rip, you don't really, like, it's an interesting way of conditioning your opponent there. Because if you're already stacked with where the down is going to cover, and Fozzy's waiting for you to hold the move, he may just get hit by the move waiting for the dodge time. Yeah, like, Fozzy's trying to go for that quick reaction spot dodge, which works really well if he can time it correctly. But Boomy can kind of mix up his timing because, again, it's a signature. You can charge it and change up when you throw out that second hit. Oh, misses the ground pound. It gets hit by a side air and a neutral light. That's a ton of damage coming out of Boomy's second stock here. Choosing to fight on arms at the moment, using that movement speed, which applies both aerial and in the ground to get around the map, but can't find a weapon. Is that going to be it? Lance picked up. All right, what can he do with it? Nothing so far. Down More down six. Through. Yeah. Oh, the back end, the back end of the Nair does hit as Booby barely gets light of sight over the side of the wall. When Fozzy goes off stage here, Booby gets those Lance ground pounds. Okay, so makes it back, and this is scary. Booby switch over, goes to this. Oh. I imagine he's just gonna let down to him, right? Yeah, oh. okay. 
<laughs> what surprised me is that it knocked out. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, that was the big wild part there. But he's definitely liking this Lance Downs. He's doing it a lot. And Fozzy, like, at one point seemed like he had an answer with those spot dodges, and but then he he's stopped, still getting caught. He stopped charging it. Yeah. And then Boo's like, okay, I'm just going to... Oh, okay. Doesn't go any further with that one. Fozzy now on his winner's bracket stock once again. Has to equalize this quickly, otherwise he could get knocked out. Boomy will move forward. Oh, that spot, spot dodge for place. spot dodge. Yeah, that, I, I was really wondering if he would cancel it, but I guess like at that point, just didn't have anything for it. Double ground pound, that's going to be it, right? Boomy balls. Last stocks here. Does the difference between a game five situation or Boomy continuing forward? Cozy. Yeah. He's got the weapon advantage. Doesn't go for the denial there. You saw him trying to hit that side air, and Boomy just sne uh, sneaks underneath it. Yeah, I don't know how many of the signatures he wants to let rip in this situation because Fozzie's not that damaged. Uh, the Nairs are doing a great job, and as Fozzie's keeping this vertical space controlled, Boomy's getting hit by Nairs and recoveries, and he's already in orange. Oh, that side stick gets punished there, Nair. That's so much damage coming through here. Edgar opportunity, though. That could be oh. huge. Fozzy changing up his dodge off that side air, so Boomy wasn't able to get the read there. Went for his side light, and Fozzy dodged through it. There's a spot dodge burn, but Boomy not able to cover the landing. Oh, and now Fozzy staying on that platform, going for the pogos over and over again. I think a side stick on the, on, on the, uh, the spear would do it. But Boomy... Oh, goes with the down stick! Barely late. avoids the ground pound by just hugging the wall and the back of the Nair connects. Fozzy now has damaged his Boomy in regards to the knockouts. Okay, oh, it hits. It still he, hit. went he went behind him thinking he wasn't going to get connected and he gets sweeped into the move. The sonic boom that That's blast it. from behind, but Fozzy gets the double. <gasps> he missed he the, recovery. the recovery. He gets the double delay and the recovery is too slow. The down to connects and Boomy gets the win. Fozzy was one move away from bringing it to a game five, and he just was too slow on the recovery. That was just a timing problem, I, right? Like, that's. I've seen Delight recovery take up the top over and over. That's ins I mean, like, even if you're in that. Okay, I don't know what. No, he had to. Okay, so that was a grounded downlight to start it off, and then he gets the GC downlight. So he had the ability to jump recovery, jump there. He could have gone for either option. Did both went for the, recovery, went for the recovery, and he, he just, just dipped down, right? I yeah. think he just didn't jump before it. I. Because he had the, he had, because uh, recovery dips down a little bit before, so I'm, like, Hold I, on, wait. you have to jump recovery, we, right? Remy, say something. <laughs> you got it? Okay, you got okay. Okay, okay. He definitely could have just downlight recovery him to get that okay, knockout. Okay, okay. Right, right, right. double downlight. So yeah. that was like a, a huge blunder. Yeah, yeah okay. the double, even the double oh. downlight is an overextension. I'm sure he wanted to just make sure that it would have taken off the top, but I'm like completely sure that was going to go off the top. Okay. But Boomy, uh, throughout that, so we saw a lot of signatures come out. That's kind of the point where you pick up a new character. You're going to have to, like Duke said at the opening, knowledge check. You're going to have to yeah. make sure they know what's going on. And it looked like Fozzy was lost sometimes. <laughs> when those lands down sticks started coming out, uh, we have a lot of clips here of the KOs and the potential of that character. And, uh, a lot of it was just like you said, Fozzy not being able to get in a proper position to punish that, that lands decent. We saw him slide charge off the edge sometimes, face that wall, and then when he goes to the other side, Fozzy goes for the punish, doesn't connect, boom, ground pound. Mm -hmm. uh, most of Boomy's knockouts on himself were uh, honestly just misplays, right? We saw him kind of fall off the right side and then waste a dodge when coming back, and Fozzy takes full advantage of that with the punish, but for the most part... You're it, talking about the Demon Island games, Yeah, we're right? talking about yeah. the Demon Island. Uh, for the most part, uh, Fozzy couldn't really find KOs on Boomy. That game on Brawl even was a switch up. Fozzy did a really good job of trying to zone him away, uh, punish those signatures with the long range spear. He had a better chance at it, but Boomy kind of slowed it down after that. He said, all right, we're going to go Apocalypse. I'm going to play a slower. Uh, I'm going to kind of weigh you out more, punish your spear options. We saw the spears still come out. The downlights were getting punished by Lance Snares this time. It kind of just, uh, Boomy adapted almost instantly to the gameplay. Wow. I'm just, I'm still... <laughs> I'm still reeling over that double delight. The, yeah, double, the, the, the double delight I, was when I, I saw him go for two. I was like, okay, that's risky. And then when he dropped it, I, I guess, was like, wow. I guess that's just like a mix of singles, tournament nerves, and also because like because going for the double delight was already kind of like I'm like, yeah. okay, fine, style on him. <laughs> I was like, that's what I was getting ready when to I, say. When I saw the double, I was like. I first saw something came out, I was like, he's going to drop out. <laughs> you saw him in the double, you you the drop, I was like, Because the no double way. was already, yeah. you're like, huh? What are you thinking? Anyways. I, I feel like that's a twos play, right? Because you yeah. want to go for yeah. those optimal KOs. But either way, he's going to have time to think about that one. And so are we, because we're going to take a short little break. When we come back, of course, we'll, bring, we'll be bringing you more of the 1v1 action here at DreamHack Dallas. We'll be right back.
continues here at DreamHack Dallas, of course, where Brahala doing some 1v1 action. We still have some people filling out some spots in that top 32 of things we've already seen on deck. We've got Fiend versus Cutie coming up next. How do you feel about it? Excited to see it. Cutie's a player that's becoming more of a favorite of mine as he develops in the Brahala scene, especially with how well he's been doing in 2v2s with Dog, but just also being a threat in singles. I don't think he's, I think he's like in that Jet bean Clem area of, <laughs> yeah, of like you haven't really pushed through too much, but you, yeah. people know your name at least. They know that all right. If I lose to if if uh, I'm playing cutie here, this is a real match I take seriously. He hasn't won them yet, but he definitely is being taken seriously at this point in time. Yes, that is a perfect way to put it. And Fiend, on the other hand, is like one Household of the name. the bosses of South America, yep. right? And so the the win here for cutie would be an enormous deal. But I think a lot of players are expecting Fiend to be able to get through this. Uh, quite easily and, and move forward. Uh, what do you think, dude? Yeah, I, I kind of basically agree that uh, I think a lot of favoritism goes to Fiend. Obviously, like emotionally, people have loved Fiend for a really long time. But I think just in terms of like raw player skill, Fiend's just a little bit ahead. We've seen him at the top for a while now. Whereas Cutie, he's like kind of like you said, he's on the come up. He's one of those people who's like he's had these moments where he's done really well, but. He hasn't had that like top player consistency yeah. that you would want against someone like Fiend. I will say though, Cutie does have those hilarious Twitter image memes from San Diego, so he's got that going for him. And also okay. PR thirteen. I yeah. didn't realize it was actually that That's high. That's actually consistency. insanely high. Yeah, actually. so maybe I'm just like wrong. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe Cutie's the go it, here. It, it's interesting because um, it's PR thirteen, but it's relative to North America. And what we've been having at, at least at San Diego and here at Dallas, is we have like 16 good players from each region. region. Yeah. So it's like 13, but every time there's a 13, there's actually three 13s in attendance. So you now, end up being, you get what I'm trying to get yeah, at. Yeah, right? we know we know Fiend has like a wide array of characters he can pull out. Even with the hammer buffs that we just saw, the Nash could make a comeback. And that was a character oh. that he popularized back in the day. Uh, and when we saw the hammer nurse come in, what about we the saw Kai. But yeah, we saw him kind of move to the Nai, the Wuxiang, into what was more meta at the time, the Katars of Gauntlets. Now, Cutie, we have a Kaya picture here, but we also see him play a lot of Axe and Gauntlets in twos, right? So it could really be anything that they pull out. Yeah, and I've even seen Cutie play Blasters, depending on what the matchup is as well. So what we've got coming up here can be completely in the air. There's the Kaya, though, being locked into the Wuxiang. Wait, Wuxiang okay. Coming up from Fiend, yeah. Wuxiang makes a lot of sense. We saw Wuxiang do well, and of course, Kaya's become more and more popular, Three, even though, yeah, cutie has been playing Kaya one, for a hot minute one. here. He's not like a bandwagon Kaya or anything like that, but still, you're seeing a lot of more people feeling comfortable playing Kaya and, and do well. Yeah, so here we are, opening oh. up on Brawlhaven, with a down stick to start off the damage. And Fiend on the Wuxiang is definitely relentless. I, I, we talk about it every time, I'm going to bring it up the first time it's on stream every time. Fiend basically invented how to play Spear in Brawlhalla. I feel like he's been pushing it further than before it got popular in any other region. And he has such a, a, a specific play style that he's so consistent with that it makes him terrifying to play against. So seeing him opening up with the Gauntlets here is really fantastic, but this is the weapon that I'm expecting to get the majority of his knockouts on. Yeah, it's so funny because, like, it, it, Fiend should be more synonymous with Spear than I think he is because a lot of people like to look at North America. But yeah. Fiend, it, he's been playing Spear for so long. Like, basically, his entire character pool is Spear Ooh, plus weapon. The read was correct there on the weapon throw, but the recovery didn't go high enough to be able to get the hits. But yes, you're absolutely correct. The downstick opens up the game with it, ends the stock with it there as he takes the lead. Uh, and switches right back over to the Gauntlets here, actually, to continue adding on damage to Cutie. So that might actually be how he has to play in this matchup here, as Cutie has kind of joined the, the, the Kaya meta train, right? Where we've got, like, these two sides of, of competitive play where everybody's picking either Mordex or Kaya, and he's on that side. Well, I mean, can't go wrong with the Kaya. We've seen the signature kit of Kaya just be such a strong tool. Fiend trying to get the multiple side airs, which can be so devastating off stage, but Cutie got past it. Oh, weapon, weapon throw toss, just barely yeah. gets it there. Gets the stuff recovery on, uh, on that too. That would have been that just would have been the stock. Nair, one more of those could do it. Even grounded at this point. But Fiend only getting hit by Nair means he's sending the stock as far forward as possible. Ground pound hits oh, and the grabbing cancel neutral He signature. had line of sight. I I wonder if it was because it wasn't because Cutie had line of sight, but because Fiend had line of sight. Like his head was like popping over the yeah. side of the stage to the ground pound to get hit. But that was that was bizarre. Usually when we talk about line of sight, we're talking about uh, it's a opponent on the edge of the stage if their if their eyes are appearing above the side of the stage But Kaya clearly wasn't wasn't there. So that was interesting Well, definitely helped cutie out there got that stock but Fiend still maintaining that lead 
unperturbed by that uh, owl catching him from the ground there. Yeah, the act no recovery, right? Yeah. And that's, uh, that is definitely a classic for Kaya at this point. Oh, I can't believe he did sidelight that. I, I was almost certain, of, like, that sidelight. He just ended up dashing forward instead, and if he was like, okay, and then, and then gets the knockout on the right side of the stage. Well, now final stock here for Cutie. Back to the bow. Fiend. He's been doing such a good job with these gauntlets, just maintaining that pressure on Akuti. Oh, yeah, and just look at that four-hit string coming through, gets the cider back to the stage, Nair's right oh, underneath the, the ground from Cutie to the weapon throw, we get the recovery, and Cutie celebrating that a little bit there, because that was that was very necessary. I think Fiend had less damage than Cutie has on him right now when he got that stock. Yeah, that, that was, that, was that, that bow ground pound was so critical, and then being able to follow it up with that weapon toss that caught Fiend right as he recovered, really well done from Cutie to bring him back into this one. Nair spikes him off the left side of the stage. Ground pound, running off the side of the stage, does not connect. There's the down stick, getting him off the left side of the stage. He charged it? I, he charged it, and he made sure that he positioned uh, facing the correct way. Yeah. Because no, with the Wushong down stick's interesting. It, it grabs on both sides, but once you go through the spiral in the center, you'll always be churned out in the direction that he's facing. So Fiend had to be sure that he pivoted that in a way to where Cutie was going to get knocked out no matter which way he dodged. Um, but yeah, there's that neutral stick that we were looking at there. That was crazy. And that down takes Vader just had enough force, but uh, yeah, there's some highlights coming through here. But interesting of note, definitely leaned on those gauntlets. Like we saw it in the gameplay, but you're seeing it on the stats as well. 437 damage put out on those gauntlets versus 105 on his spear. So despite being a prolific spear player, he's got great gauntlet plays as well. Yeah, the gauntlets are, are the name of the game here. And I'm wondering if this means Cutie's going to break out a different legend after uh, twice on Brawl Haven there, just not being able to get the job done because uh, three, yeah, two, looking fantastic one, brawl. so far here. And there it is. The Asuri coming through uh, to fight against Fiend here in game number two. Oh, again, the, the down takes a light attack for him, I guess. Yeah. It, it, it makes sense. He's, he's kind of either using it to catch a landing after, after every jump's been expended, or he's using it to catch a dodge in or over him um, after a neutral light has connected. And he's been doing really great with it in a way to where it's like, I don't feel like he's going to get punished for it even if it misses. He's gotten away with so many of them, and honestly, like, he's connected with a bunch of them. The way that he charges it is really throwing QD off as well. Like, he'll charge it for just long enough, QD comes in, then immediately throws it out and catches QD in the air. Yeah, because uh, we were talking a bit about the... Nice recovery. We were talking about the Thea down take on Lance and how it has that property where, like, the hitbox is active, and then you charge it, and then you can choose how long you charge it before the next hitbox comes out. And Wushong down take works like that uh, in, a, in a similar way. But like Koji, you can add a little bit of extra charge for that oom. And sometimes you can go even further if you expect your opponent not to be spamming dodge to get out of it. And that's exactly what Fiend is so good at doing. He's, he's insane on these gauntlets right now. Cutie, over to this... Uh, oh, there it is again. Yeah, that's great. He's got that. He's, he's fantastic with that. And he's been getting him at the edge of the stage, always getting the right direction when he's facing. It, it, Cutie switches over to the Asuri and it's looking even more dire. Yeah, the, the, the swap to the Asuri has basically amounted to nothing. Uh, sword in hand now. Can he get a down light side air? Yeah, Needs a little more. Not even enough, and Cutie goes all the way okay. up the side of the stage. That's a great edge guard there. I would have said, like, I don't know if you should be doing this on one stock, but, I mean, he has to do what he can to get these. Yeah, he these. has to get the stocks. He's got to get the stocks and not take damage while taking while, while getting them, too. And that's the, the difficult ask of, uh, of Cutie right now. Oh, side light, double D light, yeah. Ser Nair, chase on going. up. What? Feed literally was like, I, I, the only way this combo stops is if you hit me. <laughs> he wanted that combo to go all the way off screen. And now Fiend's kind of like, let me demonstrate to you what happens when I use my main Wait. weapon. <laughs> He's like, I've been using gauntlets the entire time. Double D-Light, Sider on the left side, just over two minutes. It's a two-stock after that switch to the Asurian. Cutie has got to be doing some soul searching there um, after that one, because I imagine he was like, okay, the Asuri is going to do better against what I am struggling against, and that was not really the case. Last opportunity here. I guess uh, Fiend doing so well. Yeah, we Dude, he, seriously, like, he, he can go wrong with none of his weapons. Look at that! Downlight! Insane. Downlight into Spears the down insane. signature, right? There's a lot of things where you're like, you could have gotten guaranteed damage, but he's reading how his opponent's dodging so well that he might as well get guaranteed knockouts, because that's how accurate he's been with those down things. He's been wild. What do you think? What do you think Scooty's gonna play? All right. What I think he's going to play yeah. is probably he's going to go back to the last pick, uh, the Kaya. Yeah. Um, 
Do I think it'll work? Not really. Oh, okay, he's actually stuck three. with uh, with Tigress. Three, yeah, okay. Two, one, brawl. Neutral light opened up from Fiend. Cutie, maybe he'll lean a little bit more onto this sword. He had some moments in the end of game two where I was like, okay, maybe his guitars are starting to come alive here, but even then, Fiend's just so dominant right now. Yeah. Uh, the, my, Miami Dome is going to have to hopefully do it for him, right? A Brawl Haven would just seem to be so good for Fiend, and Fiend was taking advantage of those small corners by Rick carrying him over the down six, but like, now that Fiend's starting to get a read with the, with the spear, I really do feel like Fiend's just decided, like, okay, I guess I can show you what I have on spear, because every time that he connects one move with that, like, five follow, and spear is not exactly, like, mo most weapons in Brawlhalla, you get your, like, one or two guaranteed hits. Seeing Fiend get five hits after an opening in neutral every single time, getting over that 34 to 40 damage for engagement, that's incredible, and he's still running away with the lead here against Cutie. Yeah, he's just maintaining this pressure on top of Cutie. Chase dodges, catches him with the Nair as well, gets extra hits. Cutie finally finds a rebuttal, right? But then here comes Fiend again. Two, goes for the weapon toss to keep that pressure going. Oh. Still getting hits, no responses. Cutie finally finds a, a, a little bit of damage. Yeah, side lights are coming through though, and the Nair connects, and there's that down. See, this still, still works! Still. He doesn't even have to get the, the, the... He doesn't carry him in. He gets... And that's like the one case where you could see, like, Wushong blasting somebody away where he's not facing, when you yeah. only fall into the blast. Feet gets the knockout again, and Cutie shaking his head, being like, what do I do against this Feet? Yeah, he just does not have any answers to Fiend right now. That gauntlet, D-Sig, the spear, everything that Fiend's bringing to the table, and uh, Cutie's just struggling. Holy cow, Nair hits. Another Nair almost comes through, there's no dodge, and Fiend knows it gets to the chase Cutie's dodge. Down. down Nair, okay, Cutie gets a wake-up neutral light to break that pressure, but man, Fiend is on top of him. I mean, he's on the verge of a three-stock, dude. There's no way. Okay, okay. D-Lab recovery. I'm glad I cast his curse for that, because, because, <laughs> uh, oh. This is this is about being as one-sided as we let it off to be, but I was still kind of hoping that that wasn't going to be the case. Let's see if Cutie can bring it back. Oh, no, no, those neutral six. How does Fiend get him every single time? Cutie not dodging the way that he should. Those neutral six. That's the first one I think we've seen miss. Side light tries to go for that pivot down down light there to go for the, the knockout. Cutie getting some good damage in. Thought he had the dodge there. Didn't quite catch. Oh, I thought he was going to recover after that pogo. Neutral six goes for a jump, okay, creating Cutie stays grounded. That's scary. It's a scary position to be in, though. Yeah. I mean, that is a whirling fan blade right above your head, and Fiend with another down sig. Oh. Gonna take game I number three. I love that last stock, because Fiend picked up the gauntlets, fast fell on top of Cutie, ate two down lights, and was like, I'm still trying to <laughs> land and hit down sig. I don't, I really, like, I'm just ready to finish this game and move on to my next winner's bracket match. And that was uh, dominant in Fiend's favor there. Yeah, I mean, South America, we talked a little bit about this. Like, they struggled in the 2v2 space. There's only one South American player left in 2v2s, and maybe that's a, a little bit of a wake-up call for the 1v1ers out there for South America to be like, all right, well, we at least got to put ourselves on the board here in 1v1s. Yeah, I mean, and that's... Uh Remy, we were talking about this beforehand, right? That's that's PR 13 in North America really uh, being tossed around by Fiends. It's really high, but it's still like high to the point where you don't expect it to just like go in there and then it's a 3-0, you know, just flat out. None of the games really looked like it was in the favor of Cutie, and it was this non-stop aggression from Fiend that you're seeing here. It was a, like a bridge of attacks at all times, even uh, as soon as he got into that, that Miami Dome game on the second stock, we saw Fiend get that KO very early and then instantly right back into it, getting almost like five hits in a row before uh, QD even had a chance to clap back, sending him off the top again. And like you mentioned, it was almost a three stock in that last game and it didn't look like Fiend had any plans of slowing down at any point. And I think it's kind of like a point where it's like, okay, it's, a, it's an experience gap, right? Because Fiend has always played that aggressively, that fast and that ruthlessly, but it takes a higher level of player, a more knowledgeable player to stop his, uh, his aggression line, you can see here, he's just going in with these attacks. There's no time where he looks like, okay, I want to stop it, and even bites him back here uh, with him getting ground pounded at the end. Uh, right. As he as he pushes forward, though, it's just like, what can I do to stop this guy, you know? I'm in the air, and he's still coming at me. He's still going for these down sticks. What options do I have to stop him? Yeah, what, in particular, what do you think it was Fiend that was looking at with Cutie that was allowing him to have such incredibly high signature accuracy? Because, like, I feel like, 
a lot of players are familiar with the Wushong uh, sidelight end sig, but for some reason, Fiend made that 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 combo right, the, that string looks so much better against him than against anybody else. I think it was just the the first time he did it because I did notice that the first, very first time he went for that sidelight end sig, it yeah. actually whiffed. It did not okay. connect, right? And then after that, he started going for other things. He went for the sidelight nair. He went for the sidelight double dealer, and those did connect. So he said, uh, so uh, for QD, it kind of got to his point where it's like, okay, I don't have to worry about the end sig anymore. I have to worry about the rest of the Spears kid. Yeah. And as soon as Fiend noticed that, that he's dodging into a point where the NSIG will hit, but nothing else with, he started throwing out the NSIG again, and Ooh. it started connecting right where he wanted it to. So it's kind of that thing with Spear where it's like always, you have to switch up your dodges consistently. Every single time it has to be different. Because if it is, you just have to make the Spear player play a guessing game at that point. Because even if you're just like slightly switching it up, you're going to get caught out uh, just like at the third time, you know? So yeah. you have to switch it up every single time. And Cutie just was not doing that towards the end of that set. That's what you call conditioning. You got to make sure that they change up what they're doing because otherwise you're going to get caught. And, uh, it's like you said, that that experience check right there from Cutie where he was just kind of like falling into the traps. I really feel like after getting hit by like three or four of those <laughs> gauntlet down six, his brain just kind of turned off for a second. He was going for those like instinct dodges more than like, oh, I need to actually dodge this way against my opponent. Yeah, I mean, if a guy is hitting you with down light Wuxiang down six and you had to dodge into it, you definitely have to start thinking about what am I doing? What options does he have in his kit? Because that isn't an option that people go for a lot. Usually you'll see the down light regular end sig, right, to catch the dodge away or the spot dodge, he dodges in, and the down is there waiting for him. So maybe Fiend knew something we didn't there because that is very surprising of an option to go for. Right, well, up next, we've got Sandstorm versus Maid, which if I if I remember correctly, because you've This is elimination side. This is elimination yeah, side. Yeah, side. And this is, a, this is an interesting matchup coming up from the elimination side because I think Maid, I keep saying this, and I guess it's just, there's just so many uh, really great players in North America that have a variety of results in singles. The PR52 is actually surprisingly low to my knowledge from how I think Maid performs in singles because him and Experience tend to do so well in twos. Um, well. Well, Maid is an interesting one because uh, I don't want to say he's exactly like me back in the day, but he <laughs> focuses really hard on that 2v2 side of Rawhalla. You don't really see him queuing ones a lot. And in the tournaments, I, I'm not surprised by the Siege 52 just because he talks about it. He says, uh, I signed up for the ones tournament because I'm there because it's available to me, but I'm really grinding on that twos mode and uh, ones come second. It really does take that backseat for him. Uh, we do see a one silver medal there. If Sparky was here, he'd tell us exactly where that medal came from. <laughs> I'm not too sure, but that does show he does have some experience in the higher parts of the bracket, so he definitely does have it. And Sandstorm falling very early, relatively early for himself into the loser's side, into the elimination side. So he might be playing not like himself. Maybe Maid can use that experience he has getting that silver medal to take something against Sandstorm here. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, right, it's all best of fives, and now that we're on the elimination side of thing, uh, Maid just has to play right three times in a row, and we're going to see Sandstorm out of the bracket. That's all, that's all it takes yeah, to be just, Sandstorm. That's all you got to do. Just, just Win three times, just Sandstorm's out. <laughs> Just yeah. don't get hit. But uh, I, I think, like, the PR being that low, it's kind of, like, uh, expected on my part because just so consistently people were like, experience needs a different teammate. Like, mm. for the longest time, people were like, experience is the one who's doing all this work because he's doing well in 1v1s and 2v2s, and Maid's just there. But then we started to see them do well together as a twos team. Yeah, it's like, I, think, okay. I think that commentary has been, been quelled for the since BCX, yeah. I think ever since then, there's kind of like, nope, experience and mates is stable. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's like, we're not, we, we're sorry. Respect we said anything. Mate. Respect mate. Yeah, exactly. Um, but in the 1v1 space, I don't think anybody's even talking about mate, right? So this is a really interesting opportunity because like you said, Duke, Sandstorm has shown that he's vulnerable because he's in the elimination side so early on. So Maid has an opportunity here to get those wins. And as we saw over the weekend, right after the 2v2s upsets coming out from Snipe Sox and, and I'm Llama, the, 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 competitive uh, consistency of Sandstorm and Boomy is a little bit up in the air. We got to have that reassurance with Boomy versus Fozy, which was a very good win for him. But Sandstorm versus Maid, well, maybe we'll see something that we're not expecting to see. Now, we could also end up seeing a mirror here. It is going to be the side mirror. All right. So this is, this is interesting. I, I remember hearing, Duke, that uh, experience was experimenting with uh -huh. Nyx as a, a singles pick because okay. he's trying to take this, the game a little bit more seriously. But seeing Maid on the Nyx as well is pretty cool. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Like, you played uh, a lot of Scythe for a while with the, yeah. uh, the Moonin, and then, of course, uh, his Blaster is coming over from that cross in 2v2s. Like, there's a lot of things that could work well for this Nyx, but also, like, you're about to play Scythe into the guy who basically put Scythe on the map, like mm -hmm. the guy who's been that guy when it comes to Scythe. 
Yeah, so it's going to be really cool to see how this plays out. Nyx is one of those characters, um, like Roland, like Zario, where I go, like, they're, like hypothetically, this, this character should be perfect for some players, but we just rarely ever see it being busted out. And also, Nyx has got that crazy dunk opportunity on the neutral signature. Speaking of that down, it's like flying off the left side of the stage. Uh, and Maid actually taking a breather there, because that first stock was really close between both of them. Yeah, I think a lot closer than a lot of people would have expected to get. This is Sandstorm we're talking about. I mean, like, oh. ignoring the sheer history of wins this guy has, he got second at DreamHack San Diego very recently. So there's a lot of high expectations for him as a 1v1 player, but Nate's kind of got the lead right now. Yeah, and Nate's take it, was running away with it too. That down air, side air, a difficult true combo to hit because it can be very, very, it's just variable depending on how much damage they've taken. But once they get high enough, that is a true combo that you can get a knockout for. But Sandstorm gained the dodge Whoa. and reads and that. Oh, you see him reacting to that one. That one, okay, so he just, I guess, was going to play a little too fast on the keys. And yeah. hitting that, that emote. And he's like, I'm probably going to unbind that after the. He, he no. immediately said, What? And I'm like, Okay, you didn't mean to just disrespect Maid that hard. But what but... if it worked? Because Maid's got a little bit of a sprig on his face right now. He's kind of like, Did you really just do that? Oh, the like ground pound comes through, and Sandstorm's going to collect himself after that misinput there. I know some players like to unbind those, uh, those emotes yeah. just in case, because they do just fly around on the keys sometimes. But still, Maid's got a lead here game number one and he's taking some extra credit that recovery just barely knocked out off the top yeah since we're gonna have to shake that one off final stocks here still an opportunity to, on either side not too much damage has been done on to Sandstorm's final stock, but Maid's stuck on this wall for a little bit, comes up with a Sair. Ooh, falls with that side light, and Maid is actually controlling the ground. Pivots the neutral light, falls down with that down air, Sandstorm gets one, doesn't get two though, and that down air does not lead into more. Sandstorm dodging up out of that down light follow up, and Maid switching right over to the blasters. And with a little bit more damage, D-Light Recovery is a true combo that'll take Sandstorm right off the top. Dare Sair, we were talking about it earlier, there it is again. D-Light Recovery, oh! that's gonna be it for game number one. Maid taking the first game against Sandstorm after what I really feel like the momentum like that was that was a train wreck for the momentum after that emo happened in Sandstorm like we saw that reaction on the player cam what the heck happened why am I putting out the woo emote? Yeah. and then and then made who was already playing really solid going into that game one did not drop the momentum that he stole from Sandstorm. I, I really feel like once Maid swapped over to the Blasters on that final stock, like there was just kind of this speed increase that Sandstorm was not ready for, right? Like he hit Dare, bounced into the Sair, and then came back down, caught him D-Light Recovery. It just immediately deleted Sandstorm's stock. Like that's the Maid Blasters that we're used to seeing in the 2v2 space, but he's bringing it out Three, in 1v1s one and two, Sandstorm's one, changing four. it up. He's okay. going over to the shell, the Tezka, uh, not crossover, but Alternate, I guess. Yeah, I mean it's like the Unit and Hugin thing. Yeah. Just say the names, right? You just got you say uh, different different characters, same move set, right? So the Tesca moves are coming out here, but it's on shell. And Sandstorm did so. This oh man, made me is just absolutely lighting him up with the blasters. Um, I want to mention that while I did say that Sandstorm was all in on the Mordex this weekend, it was known that the, that the Tesca was in the back pocket for specific matchup counterpicks. And this is one of those things where I think Sandstorm was feeling like, okay, I have to bring up the boots to play against how Maid is playing. But let's just see if that works, because I really was expecting Mordex all day from Sandstorm here. Yeah, I guess maybe just not feeling it right now. Which, again, like, it, it's impressive from on Maid's side, because uh, we started this off, and I was like, you're playing Scythe into the guy who basically, like, put Scythe on the map, and forced him off of Scythe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, when, you, when you win the Scythe though against Sandstorm and make him switch, that's a, that's a yeah, statement already. that's a statement. Go. But Maid does go down on that first stock, just like in game number one, Maid lost that first stock and was able to get right back into it with a quick knockout. Um, let's see if he can do it again, or if Sandstorm's able to get a huge boots, uh, boots combo here. Gravity catch on neutral stick, catches his foot. As he as he neutralites off the side, when you do the boots neutralite, you take a step forward before you kick, right? And he kicks yeah, over the side of the stage. Forward. I think Sandstorm thought he was safe, so getting caught by that was like like that Kaya neutral sig moment from the set earlier today. Yeah, where he's like, oh snap! I, I peeked over just a little bit too much there. Still relatively even between the two of them, but May getting this corner oh. guard goes for the GC down light. Sandstorm barely the touches here? the wall. Oh, goes for the ground pound instead. Sandstorm holds onto the side of the wall, but so much of this damage has gone over in favor of May. Oh. Neutral light oh. to end stake. Sandstorm dodges straight up and fastball gotcha. right afterwards. Edge guard opportunity here with the ground pound. That's going to be it. Second Still touch? Pound. Okay, okay. And he, he just barely wasn't able to act there, and Sandstorm holds onto this lead, albeit barely. Maid was really running away with it. Another Nair keeps Sandstorm off the edge, dodges through, manages to get back, touches that wall. Oh man, Maid gets that dare. Edge guard has to go for it. Gravity cancel silence okay, the other way. 
and now switches over to the blasters. Puts out a Punish. side stick, and that's a very punishable signature yeah. as far as Nix's kit goes. And Sandstorm, he's inching into the lead here. He's not getting a lot here. Like, if May just gets a down light, could easily bring this one back. The Whoa. side air almost does it. Man, that one went far. Okay. Sarah's it into the wall. The bounce decreases the knockback oh. enough. And that was terrifying because that spikes, yeah. right? If he gets that gravity catch on Rootstick, the spike distance isn't far, but he gets the chase dodge, touches, gets the edge guard opportunity with Gauntlets against an unarmed maid. That would have been huge. Now it's one stock apiece here in game two. Just a little bit of a damage lead for Sandstorm, but May could easily take this one away as well. Sidelight gets the recovery, gets yeah, the dare, gets Sarah. the Sarah. Sandstorm's taking so much damage the here. Dare. Oh, he, he doesn't touches. get it. And Sandstorm kicks him to the side of the stage. Didn't have, like, boots don't have the active input to reverse your opponent. Edgeguard goes to the down air there, and Sandstorm barely making it back. What could have been from game gets that down light, gets the side to put off the side of the stage. Doesn't get the second down light there, and Maid makes it back. Okay, Maid now solidly behind, but still has a chance. And there's connect from Sandstorm. A little oh, bit of damage here. Goes for a dare. The dare sits me flying off the right side of the stage, but that's not going to be it. Just get the debtor oh. connects and Sandstorm makes it back. Neutral like connects, bounces him off the stage, throws the boots low. Does he go for the edge guard? Oh! He misses the ground pound after the delay, and Maid now has a huge opportunity. No weapon spawn. There it is. Goes for the recovery. Made still alive here. He's still got some room, but there's oh. the recovery. Sandstorm finally closing out that game. All right. We are we are seeing some flubs and a half coming out there from Sandstorm because he's reacting in the same way that I am when those 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 combos don't come through. And he's like, what the heck? What's happening here? The downline of recovery was not what he was looking for at all. We've seen that Edgar set up a million times. So seeing him drop that means that Made, uh, th th those there are cracks in the armor here for Sandstorm, yeah. and Maid's got an opportunity to make an incredible upset this early on to the weekend. This Three, is kind of what we were two, saying at the start of the one, set, is like, oh. this uh, this is maybe the weakest Sandstorm has looked in a, yeah. in a hot minute. Is uh, This is the most defeatable Sandstorm has looked. Although he's over to the shell, still was not a convincing finish in game number two, but we're going right on into game number three. Yeah, I guess the difference is that you got the win in game two and you did it in game one, yeah. and that's all that Sandstorm is focused on right now. Made, however, playing oh. his game plan strengths perfectly, and I don't even hey. think Sandstorm can make that back. Uses that dodge, puts up the side air, hoping that it would connect, and May was just kind of like, I've already gotten enough jumps here, and that's a near zero to knock out there, dude. Yeah, that is a massive lead for Maid. Sidelight connects, goes for the dare, doesn't hit it though, but he's still getting all these hits on the Sandstorm. Whoa. Yeah, the scythe play from Maid has been fantastic. Sandstorm gets a ton of damage there on the gauntlets. We gotta remember, he's a stock behind, and Maid's keeping this even in terms of the damage coming through here. That slice came through and almost catches him, catches him off the right side of the stage. Sidelight, active input, pushes him forward. The side stick almost catches Sandstorm as well. Okay, Ooh, good nice dodge through. That Not was enough. Fantastic, but the recovery just doesn't have the same oomph that a sword recovery would have there, right? Boots are really reliant on knocking you out horizontally. He's waiting he's just for good damage. Downlight, Sarah. Yeah. Yep, that should KO. And now he's got the he's got the weapon advantage. Is that enough to get him back into the game? I love how thoughtful Maid is in between stocks. Where like yeah. he literally like loses a stock, puts his puts his hand to his chin, and goes, hmm, okay, I gotta change this and that going into this next stock. All right, got it. Delight recovery. Got just Almost? barely not knocking out, but the Nair tag's not enough damage where I think a Dare Sarah would even be enough uh, at this point. Maid's got a lot of damage on the Sandstorm here, and the platform movement from him is looking incredibly confident. Side air, off the scythe, almost does it. Sandstorm disarmed, ground pound connects. Almost a full stock lead for Maid over Sandstorm right now. Yeah, Sandstorm uh, struggling against Maid's scythe as Maid had a fresh one prime there. Gets the weapon throw, sends him off stage with that neutral air. Switches over to the blasters. He tried to do a weapon throw, pick up gravity, gets a downlight. That would have been so flashy, but the platform interrupts what uh, what the, the setup that he was going for there. But two side lights? Is that Cody Travis? Oh, Wait, Maid's blasters are so great. He's what? just picking apart Sandstorm right now. This is the multi time world champion versus. PR 52 made, and it's kind of doing it right now. Oh, and the Nair comes through. Scythe picked up. Neutral light and an end stick. Could have worked, but that down air spikes him, forces the dodge. D light Yo! ground pound, and Maid says, That's how you do that edge guard, Sandstorm, as he takes it to match points. Oh, my goodness. Made, he's one game away from knocking Sandstorm out of the tournament. This is a guy who was on multiple people's predictions to be in the top he's three. He's on mine. He was, he's, he's a guy who, who got second at DreamHack San Diego. He's a guy who's won multiple world championships in 1v1 and 2v2. Yeah. 
This is crazy. And as far as Sandstorm's trajectory throughout the year has been, right, we look at Winters, he gets fifth. We look at Springs, he gets fourth. We look at San Diego, he gets second. He's been having this stellar climb towards being at potentially that number one spot again. And this is a qualifier match on the elimination Three, two, side. To get into top 32. Four. Like, he's not in yeah. top 32 yet. Yeah, this is this is rough. And Maid is now one game away from sending Sandstorm out at 33rd. That would be and, so wild. And, and making it an upset that will almost certainly double his PR. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like that is, he is playing so fantastic, uh, numbers aside. But Sandstorm, after those two shell games, is back over to Mordex, and he's looking like he's playing a little differently here. This is a fantastic opener. Goes in for a huge dodge right there. Side air does hit. Sandstorm could go for a down stick here. That would knock out. D-Light recovery would also knock out. There it is. No. no. I am so wrong whenever I'm on Apocalypse. That ceiling is so deceptive to me. He, he, he thought it would work too. Okay. Yeah. He definitely he definitely was like, okay, hopefully this will work out. Did not quite do it. Side air is not gonna do it either. Sandstorm needs to find a way to finish this stock off. Down line, not gonna connect. Made. Yeah. Still kind of just halting Sandstorm here. Down air is not gonna do it either. Maybe a weapon toss? Yeah, there it is. He waited yeah. for I, it, Sandstorm is fantastic at this. He'll stay on stage, he'll wait for like a specific jump or or dodge animation, like the startup mm -hmm. animation, and he goes for the dash jump up with throw. And he catches them off guard and he caught Maid in that same way. But Maid did such a great job bringing damage back there that he could even this up pretty quickly uh, if he gets the right D-Light recovery. I think he needs a little bit more damage for a little knockout on Apocalypse. And Sandstorm with two good hits there is starting to really run away with this lead. Still trying to find his way into Maid. Maid doesn't hit the end sig. He's got to stop going for that. I, I know that he's like, he's like eventually maybe Sandstorm will spot dodge a place, but he's dodged up every single time because Nick doesn't have the coverage uh, with their signature kit to be able to punish that kind of dodge option. Oh, but, but he got him off the platform. Different story when you just get the hardest read of your life, right? Like that's a, that's a great way to knock out there on that platform. Maid with that weapon advantage really mitigated the lead that Sandstorm built on those initial stocks. Oh, yeah. Sandstorm getting that side light off the side of the stage. Downlight could go for a, a, a nice opportunity here to get this edge guard. Maid recovers low, holds on to the side. That Nair gets easily punished oh, and Maid's in the mob stage. No dodge, though. Opportunity for Sandstorm, but he just wants to get back on stage. Yeah, just wants that corner guard. Maid opens him up with the weapon toss, but he ends up disarming himself. Down sick goes for the up toss. That's what we were talking about. You have the active input yeah. options there. Bouncing off the stage there wouldn't have been too great. I think he knew that wasn't going to knock out. He just wanted a chance to cover the landing. Sidelight active input forward means he gets the strong hit there. Doesn't kick him up for any kind of follow-up. Falling with the side air, misspaces it once again. Those neutral end sticks are just giving Sandstorm opportunities to get back into the game. Maid's hit that once, but I don't think Sandstorm's going to let that happen again. But oh, accidental pivot there means that Maid gets some damage through, and now it's a dead even game. A downlight could do this for Maid. The side air's not going to get the stock. I can't believe that. That's crazy. Maid is living for so long on this Nick's second yeah. stock. And Sig oh. misses, Maid's finding hits. Weapon throw, picks it back up again, gets back to the stage, falls oh. to Darren, Maid, a rare blunder there, gets hit by the side there, and not even the stage reducing the knockback there's enough to save him. Maid down to one stock, but Sandstorm, uh, there's a lot. Haymaker. Yeah, there's a, I don't know if he's, he's gonna be that risky with it. Okay, that was that was crazy. Slide charge neutral comes forward there. You're gonna see the down Sig. Um, but Nick's signatures are, are, aren't the kind of things that you rely on like a light attack. And Sandstorm's kind of taking a ton of damage oh. here as Maid fishes for that knockout. And Maid's realizing it. Uh, needs to go back to playing to that game plan that was working out so well for him. Don't worry about the damage. Just worry about getting those light attacks. Down like ground pound. Great. Maid puts it the final stocks here. This could be the decider between Sandstorm being done for DreamHack Dallas or going to game five. Yeah, and how early into the day would that be for Sandstorm there? Maid uh, on the Knicks playing so well. Now in a scythe ditto. Both players posturing towards center stage and Maid's house is the scythe away and Sandstorm says, okay, fine, I'll switch too. <laughs> Goes over to the gauntlets. But really what Sandstorm was doing is, what, is, is denying, exactly. Oh, that was a burn spot dodge. He was sweat beating, still denying weapons. Yeah. Did hard you can get for, the read? Hard for Maid to follow up there while on arms. Blasters are picked up here. And Gauntlets have a pretty good job, or a pretty good time getting in. Oh, that ground oh. pound is hit stacked. That was wild. Still needs to finish this stock off. Is Neutralite's gonna not going to do it. Oh, not this year. Balls over the recovery and Maid makes it back. One more chance. I, I think that next dodge. Gauntlet Neutralite at this position would just knock out. That's it. Oh, he gets it. Sandstorm yeah. takes this to game win. five. 694 damage. Get off of Apocalypse, Sandstorm. <laughs> like, what? There was like four minutes. Four instances of him trying to knock it off the top yeah. that barely didn't like work. Like the recovery. And then and, <sighs> and then Maid gets 100 damage. That is that is scary. We're now at game number five there, and Maid's making it so close against Sandstorm. 
I, I, surely Sandstorm stays with the Mordex, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think he's going to be sticking with his Mordex for game number five. Uh, just his gauntlets Three, looked a little bit cleaner. Two, I, one, I really feel one. like he's uh, <laughs> he's crazy for sticking he, with Apocalypse. He had to do 700 damage to win, yeah. dude. I cannot believe it. Okay, because he, he's not hitting the moves that I think that Sandstorm used to getting those early knockouts with, right? We like saw the, the side six. We saw Scythe down sick in game one. And then we haven't seen any gauntlet down six to get these early spikes, right? Uh, that neutral light just barely missed space there. We'll okay. see how it plays out here. They're, they're on Apocalypse here for game number five. And winner of this uh, moves on to top three two. Loser of this is out of the tournament. One of these players is going to be going home with a 33rd finish. Side air. Sandstorm has this slight damage lead, but Maid's done such a good job time and time again mitigating the leads that Sandstorm's built. Neutralite puts him off stage. Yeah, uh, Sandstorm doing a great job getting the very tip of the splash damage from that uh, that gauntlet down leg. Ooh, and then the side okay, of the recovery okay. just wants to rip right away. Great read there. We talked about how side of the recovery is not true, uh, and that's why as a gauntlet player, what makes the, the, the great ones separate from the good ones is, is your ability to read your opponent and know when to just let that rip right away and then wait for the dodge. And Sandstorm gets that first stock pre pretty quickly. Watch out for oh, me. Turns it around. It's staying even. He's keeping this close. That's an early stock, too. Like, like Sandstorm was just at the end of orange there for that recovery to knock out on its own. So that was a huge risk that May took going that deep off the side of the stage and a huge off. reward. Yeah. Oh, man. And now he's got the damage lead off the Nairs and Sairs onto Sandstorm. Sticking with these gauntlets for Sandstorm. Neutralite doesn't connect. Maid finds a Neutralite. Oh, the gauntlets. Neutralite comes through to get the side light into recovery right afterwards. May tries to fall down onto the stage to get the end light, and it does not connect, and it's been all Sandstorm's damage so far. And every time May oh. goes for those weapon throws to try and open up Sandstorm, Sandstorm immediately starts the weapon starve, uh, or the weapon denial. And it's been working out so well, but May on the blasters now takes a lead. Got these blasters. Not quite in downlight recovery percentage just yet. Sandstorm oh. throws away the scythe. Gets oh, caught there. The recovery. the recovery. Not quite enough. Apocalypse is ceiling. He still doesn't have it, though. But May doesn't get to the ground fast oh, enough. And Sandstorm snap. finds the Nair. The weapon throw forces it through. D-Light nice. ground pounding. He doesn't drop that one. He's now one stock away from moving on into top 32. But he wants these gauntlets. Maid coming in. We saw him clean up a stock that had way more health than this. Can he do it again? Oh, I made. Waiting for that weapon spawn to come through. There's the Sandstorm tonight. He tried. He didn't get there in time. One side light comes through. Okay. Does the light attack version of it. Mate goes oh. all the way off stage. That down is that away. Up. Dare again. Hasn't touched. The Nair comes Maid through. touches. Oh, and Maid gets weapon the toss. Dare to spike, maybe? Do you like Ground Pound could oh, do it? Oh, the chase touch. I can't believe Sandstorm was able to get that hit so fast. Neutral sync hits, and that's a ton of damage going on to Maid here. Oh. Another Nair to recover. Maid's Maid unarmed. Being a little too hasty here. This could be the two oh, side that past. does it. He's got the blasters in hand. He needs to finish the stock off of Sandstorm. I'm not sure if a side air will do it, but right now he needs to find a hit of any sort on the Sandstorm to get this one back. Oh. He's falling apart. Sandstorm with the gauntlets. The neutral sig, no Doesn't dodge. The Sandstorm go for it. He does. Silent recovery and a two stock to end it there as Sandstorm on the brink of being eliminated brings it back to a game five. And towards that very end of game five, I was like, well, this is the pace that we were expecting to see the whole set. But instead, we got that there at the very end as Maid played a phenomenal game five set against Sandstorm. Look, he played two great games. I asked for three. He was <laughs> so close to doing it. And y'all were acting like he couldn't get one. So I'm just saying. I mean, that's truth, right? Just win yeah, three no, games that's against Sandstorm. <laughs> that's uh, what we have. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see that one. But uh, what I really wanted to point out there was uh, we saw a lot of really great uh, options come out from Maid, but these were practice options. These are options that you really see from any side player, the punish dodges, the ground pawns off the wall, just mm -hmm. like the slight pivots, right? So it looked like Maid was playing his game, he's practicing what he knew he could do best, but it looked like a lot from Sandstorm was going wrong. It looked like we weren't seeing the same aggression, the ruthlessness that we like to see, the options he likes to cover toward till the very end of that game five, right? Even the start of that game five was very even, very close. We we didn't see Sandstorm get more than two or three hits on his uh, Scythe gameplay, but and we saw Maid punishing those spot dodges with the uh, ladder there. But when Sandstorm kicked in at the end, you saw him finally getting those uh, big conversions he was looking for the entire time, and it's, it's Sandstorm. If he's not getting those conversions, he plays those weapons, gauntlets, cannon, Scythe, those weapons where he reads your dodge and he takes you so far. If he can't do that, then you have an opening to take advantage of that. And Maid did that really well throughout the entire set, throughout the game five. Uh, this is, uh, for, the most or, for the most part, how Sandstorm was getting his KOs, it was very hard. I'm surprised we kept going back to Apocalypse. Taza looked at me, and he's just like, Remy, there's no way he goes back here, right? I was shocked to see, <laughs> considering if you have to do 700 damage in ones yeah. to get your 
the game closed off. That's very scary. Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned the, the game plan thing, because I think that uh, beyond it being made like a, a, a very straightforward Scythe game plan, I think it was a straightforward Nyx game plan, where like I think I commented on the fact that I was like, huh, he really is just buffering Nsig after Endlight every yep. single time. And Endlight is a great string starter on yep. Scythe, where you can almost get stocks off of that. We, we, we see those ladder combos all the time, where it's like Endlight, then Nair, and then you stare them again, and you Nair them again, and you take them all the way to the top left. And he never even tried going for that once because of those Nyx habits, I think. Yeah, we don't want to, I don't want to say Maid wasn't doing anything too special with the Scythe, because we did see those opportunities off stage where he'd flip it on Sandstorm, trying to get the edge guard off, especially on the right side. Uh, and the blasters also, the blasters were insane for me. Yeah. We see that carry over from the crossing twos right here. This positioning on Sandstorm from the stage right over the edge guard, covers the wall and gets down the recovery, was very beautiful. Uh, once again, Sandstorm did try to switch that shell, and the blasters from Maid again were just putting a stop to it. That's why I think, even though he barely won that game, he knew, uh, I mean, even though he won this game and then played the next game, he knew he had to get off and go back to the Mordex and go back to what he's more stable with. Uh, and I, like I was saying, the Scythe offstage for Maid, it looked good. It was able to carry Sandstorm off on stage. You, you do notice those habits, the end lights into the end six, and stuff like that. But off stage, it really looked like, okay, I've practiced these interactions. I know how to carry you exactly where I want. And uh, he just did a really good job of it. The blasters were insane. I think I like asked for a bunch of clips of these blasters. Look at these interactions here. <laughs> yeah. The double side light read, just to read the dodge in after that and get the downer. It's just very beautiful work for Maid uh, the entire time. Uh, we're going to get to some Sandstorm clips here when he swapped back to that Mordex, and uh, it was more of his usual stuff. What we're more expecting of him right there, like the side light, and then he gets the GC side light on stage to read the dodge down. So stuff like that is what you expect to see from Sandstorm, and it really wasn't what we were getting till the tail end of this game, like right here again. Instead of going for the straight-up recovery, going for the early KO, he knows that if he goes for the Nair, it's going to give him just enough force to get that side air and send him for the edge guard, and that's what Sandstorm is known for. He goes for those options that you really aren't thinking about, not the obvious stuff, but the creative stuff. Really well done from Sandstorm to close it out. 3-2. Uh, Sheepy, I know you were watching here. You were <laughs> definitely holding your breath here. during some moments of that <laughs> one. Uh, how'd, how'd you feel watching that set? I mean, I mean, let's just take a look at these last few matches, just in general. I mean, the, these names, the three O's, the three ones, Boomy, Godly, Fozy, Jet Bean, Fiend, Cutie. But yeah, that last, if we're talking about that last specific match, Sandstorm versus made on the elimination side to try to get qualified for top 32. I feel like, it, it, wow, that, that was such a great game because you can't deny made, made played so great, okay? Obviously, he's knocked out. It's double elimina elimination. He was on the elimination side. That's the end of Made's journey. He can't join his boy in top 32. I believe, let me double check here. Yeah, experience sitting on the winner side here of top 32, he can't join his boy, but that's okay. You, you gotta give it up to Maid. He played so well against Sandstorm, who, yeah, brought out his Mornix, the OG. Like, you were talking about it, Remy. It's incredible. It's just, what a match, and that was just to qualify for, for top, top 32. 32. Yep. And we still got more. We still got more. We still gotta go through top 32, and I kinda just wanna quickly just kinda state who's in the top 32, just for folks maybe at home following us, following the bracket here. So. Impala is on the winner side of top 32, and I keep telling y'all, don't, don't forget about Impala, because all y'all put him a second place in your prediction. So I'm just gonna keep saying that, but Impala is there, experience, Meg D, uh, Wubs, Luna, Java, Knees, Fiend, we got Golly, we got Boomy, we got some amazing names, Pugsy's in here, Snowy, and we're still filling out the top 32 here, and that was just the winner side, that's just, that, there's going to be some amazing matches y'all about to see at home. As far as on the elimination side, we got Lampy, Jet Beam, Hardy MJ, Sandstorm, Acno, Pierre, Blaze, Wes, I'm Llama, and Clem thus far. Because there's another pool still going on right over there. And so we're trying to fill out the top 32 still. Um, but yeah, I just want to know final thoughts here from you guys before we start jumping into a short break and switching things out. So Duke. Tell me your final thoughts about this. Um, of course, uh, always excited to see uh, LAN action. The competition is always insane. And uh, in particular, I'm just really happy we got to see that final set with Sansa yeah. made. Because like a lot of times we come up here, we tend to stay on the top side of the bracket where you don't get to see some of those sets that happen. They'll happen off screen. And we'll get to hear people be like, oh my god, that one went to game five. But getting to be here, watch it on this big stage, 
absolutely love that. And thank you to the production people who were like, yeah, we should put that up there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the matches that we had so far were like the heavy hitters versus the players that could potentially upset them. And being able to get to that one where the, the disparity in power rankings was actually the widest and then it ended up being the closest was a lot of fun to watch. Beautiful four games today, uh, especially that last game. We've already talked about enough. Game five with made. Mm -hmm. I know Sandstorm's going to be kicking himself to get back on there. Uh, he made it to top 32, which is that stabilization point where you can say, okay, now these people, this is what I practice for. These are the people I was ready to face. I'm not going to get upset here again, right? Uh, maybe Pugsy wasn't ready for it. That's a surprise one for him. But Pugsy's sitting there, top 32, lose, uh, winner side. So Pugsy's feeling good today. And uh, all the names you read out uh, right there, Sheepy, just extraordinary people in the uh, winner side of the bracket. Of course, it's still going to be a hashtag Sandstorm sweep because I have him in my predictions <laughs> and go. I can do no wrong. So we're going to have to see. still get second yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. will get second okay, in well, this tournament. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Well, we do got to take a very, very short break. So when we're back, we're going to see Sack versus Wrench next. Don't go anywhere. We're still heading into top 32 qualifiers. We'll see you guys soon.
Welcome back, everyone, to the singles competition of DreamHack Dallas here. And uh, I got Sparky and Skiff Hello. with me today. Skiff, what's up? How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's my first DreamHack, right? Woo! So, I mean, and it's always a great time coming out here, hanging out with the Brawlhalla fam. Uh, it's always good vibes. And I, that's just something I absolutely love. But DreamHack has been really incredible. Like, I've always seen it always online and stuff like that. But, like, actually being here it is a much different environment. It's fun. It's yes. loud. We love it. The crowds and everything. And you can just go up and just watch some games. Great games happening over there by the oh, yeah. pool station, too. So it's fantastic. Okay, well, let me tell you guys about the next match coming up because I'm going to want to hear your thoughts. So this next match coming up, it's still top 32 qualifiers. We're not quite there yet, okay? We got Sack versus Wrench. Sparky, I'm going to start with you. What are your thoughts on this next upcoming match? I ain't seen Wrench in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't seen a wrench in a. I mean, like physically, I've, I've seen him here a, a couple times. So, uh, I, I mean, in tournament, in bracket, getting deep enough into the bracket to where we really get to commentate him on streams. So this is going to be an interesting one. We do see the Lucian over here for his one of the most uh, uh, reported characters that he has. Of course, Katars not really in the same spot they were several months ago, which is why people are moving away from a Surrey. Sack might end up playing a Surrey, but we're in a different Katar meta than we kind of were during the Asuri heyday just a few months ago. Then that kind of changed over to Lucian. Yep. And even people have started to take that step back from Lucian as well, kind of move on to other people. So we'll see how Wrenched has adapted to current meta. Meanwhile, on the other side, Sack. I mean, Sack proved himself so hard. There you see Wrenched on the screen in front of you. Sack proved himself at, uh, I believe it was the Winter Royale. He seemed like essentially quote-unquote the like South American alternate because he wasn't Wes, he wasn't Fiend, he wasn't Kaina. And then all of a sudden, Sack, just like Lores did, just like we've seen a handful of other players do, is they really showed up and surprised everyone and really had breakout performances that we hadn't seen from them just yet. Mm -hmm. And that's just one of the, the more amazing things about coming back to these LAN events too, right? Obviously, when you play onlineers, sometimes a little bit of difference in how things play out, way you, uh, you react to things, but being here in a LAN, sometimes it's really the biggest proving ground in general. Because it's not just playing in your living room, it's playing in front of a crowd full of people. How do you handle the energy? Knowing that there's plenty of people in the crowd right now watching you slip up in any moment. Some people are just cold-blooded and do not fear and do not reel back from those moments. Well, it's going to be incredible to see what Wrench can do today and if he can Go, you know, rise up to the challenge of yep. playing, you know, in LAN again. He's done it before. That's yes. the thing. He's done it before. He's right? won LAN before. Yes, he's done it before. So we'll see. But guys, the game is ready. So you know what? Skiff, Sparky, take it away. So okay. I'm looking at some recent placements here from Wrenched. He was in the Spring Championship, but he was just inside of top 32, right at that 25th place. And if you rewind just a little bit back to the Winter Championship before that, he was right outside of top 32, coming in in that 33rd place. And other than that, we don't really see him playing in too many official tournaments. So today, Wrenched is going to be a big question mark. Compare that to Sack, who got 13th at yeah. San Diego. He was top 16 there. South American Spring Championship, he got 5th. So he's top Six. And we are seeing the Lucian coming in from Wrench, but we are not seeing that Asuri that we saw on the uh, little character uh, stat screen coming in from Zack, it's the Mordex. Yeah, I mean, Mordex, we've been seeing a lot of Mordex this weekend in general as it is. The Scythe is definitely such a crucial weapon for so many different game plan styles. I mean, being able to control your opponent and move them around the stage is so crucial to really making things pop. It's such like a modern mechanic in Brawlhalla that we've seen that continue to other legends as yes. well. Scythe was like the first thing that did that. And then all of a sudden we see it in like other legends, signatures and everything like that. Yep. So it's a super valuable tool to be able to Control your opponent. Mm -hmm. And as we see Wrench here trying to make this Lucian work, and that's just one thing, like, it's like certified, I've been here since the beginning, is like anybody who plays Lucian. Yep. I remember when the game came out, I was like, this guy's really sick. <laughs> he's fast. He's fast. He's and because fast. he's fast, he feels good, yes. baby. And Wrench, he's got to be feeling good so far. Already picked up the first KO. If we're looking at just like raw recent PR, Wrench coming in PR 36 in North America yep. compared to Sacks. Four in South America. So wrenched already out of the gate, really strong so far. Seems like he's been practicing. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what you need to do in these types of games. You need to set the tempo, set the pace. But as we can see right here, Sack evening things up. Not immediately, but they are actually incredibly even here. Of course, the Scythe comes into play, gives Sack a little bit of a lead. Ah, missing that second grab attempt, unfortunate. Ooh, Sack doing a great job. Weapon starving here. Wrench has been at the weapon disadvantage for probably at least 15 seconds. Another one comes in, he jumps over, and there you go. Active input, turn 
turned him around, made sure that Sack was then closer to that weapon spawn that he can pick up. I love to see a player focusing on weapon starving. I think that's so important. It really limits everything your opponent has. 100%. Oh my goodness. Listen, you might lose the first stock, but he's able to take two in a row here. I thought Wrench really set the tempo, but honestly, I feel like he just kind of pushed Zack against the wall, and he's like, all right, fine, I'll play. I think we might be, I, I, I may be calling this a little bit too early here, but I think the fact that like Wrench got first stock, I was like, okay, this is game one. That can be how game one tends to go. And look at all this unanswered damage that Zack yeah. is putting out. But like game Game one is usually like the best chance for the other player to like surprise you. Right. And then you get that wake up call and you're like, oh yeah, let me turn this into a 3-1 real quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, that's like we were talking about earlier. Sometimes at land events, right, you pick up a different kind of energy. And if you know what your opponent is trying to do, you can make those adaptations immediately. And it seems like Zach continues to do that right now as we see getting into the ready here for Wrench. But a great little blasters combo. Put some off stage. Can you find a way to close this out? Ah, unfortunately, he's not going to get that. Now you notice that even though Wrench is very much a Qatar player at heart, he he swapped off of the Katars and back onto the Blasters for that reason right there, so he would have a consistent KO combo. That yes. is something that Katars lack. And now it's time for the damage build phase, so he's going to go back over to the Katars, back to that familiar weapon. Ooh. That's one of the reasons Lucian is such a strong character, is because he does have confirmed KO options on the Blasters and strong signatures across the board. Yep. I mean, that's the thing that's always been important. As long as you know how to move with a character, you got a character that's quick, you always have some of an advantage. It may not be a clear advantage, but being able to move in this game and many others is so crucial to really making an impact. But we see Sack here with the gauntlets in hand. Goes for a big sick, not going to get the connection they wanted, but still just throwing it out there just to put it into Wrench's head. Like, hey, I'm ready for you. You better not mess up. And Sack is at that point in the game. Okay, I was about to say we hadn't seen really too much uh, Qatar stringing coming out from Wrench, except now all of a sudden and right at the end, he's finding the connections. He found the signature, and just like that, the clutch moment, Sack barely squeaks that one out. Man, beautifully played there, too. And again, it's one of those scenarios you get right down to the nitty-gritty of things, and you're just kind of like, all right, this is getting a little bit scary here, but I know what I'm about. I know what I can do. I just got to wait for them to mess up. And it was just one small mistake, yep. and that's literally all it took to cost you the game. However, this is a we're on best of five territory, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, you got plenty of time to look at that game, assess the situation, Three, and figure out what's two, going on. As one, we get into game four. two here, let's get it rocking. So Wrench coming in here, now Now I'm feeling better about Wrench Katars now that I saw that last string towards the end. I thought it was going to slip away from him. He was going to get that first stock and it was going to be like, Wrench is back, baby, oh yeah. And then all of a sudden, Sack was going to figure everything out and we were just going to see him go off. But that ending moment from Wrench was so solid. Even though Sack took the game, that ending moment, that Qatar burst yes. that you can't really do on too many other weapons than Qatar's and like that's a wrench classic baby and he's doing it right here this is what I wanted to see at the beginning of the game that he brought in the end he's continuing it to this game as well what a lead for wrenched here just in the orange my goodness you know we even talked about the blasters last game to be able to close things out and you said the Qatar's are the damage builder but that was from start to finish just Qatar goodness and that's why Lucian really had it. I mean, he still has his place in the meta, but that's why you saw so many people move on to Lucian in the past couple months. Like, Luna was part of the trendsetter for that, but you could really show that because of the strong signature kit, you can still easily get knockouts with Katars. You're not just sitting there fishing for recoveries or hoping to pick up a D-Light and get a dodge read or anything like that. You can use the incredible signature kit that he has on both weapons. Yes, exactly. But right now, we're going to see Zach respond in kind. Did take a little bit of extra damage here, so not quite the same way of evening things up like we saw from last game. But still, now he's going to take a strong little lead, or maybe not as strong as possibly could have been, but still, putting on that pressure immediately. The Scythe is just such a crazy weapon, man. I swear, just being able to move your opponent is just, it's insane. Like, that's that's yeah. so crazy. It is a very strong tool. I mean, that's why in the in the Sandstorm Maid match that we yep. just saw, like, Maid was playing Scythe as well. It wasn't just the Scythe coming out from Sandstorm. Like, the guy who basically made Scythe famous, made it iconic, made it the weapon that it is today. Wrenched here, continuing this huge lead. I think he's actually even earlier in his second stock than he was on the first stock when he took the one from Sack. So Wrenched is in such a great spot here. We might see a 
much earlier trip down to the elimination bracket from Sack than I would have expected. But of course, we're only in game two here, and you can see the yeah. equalizers coming out from Sack have been pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, and this is the thing with Sack right now. Like we have already seen that they know how to take two stocks in a row. They don't need to continue this pattern. But we have seen a pattern in this game. It's I lose a stock, I take a stock back. You can't do that anymore. We're at one stock apiece here. So we're gonna see if Wrench can find a way to clutch this one out, which would be absolutely huge. But Sack looking for that way to open up. Oh no, the Qatar combos. Okay, the air dodge getting themselves out of there. Gauntlet's really coming alive for Sack here towards the end of this game. We didn't see too much Gauntlet gameplay so far. Maybe he was saving it for this one so he could go up 2-0 over wrenched here. He definitely has the damage lead. That's a nice ground pound. That's a classic wrench ground pound on the oh, edge. No. Oh no, the D-Light oh. ground pound. And Sack turns it around and steals the game from him yet again, Skiff. Uh, it comes down to another situation of one small yep. miss input. Brutal. And Sack just absolutely takes the game. You, oh, that's such a bad feeling. Now happening twice in a row. How does Wrench sit here and kind of collect their thoughts, you know, get their momentum back and say, all right, look, obviously I am trying to push the pedal to the metal a little too early here. I need to dial this back just a little bit. Let those guitars rock a little bit more, build up that damage continuously, and then put them in a position where you can sneeze on them and just take the stock away. But if I'm on the other side and I'm sack and I'm seeing what my gauntlets did a lot of that game, I'm thinking he picks up those gauntlets and he lets those things ring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to throw a couple haymakers and your opponent just knows uh, who's boss. But as we get into this next game, looks like we're going to be swapping over to the Asuri here. So that means we're going to be getting rid of those blasters, right? But that sword coming into play, probably controlling a little bit more space, especially when that scythe is out. You're able to kind of trade a little bit more. So Three, I love what we're seeing two, here in, one, in terms of legend whoa. picks because like Lucian, a very old legend in yes. the game. Asuri, also a pretty old legend in the game as well. Even at this point, Mordex is considered an old legend as well. But you still see people picking Asuri. You still see people picking Lucian. You still see people picking Mordex. So even though they aren't the newest and hottest legend like Thea who has all the tools under the sun, mm -hmm. they're still extremely competitive legends. And that's one of the things I really love about this game. Yeah. Okay, there we go. We got that scythe weapon toss, though. And again, keeping Wrench weapon starved. Ooh, oh, nice my dunk. goodness. And this is part of the problem. When you go with a character switch on your potential final game, you have to build up the momentum so quickly, right? You have to warm yourself up. Your opponent's been playing the same character. They know, they know what they need to do. We're seeing those gauntlets do that work from Sack that we expected uh, after last game. One more hit, and Wrench oh. is going to be in orange. He's able to get back over to the weapon. He has the guitars. That's the one he's going to be looking for. D-Light, he dares, but the spot dodge came out from Sack. Neutral Air sends Wrench over to the edge. He expected Sack to like come in with the ground pound. He was hoping to find priority with the GC Insig, but Sack just stayed over on that corner. He knows he's in such a strong lead right now. No major risk need to come out, and Sack could take this game. Oh, there we go. He just got a great combo off the edge there, but just was not able to finish. And man, Dude, Sack has been hitting that nonstop and just barely missing the conversion to put him off stage. And it's really terrifying because he's like three for three in the past minute of landing that. But we get another stock closed out. And unfortunately, this might be the end for Wrench unless he's got a little bit of gas left in the tank here. Uh, you better start going, man, because this is his game over for you. Now, keep in mind, this is an elimination quarterfinals match in pools, making it in the top 32. So if Wrench loses this game, He's out of the tournament. We only get to see Wrenched one time today. And that just shows how far the professional Brahala scene has come. The fact that, like, Someone like Wrench, we don't get to see yeah. a lot of them because everyone else is so good. Yeah, I mean, I know just in the past year alone, we've seen a lot of people like, you know, 65 PR, 40 something, whatever, and they're all like coming out and playing yep. incredibly well. So, like, even though the numbers are quite different, <laughs> there is not as big of a skill gap as you might think. Look at Sack go. Oh. Now this game's like, I feel like it's probably been about 70% gauntlets, maybe even a little bit more. Now he's swapping over to the Scythe. We saw him use the neutral signature as a closer earlier. See how he wants to finish this one out. There's the neutral signature yet again. One of the most favorable on the Scythe kit. Yeah, but here we go. We talked about these gauntlets just a little while ago, these things be thinging, and they're about to finish this set in a swift 3-0 here, unless Wrench can really dig deep. The Qatars are not getting any of the hits that he needs to really get started. Wait, here we go. Okay. 
Ooh, that was a classic rich ground pound as well. He gets side aired into the wall. Unfortunately, that will be the end of the road for Wrench. You're seeing that beautiful bouquet of flowers as a, as a nice parting gift from Sack, who will be moving on into the top 32. But even seeing Sack down here this early in pools is a little bit surprising. I want to check back at the bracket to see it was actually Snowy who sent him down. First, Sack went 3-0 over Hain. Shouts to Hain.gg. Then he went up against Snowy ended up getting 3-0'd after Snowy 3-1 made. So Snowy on a little bit of a run today. That sent Sack down, who ran into Wrench. And unfortunately for Wrench, that is the end of his singles trip here at DreamHack Dallas. But it's always good to see the old heads coming through. That's one of my mm -hmm. favorite things about Brawlhalla Skiff, is you look at the brackets of today, and you see all the new players. You see the Megdees, the Radishes, the Lunas, the Loreses. But then in the audience, you see the Atrophiuses. Yep. You see Wrenched in the bracket. You see Cody and Faison making top four and dang old 2v2s yesterday. So the old guys are still here. Yep. The new guys are alive and kicking. I love the journey that Brawlhalla has gone through to get to this point. I mean, there's one thing that's consistent in a lot of these games, right? With the old heads, they always have that super solid neutral, great consistency across the board. It's just, will they perform in the bracket? The real question you got to ask is, did they get enough sleep last night? Are they exercising <laughs> regularly? What did they have for breakfast, right? And maybe Wrench did do all those things really well, but unfortunately, yes, the young blood coming through here. And honestly, this is one of those things, man. These younger players, they just keep reacting faster, executing a lot cleaner. And it's it's just, it's part of life, man. <laughs> you can see it in the numbers right there, 362 on the gauntlet damage coming out. And speaking of good numbers, this segue is not working. Merchandise table, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we do have Brahalla merch that you can purchase here but also online as well. Keep in mind, if you purchase the merch here, it will be shipped to you, and that is free shipping. Ladies and gentlemen, all my EU kids out there, you better get on over there so that you can take advantage of that free shipping. You can see all of the clothing items in front of you. Of course, those blue pants, those are shorts, but they also have the black joggers as well. They have merch with the new logo. They have merch with the old logo as well. They even have pins that you can pick up as well. I, I think they, they, they give you a pin if you, if you buy a thing. I could be I could be lying, but I don't think I am. I, I I'm right. Like, yeah, cool. Okay. We nailed it first try. But also they have the jersey that you can put your name on the back of. The jersey looks so nice too. And they have the Brawlhalla Dallas shirt that says Brawlhalla. It says Dallas. It has the two stars for the Texas theme, and of course it has a beautiful picture of the Dallas skyline in the background. So you can actually grab a piece of clothing for this specific event, just like we have the Winter Championship exactly. merch just like we have the Spring Championship merch. There it is, the beautiful shot of the Dallas Skyline. Oh, wait, no, that's the Brawlhalla shirt. Man, it's so lifelike. Oh, I thought I, was, goodness. thought I was staring at a beautiful view of I Dallas, we, Texas. I thought it was just a nice sunset, just putting that little contrast in yeah. all the buildings with the black outline. Unfortunately, reality, it comes back to us, and, and it's just not as real as we thought, you know? Now you can stare at the Dallas skyline without having to actually go outside yeah, in the blistering heat of Texas. Oh my that goodness. is the real benefit of picking that up. Make sure to go to brahalla.com forward slash new merch to pick that one up. I believe some of those things will be gone Friday, so don't miss it. I mean, I'm going to get one of those jerseys for sure. I mean, the, the coloring's just it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Also, shout-outs to Toast, man, putting in the work on the camera over there. My goodness, look at him flip-flopping around hey, all over the place. Hey, Toast. <laughs> look at that. That's a million-dollar smile if I've ever seen one. Now, we are <laughs> going to be moving on to our next set here. We have Hughes versus Cody Travis. Now, Cody Travis is just coming. There's Toast. Turn it wrong way. Come on, dude. How many years have you done this? <laughs> Give us a wave, Toast. Oh, man. Wave to the crowd. That's right. There he yeah, is. Everything you love to see on the screen, sometimes it goes through that. Man, yep, hiding from the camera. That's that's why he does what his job. He doesn't want to be in front of the camera anymore. He's camera shy. One Most day, one day we'll get him up there to do commentary like, like so the old days. Yeah, he's so beautiful. Look at him. <laughs> but either way, yes, we're going to be getting into use versus Cody Travis. Now, use has been making some big plays, right? Absolutely unstoppable. <laughs> and I, it's just, it's a different, it's a different story when you you see him actually play at his full. Wait, oh, okay. I was gonna say, is Cody Travis gone? But there he is. But Cody Travis, man, this guy has been playing Barraza for so long. This blasters straight up. <laughs> one just, one day he'll he'll play like a, a modern legend. <laughs> I want him to do it so bad. Cody is like one of the few people that like 
gets one of those passes. Like, Pugsy gets the pass to play three defense legends in 2v2. Yeah. No one else should ever do that, but Pugsy gets that pass. Cody gets the really old legend pass who still yes. chooses Axe in 1v1s, which is something not a lot of players are doing. Cody is a very special breed of player. Now, he is coming off of a victory, a 3-1 victory against Zyder that I got to watch over on these setups earlier today. So he's got to be feeling pretty good off of that. And Yuse is coming off of a 3-0 victory against the one Hunter. So this will be a top 32 qualifier match on the winner's side, Skiff. You know how crazy it is that we're seeing a top 32 qualifier match with this caliber of talent? Yep. Wild. It's so crazy. And that's one of the things I really love about the Brawlhalla lands. You know, there might not be a lot of them, but when they do happen, they are so important. You get like almost the whole community out here playing their hearts out. But we're going to get right into this game. Let's see how this all plays out here. We got Yuz taking on Cody Travis. Let's see how it all breaks down. Now, part of the reason that these two players who are like Titans in their own right are going up against one another this early in the bracket is because Yuz, of course, is seeded very highly as he's yes. a regular top placer in South America. But Cody is, you know, seeded relatively low, especially for a player of this caliber, because, you know, he hasn't been performing Three, right. that much two, lately. I don't, one, I don't know if he has like a renewed focus on the game or whether he's just like weird this weekend the, the 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 behavior from Cody Travis is is always shocking to me and i think based on what Faison was saying about him not even like knowing they were in top 4 when they were in top 4 <laughs> Cody could win the entire tournament this weekend that is just like that is somehow weird champion behavior i mean it's got like mental that's what it is it doesn't matter where you're at in bracket if you don't look at bracket and you just keep playing the way you want to play like you you're just not going to get as tilted as other people people get really nervous when they find out where they're at bracket sometimes but right now Cody, does he get oh geez. he does not there is no way he gets the turnaround and Cody doesn't I saw him do that to Zyder a few times as well and just yoink these stocks away that have no business going in his favor but that is the steel trap that is Cody Travis's mind 17th place at the spring championship yep. and here he got first stock against Hughes and he already sent Cider pack into the elimination bracket and it's crazy to think about too because I mean <laughs> we've seen it a couple times already in just the two sets we've seen that people are going for these edge guards a little too aggressively and we're getting huge reversals out of that we do see Hughes Find a way to even things up here. Rocket Lance in hand. But Cody now with the blasters. Let's see what we can get popping here. Oh. So I'm wondering if Yuse is going to be focusing on edge guards after he just kind of got clapped on that last one. One thing that Vector does have now is the new down signature. You can just stay away from the edge and throw that out, and it doesn't actually move you forward like it used to. So you can just stay away from the edge guards. You don't even have to focus on it. And if I'm Yuse, you know, maybe I try a couple more times, but if they don't go your way, I think you completely just stay away. Play safe on the stage. Don't even risk going against Cody off stage. Exactly. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a strong stage presence. If your opponent's off stage, but you know how to keep them from coming back, it doesn't matter if they touch the oh, wall. Oh, the bottom side of that. Disarmed use as well. That's the animation that you saw coming yep. out. Cody's going to have his choice of weapon swapping back over to the blasters, throwing away that axe that's going to deny the weapon spawn from use. He actually kind of backed up. I think he expected Cody to immediately push onto him, but he didn't. Still picks up the weapon anyway. He's looking for the KO. He's starting with those side lights rather than the down light oh. into the recovery that would be the true KO combo. Nice! He gravity cancels the down sig and catches Cody jumping. And that's crazy because Cody was doing such an amazing job from that mid-range too with the blaster. Just constantly to step back a little bit, gets a couple hits, and just allows him, uh, I mean, you to just chase him down a little bit, just kiting him across the stage. And it just took one opening for you to take that stock, even things up here. However, the damage is a lot different right now. We got two different colors of mac and cheese that popping off here, but one of them has got to take a little more damage. Huh? Yeah, we got we got cheddar and we got craft singles, and now uh, what's a I don't, what's a red cheese? Uh, it's the outside of those little baby bells, the oh, like, wax coating yeah, on the outside that, of the baby bells. That are like the monster monster cheese has a weird like, yeah, around kinda, too. yeah, yeah, that, the kind of amberish color on the outside. Uh, I'm hungry. Yeah. But here we go. We're we gonna need get more cheese. <laughs> well, depending on who you ask, I mean, <laughs> there is a, might yeah, be there is a lance on the stage. I know, uh, I know, Twitch chat's probably saying we got enough cheese, man. We don't need any more cheese. You know, but there's some not cheese right here. Oh wait, okay, I was about to say he's unarmed. I mean, it's kind of hard to cheese an opponent when you don't got a weapon in hand. But man, that was a oh, I tried it again. Oh! He tried it again, and Cody was not caught slipping that time. There's the sideline, of course. The recovery is not going to be a true KO option. That's why you saw that GCD sit come out, and Cody squeaks it out, taking game one with an axe side air. 
That's crazy, man. This is definitely looking a little bit rough here. It's, I mean, it got down to the wire, but sometimes that first game is really what sets the tone on the mental. Dude's and having some popcorn. Dude, that's a lot of popcorn. I've been smelling that popcorn all weekend. I think that's a refill on the popcorn that they got yesterday. Yup. Oh, yep. <laughs> Look, you got other people admiring his popcorn behavior, too. That's probably the biggest ad for popcorn. Whoa, we're going to see that whoa. line grow all of a sudden as people are like, yo, you know, that popcorn is sounding good. I mean, you smell the popcorn throughout the whole venue. Like, it's That's always true. on your mind. That's true. It's always on your mind. But as we get into game two here, back to Apocalypse. Is this, the, this is the only... No, no, no. We, we did see uh, Small Brawl Haven earlier, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. We did right at the end of the wrenched and uh, sack game. Now, if we're looking at the damage numbers of last game, Yu's put out 629 damage. Cody only put out 406, but was still able to take the game. And that mm -hmm. is because of that edge guard early on. He didn't have to put out a lot of damage. Yep. He was able to get that in orange. So great KO efficiency from Cody. Yes, absolutely. And that's always huge. I mean, if you're able to do less damage, but make them count when you get your hits, that's always a big sign here. But he's going to get that axe in hand. Ah, tried to go for a bit of a reversal, but going to get caught up by use in the process with that bow in hand. There's there the go. D Sig. He doesn't GC it this time, just does it straight on the ground. That way he doesn't burn a do the dodge or anything. Let's see. Yuzu's in a really good spot here, just barely in the orange. He has weapon advantage. D light into N light into the neutral air, still holding on to weapon advantage. Sticks with the lance, of course, for the damage build. He's doing a great job. Ah, yeah, he was doing a great job. Obviously, you can't always stay on top of your opponent to keep him weapon starved, but Cody is also, you know, he's, he sees a weapon, he's going to get one eventually. And of course, it ends up being the black. Blasters here. Again, oh, big damage, sending him way off stage. What's the play from Muse? Oh, he had him traced down, too. Just had to retreat back to stage to ensure that, you know, he keeps his resources alive. Oh, man, that's the second D-Light ground pound we've seen drop. The first one was wrenched. Now it was Cody. Now, one thing wow. that is a little bit interesting that Muse did in the moment was he picked up a new weapon, and it was, of course, Lance. And he threw that away. Cody wasn't really anywhere near it, so I'm not sure why he threw it away, because he picked up his old Lance that had more damage on it, so he risked getting disarmed. It didn't really bite him in the butt or anything because he was so damaged on that stock that he ended up getting knocked out regardless. Yep. Here we go. Okay. Wow, the second one not going to do that. And he is deep in the red there, too. As red as the X is he swinging. Can you find a way to close this out? <laughs> you let him back on stage again. Still not dropping the stock. <laughs> what will it take to show that this man is indeed mortal? Any, yeah, that any, like, Somewhat normal KO move like a Lance in light is going to be doing it there. Cody holding on to that stock for a really long time. He still is behind, though, but the defense of Barraza has definitely been keeping him alive oh, yeah. a lot longer than many other legends if he chose them. Yep. And sometimes, you know, the best offense is a good defense, that's for sure. As long as you're able to return back to stage, you're able to tack on some more damage. But Cody, man, you got to find this damage quick because Yuz is oh, just man. keeping you out. Weapon Toss does make contact, out comes the neutral signature, and that is enough to do it! I didn't think that would have the juice on it! That was actually kind of insane, too. I mean, you just continued the bullium, not only pushing him off the stage, right? Across the stage, then off the stage. He just kept it going. Honestly, beautiful stuff from Muse from start to finish here. Definitely looked like a much more dominant game instead of, uh, you know, last time where Cody kind of got the upper hand once or twice. So we'll definitely see if Muse is able to keep this momentum going. As you can see right there, 604 damage once again, sitting at 600 mark. So, again, that, d that Three, defense is two, definitely coming into play. One, and you see that with Yuzu's defense stance as well. Both of these players are highly valuing defense. It is a very strong stat that, like, if you can have a lot of it, I mean, one of the reasons that Wes was playing Roland was because of defense. So a lot of players really highly value that. Yuzu here as well, of course, Cody Travis as well. Yuzu starting off with the Lance here. That's really been his weapon of choice. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see here. Big axe combo, there we go, putting him off stage. And now Yu is going to be able to answer back. Trying to get something started for himself, but Cody finds a way to the platform. Just continues to bully back and forth here, but Yu is now in a very dominant position. Okay, there we go. Nice. The juggle game working well. Cody is going to be disarmed here, so Yu does have the weapon advantage. Weapon spawn comes in, it's favoring Yu, and he grabs it. Instant bow, neutral air, tries to follow up with the recovery. Barely misses, but does get the weapon toss. Tries to go for that one again. Oh. Cody 
That's gonna do it, and that means Cody is going to spawn back in. His next weapon will be the axe, and since we're, I mean, we're kind of in between the damage build phase and the knockout phase, so I don't think it's the worst thing in the world that he's coming in with an axe here. Maybe if Yuse was like in the white or the yellow, he might yeah. hope for the blasters, but still, a few stray axe hits, and it's gonna be time to find that axe there. 100%. And I also just want to point out that that is probably the funniest animation in this entire game, is with the bow, is you literally turn your opponent into the arrow. Yep. It makes me laugh every time I see it. It just looks so silly. <laughs> Cody yet again at the weapon disadvantage does pick up the blasters pretty quickly. Gravity cancels the D-Light, doesn't quite have the range, but doesn't get punished. Yep. Neutral air, a little bit of juggling coming out. He's still looking for him. Yuse is playing the range game here, and he's doing such a good job because he's outside of Cody's effective range until he's ready to attack, and then he's inside of it. There we go, and he finally lands a hit, and still not going to be able to take that stock. It's oh. huge. Oh, wow, he just is not able to convert once again, giving Yuse, like, pretty much a third chance at life here. Oh, this is, this is so crazy. That's a lot of extra credit on the damage already here. And look at Yuse's movement, just staying elusive. Now, over in that edge guard that happened on the right side, Cody threw out that, ooh, exclamation point's coming out. Yuse's got to be careful. Ah, that had to have been a misinput from Cody. There's no way he didn't try to do that to the left side. But the D-Light that came out from, oh, the recovery takes off the top. The D-Light that came out from Cody on the right side, Yuse's timing to get around that was impeccable. But he forgot that, like, it's blasters, baby. That D-Light comes out and it whiffs. Get ready for an end light to come out. And that's what Cody was hoping for. That Yuse would come around to punish. Cody picks up the end light. Exclamation point for Cody this time. He's able to get around and flip the positions up. Neutral Sig comes out, gets punished with a lance side air. That's the KO. Use in a great spot here. Yeah, I mean, we did see them drop that first game. Obviously, Cody had a great stock to start things off. And taking that game, too, I mean, that's definitely huge. But Use reminding all of us why they are number two in South America here, really taking it to Cody. And, I mean, game two was great. Now, game three looking even better. And, again, this axe is kind of what you brought before. Maybe the blasters is what you really want here, but you got to make this work now. Axe recovery. Oh, he even gets the kind of weak hit of the exhausted axe recovery because that's so many active frames. Yep. Oh, whoa, that was a huge read right there, being able to close out that stock. All right, good reversal, keeping him off stage. Now the blaster's in hand. This is what oh, I Cody the wanted earlier. I thought the D-Light was going to come out there and take away Yuse's second stock. He didn't feel safe enough to throw it out. I don't blame him, especially with how red he is at this point. It's not going to take too much more. There's the D-Sig that does take Yuse off the top, and he's going to be spawning in fresh. Cody swaps back over to the Axe. A little bit of an interesting choice here. Maybe he just wants that chunking mental damage. Yeah. Oh, I mean, charge that one up. Sometimes you just need only a few hits to really start racking things up here. Maybe that's what he's all he's about doing right it. now. Because maybe the combos we have been seeing, I feel like Cody's been dropping some of these combos. So, hey, I'd rather get my onesies, twosies, reset neutral, and just do it over and over again. Sidelight Nair, that's your onesies, twosies. If you're looking at an Axe player, that's what they're looking for. The Sidelight Nair. GC in light from Hughes is going to take out Cody Travis. Cody was really far behind, but still, Hughes was about halfway through his final stock. So there was a lead, but it wasn't nearly as big as the lead that Hughes had earlier on in the set. Yeah. All right, well, let's see what happens in game four here. Again, Cody taking that game one, looking pretty strong, too. And honestly, I think a lot of it had to do with Yuse being a bit too aggressive at first, and Cody with some strong Three, punishes. Two, and I think Yuse has kind of taken note of that. Goes, all right, listen, I'm going to get my strong hits, right? But I obviously cannot push this further than what's really comfortable. Uh, as soon as I start gaming unsafe, obviously, Cody's going to take advantage of it. Now, one thing that does worry me a little bit about Yuse, of course, he is up in the set, so take what I say with a grain of salt. But yeah. if you happen to notice, on the actual stage here, there were two numbers next to each of the players actually in person on screens. So that is going to be the cumulative damage that they have done. Yep. So Yuse did 689 damage. Cody only did 518. But Yuse is having to do 689 damage, Skiff. That's basically 230 per stock before yep. he finds the KO. That's a little bit inefficient. I mean, every game has been over 600. Yep. That's, so that's like over 1,800 damage here already in game three. That's insane to think about. But that is part of Barraza, that heavy defense. That's that's just, it's a Barraza classic and it's a Cody classic as well. That is how much damage that Cody is making you do before he finally gives up that stock. Yes. Ooh. Nice, but it's going to bounce off the stage, take away some of that momentum, take away some of the force on it so it doesn't immediately lead to a KO. Yeah, but here we go. The blaster's coming into play here, and Cody's very good. Side covering a lot of space. It's 
battle of the side airs right now. They're both really <laughs> hunting for him. Use is going to find the sidelight side air after the signature that came out from Cody. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine Cody's feeling the pressure a little bit here because they're now facing elimination from the winner's side. Nice Ooh. dare. Oh, oh wow. beautiful D-Light coming out from Yuz. He has to be careful. Last time we did an edge guard, <laughs> we know how it went. So Yuz, you got your damage. You did some mental damage to Cody as well. He's feeling good. Yeah. But I do like the fact that, like, after a couple games, he's like, all right, cool. I'm going to let this rip again and see if yeah. it works. And while they did do it, there wasn't a big punish that time. So maybe you're a little bit more comfortable. Maybe Cody's feeling more nervous because of what the game count is. But we'll see what happens as we go forward. Right now, okay, gets the boat in hand, and we're going to have a bit of a mid-range battle here. Nice little falling side air coming out from Yuz. There's the dare from Cody. Hoping to catch Yuz above him with the neutral air. Yuz is just a little bit too high. Dodge circle's coming out. Neither one making huge commitments at this moment until Yuz picks up that lance. You can see how much he favors that weapon with how confidently he plays it into Cody. Yeah. Oh man, these guys are trading big hits back and forth here. Cody trying to find a way to take some oh. sort of oh, oh. No. Wow, I'm actually kind of surprised Yuz slipped out of that, but that's kind of been a constant thing for Cody here. It's just not being able to finish his food. Neutral air is juggling Cody. There's oh. the side air that takes away the second stock. Again, Yuz about halfway through this second. Cody on his final. Lights are starting to get a little bit dim for Cody Travis here as we get further into game four. Use up 2-1, hoping for the quick victory to send Big Bite Cody Travis down to the elimination bracket. Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay, I like that. Great option to be able to get back on the stage here. Gonna get sent off quite a bit of a ways. Can you get back with your footing? Whoa! Oh, oh, oh dude, my the, God. the just near whiffs from <laughs> both of these players. Cody is hunting for that Axe Cider so he can find the KO to get that stock from Yuz. He hits the Axe Neutral Light, but it's not enough. It was all the way from the wrong side of the stage. Mm -hmm. And then Yuz hits the side light into the down air. The string potential from Yuz's Lance. Oh, that's huge. Sending him way off stage here. He has so much control. Not a lot of resources. What, what are you doing? What yeah, just? Right. Okay. You know, I guess we'll take that, but <laughs> that was certainly a strange interaction. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know what happened there. And you, oh, Sack just came up to get his badge. I thought he was, I thought he was going to congratulate his friend. But no, he's like, oh, actually, my, 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 my badge is up there. That is Yuz and Cody Travis shaking hands. Cody shaking his head. He's going to be going down into the elimination bracket. And honestly, this is one of my favorite things just about competitive games in general. It's just two players who recognize how good they are, how good their opponent is, and there's nothing but good vibes, good sportsmanship between the two of them. I really appreciate that type of stuff. But let's take a look at some of these replays with how well Hughes was able to control so much space here, really keeping Cody Travis on his tippy toes on every single part of the stage or off stage as well. Now, we did see three signatures come out from use that game, and he hit one of them. It was that neutral signature towards the end that almost led to the KO, but didn't quite do it. So that's pretty decent. 33% is not bad, because I don't think he was too terribly punished for the other few that he threw out. Yep. Yeah. Oh, dude, some of these whiffs, too, at the very end, that last game on these actions. Cody just barely missing, shaving off the robot hairs off Vector. Like, that's... Uh, do, can, can robots grow hair in this? You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> you are asking oh, the yeah. wrong guy, I brother. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of wrong questions I've asked you. Not just robots <laughs> growing hair, but just you <laughs> growing hair. <laughs> but you can see right there, you can see how heavily Yuz favors the Lance. Only 67 damage yep. on the bow, 23 damage on the unarmed kit, but 504. Oh. And we're seeing a lot better damage efficiency that game coming yes. out from use what is the total damage done 595 so we got under 600 by five <laughs> hey <laughs> it is if under you're 600. under you're under yeah, that is true that is true you win by an inch or a mile you still want that is true that is fair but uh i mean would you rather win by an inch or a mile i would i don't care uh, a w is a w yeah in the book of sparky i mean an inch because then like they can see you beat them <laughs> And really close, too. Yeah. And especially if you know you're still going to win, you look back at them, give them yeah, a wink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like when you're when you're at the end of, like, those Olympic races, and then the people, like, do that, like, duck forward right at the uh. end. It's just, like, run faster. Yeah, I know. Right? Have you ever thought about just running a little bit faster, <laughs> I dude? I get terrified. Because I've actually tried that before when I was just, I'm like, I've never 
done track in my life. But I want to see like how effective that really was. I nearly fell on my face. I'm like, <laughs> how do they do this effectively? Honestly, there's probably some serious tech to it. Probably. Just like there's so much serious tech in Brawlhalla here. Yu is going to be moving on into the top 32. Let's see, where is Cody going? We know he's going to the elimination bracket. In this pool as well, we had Anime going 3-0 over Cody Travis's teammate from yesterday, Faison. Yep. Are they going to face one another? No, they will not face one another in the elimination bracket unless Faison moves on into top 32 and Cody Travis moves on into top 32. Zyder is playing Hunter right now, who Yu's took out. Okay. And the winner of that will move on to face Faison for top 32. And then Snipe Socks is fighting Access. Not sure exactly who that is. Maybe we'll get to see more of them if they take out Snipe Socks because they'll be going up against Cody Travis for the elimination side top 32 of that pool. But before we move on into our Lores versus Perplexity match after the break, we're going to be taking a quick break. We will see you in just a few moments. Welcome back, everybody, to DreamHack Dallas. We got some fantastic Brawlhalla action coming at you in just a little bit. But man, if you had missed, or you just tuned in right now, you missed a couple fantastic matches. We just had used uh, knock out uh, Cody Travis yep. from the winner's bracket. And man, it, that, that was what, a top 32 qualifier, right? Yes, so, it I mean, was. Like, it just really goes to show, because those are two very prominent names. And the fact that one of them had to go down into the elimination side this early, Definitely goes to show how stacked this bracket is. But man, that's what you get from a Brawlhalla land. Nothing but the best. And we have another top 32 qualifier match 
right here in front of our very eyes. It is, of course, what you're seeing on your screen. Lorez versus Perplexity. Now, Lorez, his trip through the bracket so far, he 3 0'd slow motion. Shouts out to our boy over there at Bearded Brawl, slow motion. <laughs> then he 3 0'd Capsar, who is, of course, Ethan from back in the day, for those that don't know. And now he finds himself up against Perplexity. Perplexity coming off of a 3 1 victory against Silly Gobi. After that, he went up against Dog and won game five there as well. But stepping up against Lorez in 1v1s is going to be definitely a different caliber of player. We really know Dog alongside Cutie from how well they placed in top six at DreamHack San Diego. Yep. Not as much of a 1v1 player, at least here recently, but Perplexity ended up taking it out in game five. Laura's going to be a really tough match for him now. Of course, Laura is coming in with a shorter haircut. Laura's used to have longer hair, so now he is sleek. Yep. He's a lean, mean Brawlhalla machine. Absolutely. And, and that's something I th find is always interesting, though. I feel like it's harder to be a good doubles player than it is to be a good singles player because there's just so much more you have to pay attention to. Uh, so, I mean, I, I feel like if you're great at doubles, I mean, you definitely got to be at least Three, solid two, in singles here. And we'll one, see if that definitely plays bro. out here. But, yes, we're going to get right into this. Lorez versus Perplexity as we get into Small Brawl Haven here. Now we're seeing a legend that we rarely see on the tournament stage, and that is definitely not the Kaya, of course. We are talking about the Ember coming out from Perplexity. Gonna have a very, very, very strong signature kit as well. I'm really looking for that neutral sig coming out from the bow. That bird comes out yep. so quickly. Once thought to be one of the best signatures in the game at one point in Brahalla Esports. I mean, definitely some, I think, very iconic signatures too. I mean, just a plethora of animals coming out here. But we'll definitely see how this continues to play out here right now. We do have... Laura is kind of crawling behind here a little bit. Perplexity makes their mark and sets the tone as they take the first stock here in game one. Yeah, he's opening up game one really strong here. And now that you brought up those animals, uh, we're kind of getting animals v animals because Kaya has her own set of animals in her signatures. But they're like made of snow. I don't know if they're like spirit animals like or elementals at that yeah, point. So yeah, so it's like IRL Familiars. animals versus versus like spiritish animals and so far the IRL animals are coming out on top until Lorez gets the evener there. He does have about 50 damage on this stock. Now we are here on Small Brawl Haven, so we could see the stocks flying pretty quickly, which is something a Kaya player does not want. One of the reasons you pick Kaya, there are many, of course, but one of them is she has solid defense, very solid defense. Yeah. It's crazy because I feel like we just haven't seen a lot of the animals either, so. <laughs> but yeah, way. he's been kind of staying away from the signature kit. Now, of course, it did get some nerfs right after the World Championship. Even uh, even Impala acknowledged him, but still said the signature kit is still very strong. Yes. We may see that once Lorez gets a little bit more comfortable. He is very far behind here. Doesn't want to risk whiffing a signature and then all of a sudden getting punished with a signature from Perplexity and losing the second stock. Man, I really got hit to Perplexity. They are doing an amazing job controlling the pace here. And that bow was putting in a lot of work, but... Neutral air. Yeah, we see we see Laura's coming in and starting to put down some solid damage, but obviously not enough. That neutral air grabbing off the top. You saw how high Perplexity picked it up. He chased into the air. There's a side signature. Going to be a whip, but because it had so much movement on it, it ended up going so far past Perplexity that he couldn't find the possible... Oh, he even backed away from that one. I thought the lingering frames were going to get him there, but not quite. Oh man, Perplexity's movement has just been so good too. Really taking their time, right? Not investing in anything that's moderately unsafe. Oh, but that was big though. Great pickup from Lorez, finding a way to even things up here. Just a little bit in the yellow, looking like some white American cheese. Oh, I got some white American cheese in my fridge at home. Ooh. Ooh, you gonna make a sandwich? Mm. Mm. Some mayonnaise, a little bit of mustard, a little bit of buffalo chicken on there. Okay, I was going to say, are you just going to put sauce and cheese? Like, where's the meat? And then some little banana peppers on top. Ooh, getting me all excited. Oh, man. But either way, we're going to get back to this game here because these two are absolutely cooking each other as well. Final stock situation, very even across the board. Just the neutral light coming out. The recovery did not make contact with Lorez. 
Man, really, yeah. You, you said big ups to Perplexity for his performance so far. Absolutely. We're, uh, we're kind of waiting for Lores to kind of pop off because he isn't just a 2v2 player. He also is a very strong 1v1 player as well. That's really where he kind of first broke out onto the scene on our eyes. The dodge up gives him enough vertical that he can hold to the left and get over in time, going with that kind of higher movement speed that, that translates into the higher in-air movement speed as well, coming out from the Ember so we can drift. But Lores is going to sneak that one out despite being at a deficit most of that game. I mean, I've, I think we've had three South American players on stream so far, and all of them have just pretty much been dominant. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just kind of continuing the trend here. Laura is saying, listen, uh, I'm not going to be the one that ends up looking foolish on stream. But we cannot take perplexity out of this quite yet. It was just one game loss, and it was very even across the board. However, there were a couple of, I would say, suspect scenarios where he's kind of like, yeah, I feel like you could have clutched that one out. But maybe, you know, Three, nerves are coming two, into play here. One, maybe the oh. hat is just keeping too much of that heat on you, and you're thinking about the heat on your head. It might be, but, man, I do love that perplexity hat. That's, that that's how you hat. can spot him from a mile away, is looking for that hat. That I'm guessing, I don't know, is it a strawberry? Is it an apple? I'm not sure what type of fruit it is, but you can spot it from a mile away when you're looking out on the convention floor. It almost looks like a tomato. It could be a tomato. That's very interesting to put a tomato on here. But either way. Oh, he d oh. and it ends up dropping because he picked it up like right on the corner yeah. and Perplexity ended up falling out of it. Okay, there's the double side light. He goes straight into the Sayer. I think he didn't want to pick up the D-Light because it might have been a weird initiation, kind of like on the left side that we just saw over right on that corner. So he just went straight for the side air. Oh, wow. Whoa. Big Lores. <laughs> ah, jump scare, Lores, jump scare. Ah! It's just, a, it was a Lores moment for sure. You're like, oh, look, I'm gonna clutch this one out, put my face, superimpose it into the background. He he became the demon on Demon Island. <laughs> <laughs> and he's keeping it going, the juggle game coming through, that 45 degree angle with the neutral light. That is, of course, a very popular initiation angle for guitar players if we're thinking about that down air that Perplexity just used. Mm -hmm. Oh, big pickup. Okay, not gonna get the weapon toss up. Ooh, use the gravity cancel. Not gonna get that. <laughs> you know what? I'll take that. You take a stock, you're already deep in the red as it is. Throw it away. You can have that. Here's a little bit of charity for you. Perplexity even smiled after that one. He knows that he got kind of owned there, even though the stock ended up falling for Lores. Absolutely worth full stock lead here. We could see Lores going up 2-0, and the pressure would really be on Perplexity at that point. Yep. But we do see these guitars coming out for Perplexity again. This is what really got him started in game one, set him off to a great start. However, just looking, wow, barely whiffing on some of these attacks here. That's so crazy. I mean, maybe it's just Lores really, again, finding that momentum for his own and realizing exactly how Perplexity wants to play. Yeah, the punish game coming out for Perplexity is just not quite tight enough. We're seeing Lores like whiff a lot of moves, but when you're that far ahead, especially when your opponent is like very much in the red at this point, like they're going to be scared to initiate because they know that if they whiff, you find a signature, you find a, a, a KO option like a D-Light side or even just a raw side air, all of a sudden everything's done. So Lores has so much power in his corner here that every time Perplexity wants to commit, that could be the final commitment he gets that game. Yeah, man, this is definitely crazy too, man. Laura is just turning it off to another level. Already played great in game one, right? And then in game two just plays better. You know how terrifying that is? Like when you win or your opponent wins and then like they still make adaptations to play better next game. <laughs> That sucks, dude. That's it's terrifying. It just hurts the mental a little bit. I mean, that's like the mark of the best players in yep. the world. And that's why you see, like, Perplexity, of course, all the credit in the world for even making it this far. But you see a different caliber of player coming mm -hmm. out from Laura, someone who can make it into fourth place in tournaments in their region, even on the global stage, is that adaptation. That's why we do best of five skip. Three, yep. two. That's a one, big difference in damage as well. It's 256 yep. to 60. 32. That's absolutely insane and definitely goes to show exactly how Lords is playing this, right? Staying on top of his opponent, but also staying elusive themselves and just dominant the whole way. Now, one thing that may be a little bit difficult for Perplexity to do this game, given that he's on Queen Nye, is still be elusive because he does not have the movement speed that he does when he plays Ember. That's sort of the biggest drawback of Queen Nye is she 
is sluggish. Now with dash, that helps out a little bit. If we were in 2v2s, it helps out a little bit more. But in 1v1s, it's going to be tough. But she makes up for it with very, very high strength. Yeah, very high strength. I've seen some stocks disappear when they shouldn't have, right? But right there, Perplexity going for the weapon toss. Ew, getting a little too aggressive off stage. And that might cost you. Oh, gets the wall touch just barely. Being able to survive just a little bit longer here. But now has those Katars in hand. Tries to go for the SIG. Not to be able to get the connection that they were looking for. And that's a very scary signature to go for. Because, yes, it has a ton of strength and force on it. Perplexity able to make it under. Kind of switched up there onto Lores. He lost kind of track of what his in-air movement economy was. Ended up falling. So we're even on stocks. But but if you throw out that neutral signature on the Katars, you're really just kind of hanging up there asking to be punished if you didn't find a connection. Yep. So committing to the Katar neutral signature is a big risk. Mm -hmm. okay. Ooh. Both these players working nice. these spears. Yep. The connection right there, gonna be able to clean that up very easily. Where are you going? I thought they just weren't not gonna get the weapon for a little bit. Now, I love that we saw that option coming out from Lores to close out that stock as the side light comes out. What do a lot of spear players do after that? Of course, the side light, yep. so that they can then get the D light into the side air. But no, he went for the side light into the chase dodge turnaround recovery, so that hopefully, if the dodge came out from perplexity, the iframes are done by the time the recovery comes out and the KO happens. Now, D Sig, that one's gonna be pretty quick on the Katars. Yep. Oh! Okay, wow, being able to clean that up as well. Okay, maybe the switch is what we needed to see from Perplexity. Absolutely. It's not looking bad, because every time we've seen a character switch in game three or elimination game here, it just really has not been very pretty. And while the beginning wasn't exactly amazing for Perplexity, you can definitely see they're starting to get this warmed up here a little bit. He's definitely in a decent spot here. He is about maybe, I'll say, uh, a third, maybe three-eighths of the way through this stock when we factor in the defense that Perplexity has on Queen Nye. But all of a sudden, things might be turning around here. The sweat beats came out, and that's when we knew it was pretty much curtains. Lores is going to clean that one up. But respect to Perplexity for almost making the Queen Nye work. Yep. I mean, it's definitely, again, it's tough to just swap characters in the heat of battle like yep. that. But again, probably the best showing we've had so far. But so far as well, the character switches have been 0 for 3 so far. So maybe it's better to stick with what you're already working with. Maybe it's better to switch. We just have not seen that proven quite yet. But either way, fantastic work from Lores. And honestly, Perplexity's not done yet. And that's one of the things that I really love about Brawlhalla, given that the light attack kit for weapon to weapon stays the same across characters. So you have players like Boomy who have a large character pool, players like Stingray who have a large character pool as well. And then you have players who are very much legend loyalists, like Cody Travis that we already saw on the Barraza. So we have the spread of people who can easily make that character swap. And then we have the people who are purists. I'm going to play this one character and I'm not going to touch any other legend in the game. I have so much respect for Pierce. I mean, honestly, I have so much respect for both of them, right? Because that's a lot of work you got to put in to be very good with a lot of characters. But Pierce is just like, oh, this is a bad matchup. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Play my favorite character. <laughs> I may lose, but I'm going to have fun doing it. Get ready to learn that matchup, buddy. <laughs> But sometimes character purists, like, like, it just turns into a thing where it's just like, you know, a matchup doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they are going to play exactly how they're always going to play. And it, it's trouble for some people. But either way, fantastic games from both these players. I know it's a 3-0, but it was close, though. That side air was huge yep. for Lores at the end, not just because it sent Perplexity all the way over to the right side of the stage, but it also disarmed Perplexity so that on his recovery back, he had to blow everything. You saw the sweat beads coming out, but he didn't have a weapon toss to throw over at Lores up against the wall to act like essentially a wall between him and Laura so he could actually recover back. So unfortunately for Perplexity, he is going to be going down into the elimination bracket. I'm wondering if he's going to be going in with that Queen Nye or if he's just going to be starting off with the Ember in future sets and then swapping if he needs to. He is going to be waiting for the winner of Sandwick versus Team Umizumi, a.k.a. Future Bubble. Ooh. So we could see, we could see Sandwick in top 32 if he wins this set and then wins against Perplex. That would be huge, too. Sandwick is such a nice guy. I love him. I love Sandwick. Shout out to Sandwick. Many Sandwick lovers. I don't know why you're looking over there. I, I don't, I'm just looking around me. It's just nervousness. Anxiety. Thought, yeah, thought, thought, he, <laughs> thought, he might, thought he might just happen to pop up somewhere, but unfortunately yeah. he did not. He's, he, I mean, he's, he's in a set, right? It's, probably should have thought about yeah, it. Yeah, so he's probably over there. Yeah, he's, he's probably gaming right now. <laughs> don't, gaming. don't want to interrupt him while but he's I do, gaming. I do hope that if Perplexity, uh, when they play their next set, because I feel like if they played Queen Knight from the beginning there, we probably wouldn't have seen a 3-0. Because from just that one game and starting to get that warmed up, they start getting a little close, a little bit scary. But 
But either way, taking a look at some of these highlights, we do got uh, Godly. <laughs> I was playing Godly today, man. It's just, it's just how it works. Godly versus Jet Bean. You see that big dunk over the edge. The Mordexes are in force today. Yep. Sandstorm playing Mordex. I, I I feel so bad because I forgot the Mordex that we saw earlier. Who was the Mordex that we saw earlier? It was a, it was a yellow Mordex. I can't remember who it was. I'm so bad. Uh, it was... Uh, was it Sack? It was Sack. It was Sack, yeah, yeah. Because we've literally had two, three, and four on the South American PR. Yep. Right in order. Well, it went like four, two, three. But either way, if we don't get number one here, I'm going to lose my mind. Now, Godly did say earlier, he tweeted out that the heat, man, it's getting to him. He feels like he has to take a nap after every set, and I believe he has a neck fan around his neck, hopefully shooting some jets of cool air up at him. Yep, he does. He does. That is a very smart choice to keep him cool while we see the hottest gameplay from Godly here against Jet Bean. Yep. Thankfully, it's Jets of Air, not Jets of Beans. <laughs> <laughs> That is dang true. You you said it, brother. Can you imagine a fan that just shoots uh, beans out? I mean, it, you know, if they're cold, it's not the worst thing. Beans probably have a higher specific heat yeah. than the air does. So it's going to take a lot more energy to warm up those beans right. than it just would be to warm up normal air around you. I think, hold on, no one... Can, I feel we, like can we get the patent office? Does anyone anyone have any connections over at the patent office? Because I think we I think we just stumbled upon something. Did we? I look. I, I think we did. I think we did. Oh, we're gonna get the Boomy highlights now. It's gonna be Godly versus Boomy on the stream in front of us. You're seeing Boomy versus Fozy that happened earlier today. Boomy, one of the very few Theas out there bringing this legend in. Of course, this is one of the. Is this the first time? I can't remember if this is the first time that she's been allowed, I think I think it is. The first time she's been allowed? I yeah. believe so. Because Spring Royale goes still off of Spring Championship rules and she was not allowed for a Spring Championship, if I'm correct. Yeah. So yeah, this is Boomy, one, one of the few people, he's he's done that in the past. He's been play, one of the few players to like jump on the new legend when it's not like the new hotness. Yeah. And play it very well. I mean, he did it with Yumiko in the past. He's done it with, like, Diana. He's done it with a handful of different legends. And he made it work against Posey. Dude, this, this character is just actually insane, though. Yeah, how she's, fast, she's crazy. How fast these signatures are are just... It's it's terrifying. <laughs> like, it's so terrifying. And honestly, I'm glad that we've been seeing... Obviously, they're going to continue to make some more Battle Boots uh, champions here because, like, oh, they're just... There's so much fun to watch, dude. Battle boots are so sick. <laughs> and that's where we're seeing the more modern, quote unquote, modern legends now being picked by Boomy. So we yep. see the old legends. We saw a Lucian being picked. We're seeing, I mean, like, like we said, even Mordex is still kind of old at this point. We saw the Mordex being picked. We're going to get Mordex in this set. But we're also getting the new hotness coming out from Thea. Yep. As we see Godly and Boomy getting ready. Just wait. Is Boomy sitting down? He's hiding. Oh, he he's was. Hiding. Yeah, he's hiding. He's there. He's there. there yeah. he is. <laughs> I'm like, did he leave? He was just there. Just hiding behind the monitor a little bit. But both these players probably just getting a nice little button check in here. And man, look at this, though. Now, now, <laughs> now look at, uh, I want you to look at these earnings, not just because they're really big numbers, but because they've been kind of built over time in a different way. Boomy yeah. has Three, built his two, earnings, one, yes, in North four. America, but also on the global stage as well. In fact, I would imagine a, lo a large percentage of the earnings does come from actual international yeah. land competition. Yep. Meanwhile, Godly, most of his earnings in the game have been built in his region, given that we didn't have like proper lands until BCX last year and then the actual lands we have this year. Yep. I mean, either way, that's a lot of money. And there's also more money on the line here as well. $35,000 in prize pools. Yes, sir. Definitely huge. It's gonna be huge for both these players too. They wanna continue to add to their earnings here, but man, boomy, just zipping all over the place. Now you can see it on the bottom middle of your screen. We are actually in top 32 at this point. These players want to move on. The next set that they would be playing, if they won, would be the top eight qualifier. So they're on the precipice of the qualifier for top eight. Boomy's already starting off this one with the first KO on to Godly. And Godly's probably thinking around about those beans right now. That's probably what's going on here. Not <laughs> I, hope not. Like <laughs> I hope he's not thinking about the beans, man. About the beans. Not the beans. Not the beans, man. <laughs> he needs to be thinking about these dang boots that are putting the boots to him. Yeah, man. I mean, that's just Boomy just flying all over the place. Such a high execution character, blinding speed as well, and the combo game on point. Boomy is killing it. 
Charging oh. that one up, and he punishes the landing as Godly hits the ground. Didn't quite lead to the KO, but Boomy is very much looking at a two-stock lead. If he's able to grab this one from Godly without taking a recovery, without taking a side air, there's the side air that comes through, takes him out. Luckily for Godly, he didn't need a setup. He didn't need to try to fish for that D-Light or anything. Just a raw side air that hits on a grounded opponent. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those situations where a character is lighting up. You just got to build up enough damage, and then a slight breeze is all you need to take them out. But unfortunate scenario there. I mean, Godly was already pretty far into the red onto that second stock before he even the stock count up. But now it just continues to get a little bit worse here. Again, throwing that stock away, wasn't really able to get anything back into them as well. But Boomy, oh, unfortunately facing the wrong way. And Boomy's going to take some extra damage there. See, that signature coming out every time. I just like, I think about like Koji and his sword down signature, looking at how fast that signature is and be like, what the heck, man? What about me? Mine's so slow. <laughs> Dude, this one's so quick, too. It's so crazy. Gosh, he's so fast. Man, the, the neutral signature, the hitboxes on that are so unique. The weird angles that it goes at. It goes at, like, initially a steep angle and then a really shallow angle. Just a huge switch up. Yeah. That's that's going to be a matchup in experience for a lot of players here. I'm not sure if that's what's really taken out Godly here or if it's just, like, Boomy's raw gameplay. I mean, it, it could just be Boomy. It could well. be. It, it absolutely probably, could be. I would definitely say it's a mixture of both because Boomy is that guy and Thea seems to be that girl, so... There's the sideline. He went for the neutral light, but no, Boomy stayed grounded. He wanted to grab that weapon spawn as quickly as he could. There's the side air. He keeps himself back. He doesn't hold the forward there to move him towards his opponent because he wanted stage control. There we go. That's going to be that game one. Boomy feeling good, feeling confident. You saw Godly smile a little bit at the end there. Probably thinking about all those beans. <laughs> If we if we incepted beans into his, I mean, I guess we didn't incept it because like he knows what's going on. So hopefully we didn't we didn't plant those beans because then they're gonna start growing because that's what plants do. Yeah, <laughs> that is what plants do, huh? You put a little bit of water on them, just watch them do their thing. And they, they that's that's what they be doing. It seems like that's the one thing that they're really good at doing yeah. is growing. And Boomy so far has already grown one victory for himself. Cultivated it. <laughs> he really did. <laughs> As we get into our next game here, we see Godly pulling out the Mordex, which honestly, probably not a bad idea Great here. Great idea. Because, you know, you get that Scythe to kind of kind of battle back here a little bit. And also, obviously, the Gauntlets, too. So when you really need to start getting hands on them, those boots are going to be a little bit scary, uh, or a little bit, what is, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, not as safe. OK. Risky. Yeah. Thank you. Talking about Risky Business starring Tom Cruise. Never seen it, but I know there's a, a famous dancing scene in it. Godly hoping he can get the victory here and dance. Yeah, you see Godly <laughs> laughing. He knows he's getting hit by so many of these signatures. I'm surprised Boomy wasn't laughing. Boomy's laughing on the inside, but he stays a stone cold killer while he's playing this game. Which is crazy because he is usually the most like outwardly goofy person and laughing when he picks up strange things like that. I mean, we saw Boomy versus Fiend at DreamHack San yeah. Diego, and Boomy, if you looked at his face, he was having a great time during that. I mean, it could just be the fact that he's fighting Godly here and he just does not want to could drop be. this game. Absolutely. Sometimes it's all about the context, it's about the scenario here, and this is obviously a big one because these are two very, very strong players battling each other right now. Godly, huge combo. Not able to close out the stock yet. Okay, goes back to pick up the scythe. And the gonna miss, and now Boomy's got these. Ooh, battle boots in hand, but it does not matter. Escorted to the side blast zone. Godly has his choice of weapons. He's gonna, he's gonna be juggling them. That's gonna delay the weapon spawn for Boomy, but he sticks back on the gauntlets. Still has weapon control, easily able to get over to that weapon spawn that comes in on the left side. It's gonna be the side. Spawn comes in, Boomy grabs it. It's gonna be the Lance. You move forward and you're able to charge that second hit as sort of a timing mix up. That time he didn't do it. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, when you give characters any sort of timing mix up like that, too, those can usually come into really great practice, uh, really keeping your opponents on their toes. Godly not fighting on anything quite yet, though, but Boomy get some strong boots. Speaking of Koji, he kind of has that as well. He's probably looking at that charge signature and be like, what the heck, man? Yeah. My, my side signature, I can charge it for a few frames, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. What has she got, man? Oh, my God. I was God. born in the wrong timeline. Welcome to the power creep, baby. <laughs> 
Pumi is loving this legend so far, charging that one up as well. Godly, he's not too far behind, but the way Boomy is hitting these signatures, when you get into the red and you're Godly, you have to be a little bit more careful than if you were playing against any other player, against any other legend, because Boomy's KO efficiency has been solid. His damage buildup has been solid as well. He's been solid all across the board. He's about halfway through this second stock, and Godly's on his final. You know how upsetting it's got to be getting sent off. Oh my goodness, Boomy! Please relax. We've got another game. You can save some of the sauce for later. You can always ask for a little bit of extra sauce too. You know, take some home, use it for yeah, the other exactly. meals. Yeah, exactly. Just but get some on the side and a nice little cup, put it in your fridge, warm exactly. it up a little bit later. But, but Boomy, no, he's just been pouring the ketchup nonstop. <laughs> he, he has the Olive Garden waiter at his table <laughs> putting the cheese on and he's just not saying when. <laughs> he's just staring him dead in the eyes. Yep. You're going to keep grading and then you're going to grab another one. But I can't imagine what it feels like too when you get sent off stage and then Thea throws the battle boots to try and convert on that stock and you just get these two Timberlands just punching <laughs> you in the head. <laughs> just totally stomped by those boots. But I mean it's like, okay, well what's what's the other option? He just he throws a lance at you? I don't I don't want that to happen either, man. Look how big it is. Yeah. I but I feel like the boots are just so disrespectful. Yeah, it, it is really disrespectful. <laughs> Not quite as disrespectful. Oh, oh beautiful! Oh, wow! That's a Boomy classic right there. I can just picture him doing that with blasters as well, where you hit the side air to bounce him off the stage, turn around side air the other direction to clean that one up. Oh, yeah, wow. Player two. That combo was absolutely sick, though. That was, uh, that was a treat to watch. Oh my god. Look at Boomy, he's focused, man. Godly's probably really feeling the pressure right now. A lot, of course, is riding on this tournament, just like any other LAN, and Godly might be going down into the elimination bracket in the first round of top 32, Skiff. I don't know how many times we gotta talk about it. It just Three, goes to show two, how one, strong draw. the talent pool is at these events. And we got the old guys coming through. Boomy is an old guy at this point. Right? Wait, hold on. Wait, how old is, is that the is that the rivals of Aether Frog? It is Rhino. You they know they hate him in that game. They, <laughs> they, they call it uh, they call him the Brahala Frog on TikTok a lot. Yeah, I, I see I see tweets from Dan Fornace where he sees these pictures of that and people are like, hey look, it's the Brahala Frog. Dude, Dan is literally the Funniest game dev. I love him. He is so funny. Big shout out. If you guys aren't following Dan Fornace, you're messing up. And the whole Rivals of Aether team right. bringing us that. I just, I love this skin. It's such a beautiful a skin. skin. The, the jelly hands. Love the jelly hands. I don't want to get hit by him because I don't, I don't like being sticky. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. perfect with oh. that shallow angle and the side air. How many more options can you cover, Boomy? How many more options? What do we need? But we do have, keep in mind, this is, I think this Godly's like first lead in a hot minute too. See if he can keep it up. It's sticky hands time. Nice down air. Okay, he gets immediately hit trading one for one. Yep. I mean, for sticky hands, he's really not getting these combos built up. A little bit unfortunate. Oh, that was a big play there. Not a huge punish. Boomy did get a little damage out of it though. Big spear play. All right. Mm. Oh, the dare. Boomy was just a little bit too far to the right. He wasn't under Godly enough to get hit by that. Found a nice punish. They're still very even. Despite Boomy getting... Okay, well, now he's starting to add up that damage a little bit more. But Boomy is going to have to add up a lot of hits to find the damage because he has lower damage per hit. Now, uh, for Boomy, he's been doing a great job with it. But still, they are very even. The recovery coming out up top. Swap it back over to the gauntlets. Would have been nice if that KO'd there. Almost picked up another one. There it is. Godly now holding on to this lead, gonna juggle those weapons. Let's see what he sticks with. It is going to be the spear. Yep. Now, one thing that'll have going gauntlets versus boots is you're playing against a very fast weapon, yes. like Katars. So you having lower startup frames on your gauntlets isn't as strong as it would be if you're going maybe up against the lance or up against definitely an axe. Right. But I mean, you do still have a little bit of an advantage. It's just a matter of being a little more choosy with how you try to engage. But right now, speaking of choosy, Godly being very careful with his openings here, getting some strong hits against the onesies, twosies coming through. And we got the gauntlets coming out the play. No weapon in hand for Boomy, but they do get the boots coming out. 
Now, Boomy was also being very choosy as well, and he was he was choosing the heavy attack button. He really liked pressing that signature button. Finds the D-Light ground pound for the KO. Boomy's still very much in this. He's about two-thirds of the way through his final stock, so the lead is definitely not insurmountable, but yeah. it is going to be difficult. Side signature from Godly all the way from the right side of the stage means it's not a KO. Ground pound coming through. No, we just went for the dare. Didn't want to commit to a GP. God, this is so terrifying. Because honestly, it could just be one opening is all that Godly really needs to take this game three and kind of push this momentum back into his favor a little bit. Now Godly is playing Wusha. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There, there's that weapon toss going up. Godly is going to go under the stage, barely get to the edge. Okay. Ah, okay. Geez. Okay, Skip. That I is almost lost it there when that like neutral light came yes. out from Godly. I almost ripped the a little bit of hair that I still have left on my head out. Holy! Godly like needs to start showing some respect for the casters here. He's taking years off our life. And then, nah, I feel like my life expectancy ain't too much longer. Yeah, I'm, real. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here boiling in this coat. Three, little two, ranch hand Sparky one, over here can't four. handle the heat here in Daly, Texas. Oh, good old Dallas. But either way, yep, we're getting right back into this here. God, the game weapon control early is very strong. And it's, of course, going to be on the spear. Really kind of his chosen weapon. Nice little bounce pass to himself. He's able to pick it back up so he's not disarmed. Okay. Yeah, so far, this uh, switch has been super crucial. I, I think just having this spear alone, being able to have those long pokes, right? Even again, for the onesies, twosies, has gone such a long way for Godly here. Having range, having confirmed true KO yes. options with like the D-Light Serre, D-Light Recovery. I mean, even having just like raw good KO moves, like we've seen raw spear side airs KO today quite a bit, raw recoveries and ground pounds KO today. But of course, Wu Shang also has an amazing signature kit as well. Yep, that one it comes out a lot too. Man, I've seen that one so many times. Sliding off stages as well. Boomy, ooh! Nice recovery! Yeah, I, I think that Godly's starting to pick it up here yep. a little bit. They recognize that Boomy loves to throw out these signatures, and getting that timing down is huge, because that's how we saw the last game end. Threw out a signature, and Godly just waited and got a strong punish out of it. We're really seeing that adaptation come through. That matchup inexperience is starting to turn into matchup experience for a player like Godly. Harpoon Toss comes out. He's able to dodge up and stay high. Oh, I really thought he was going to be able to make it there. I don't know if... I think he, he wasn't holding yeah if he wasn't holding left hard enough because like you saw his reaction in the bottom corner yeah. it seemed like oh that was bad not like he expected that to happen I think what might have happened is because of Boomy's positioning, I, I think he might have drifted back to say, okay, maybe I can get a counter hit here, yeah. or was expecting Boomy to do something else. But yeah, it just kind of cost him. But not a bad thing, though. Not too terrible. You, well, you, you, you had it. You, you had a lead. <laughs> Dude, it's Boots. Oh, my God. It's Boots, baby. They can do that to you in a heartbeat. Godly still trying his best to figure them out, still doing a good job. He's able to come back to stage. He had stage control. Nice punish on that one, staring it down. That is one of the best signatures in this kit. The Gauntlet Down Sig is very good as well because it can grab a stacked opponent. But how quickly the Spear Side Sig comes out is a destructive wow. signature on this legend. And just barely getting past Godly there too, dropping the edge guard. Nice. Again, another He's punishing him. Punish. Godly's, he's getting it, man. You can look, looks like Boomy's just getting a little bit nervous here. Godly's been having like a slight smirk all game. All set. Even when he was like losing before, he, yeah. he kind of had that smirk on, which man, that scares me. That's a that's a scary mentality. I just I just at that point, just, if I'm booming, I'm not looking over at all. I don't want to see a slight smirk if I'm bodying somebody. <laughs> well, let's Punishes see that one as well. Yep. Godly's see, really figuring it out here, charging that one up. Godly wasn't able to perfectly punish that. I thought he might get it, given that the charge was coming out, and maybe he really learned where that kind of ending phase is, yep. where Boomy actually ends up. Nice ground pound over on the edge. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Trying to grab the bottom side of the nair. Great dare! Godly takes a two-stock that game! Win. Man, <laughs> what a different change of pace here. I, don't, I think you can really see it in Boomy's face right now. Look, at he is nervous. He's thinking. His eyes are moving all over the place. Godly's just sitting there. All the beans in the world on his neck right now. <laughs> He's loving those beans. He's loving those beans. It's also funny because he's from the UK and they love their beans. They do! <laughs> it works for the region and the culture as well. Wow, Three, big W! Two, one, We're so eclectic in world travelers. Oh my god. I've gone all over. 
Make sure to go to Valencia next month, D-H-V-A-L-23. Starkshot.gg forward slash D-H-V-A-L-23. Do it now, please. Nice. And, you know, <laughs> got a little bit of a plug in there. We were talking about the Good world. Might as well. Plug. All Makes you EU players out there, this is your chance to come to a LAN. Makes up, makes up for uh, the segue you had earlier. Yeah, just, well, just, you kind of pulled that look, one Look, all of them can't be home runs, okay? <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know. But sometimes they're a ground rule double, you know? Yes, sir. <laughs> Still a good play, but either way, so you get a good plays here. Godly continues. Hey, punishes that neutral signature again. Mm -hmm. Boomy's really got to be careful with that. It's actually crazy just watching in real time. Godly going down 2-0, switching the characters, and just recognizing this is what I need to punish. Yep. And a lot of it's just been with the spear, too. I love watching the learning process, whether it's a not-so-good player really clicking and figuring something out, or when you're one of the best players in the entire game, and he punishes that as well! Godly doing such a great job here, potentially on the precipice of a reverse three against Boomy when it seemed like all was lost, when it seemed like the shakeup of Thea was enough to take out Godly. Godly's got a lead here in game five. The way he moved before taking that stock, literally on the cusp of death and just saying, I will not go down the way you want me to. I am gonna get this first stock here. And it, you know, it's not too often when someone picks a tag as prominent as something like Godly yep. and lives up to the name. I like the way you move. Bow, 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 bow. Shout out to Outcast. Godly over there at the weapon disadvantage. He's able to get back on the main stage. He's gonna take that side air. That's gonna take away his second stock. He does have about a 50 to 60 damage lead on a boomy as he's spawning back in. Gonna be searching for that weapon. Gets away from that Lance down air. Nice down air to punish there. Just kind of staying in place, hoping that Boomy would move past him and he could turn around, hit that neutral light to the left. Yep. Okay. Whoa! Dude, Godly's doing he's, his whip punishes are so good right now. Oh, he's jumping around a lot, doesn't want to commit. <laughs> I don't think it's yep. even a matter of like not wanting to commit. I think it's just trying to bait out options for Boomy. He just continues to throw out these SIGs and he just gets these big punishes out of it. Oh my goodness. Ah. I feel like I'm watching a Zapappy match where Zapappy's playing Azoth, D-Light into the side air, almost the KO, and like Zapappy, when, when, I mean, when you're playing Azoth, yep. like, you do the same thing. You're a signature spamming legend. That is like the <laughs> way you are designed. That's the way you are best utilized. Gets the onstage ground pound for the KO. Huge lead here for Godly. He has maybe 110 damage, maybe not even that much just yet. So he's in a great spot. But all of a sudden, you see Zapappy like run up against like a different caliber of player as we get the equalizer all of a sudden, and they figure out how to punish the signatures. That's exactly what Godly is doing here. But Boomy here in game five has made sure we come into our final stocks very even between these two. This is exactly the way this needed to end. This is actually getting crazy. Right down to the wire too. We got to see if Boomy has what it takes to clutch this out. It certainly is looking scary. It looks like everything is against you with the way that Godly's playing here. But now no spear going to the gauntlets. And I feel like the gauntlets really have not been as scary, especially for these boots coming in the play. Oh, that could have been huge. Winner of this moves on to face Snowy in a top eight qualifier match. Loser goes down to the elimination bracket. Oh my God. Stakes are so high here for both of these players, but Boomy has just a little bit of a lead here, getting Godly close into the red. Now we're seeing the down signature on the boots come out. Didn't see too many that it was mostly the Lance. Oh, is it going to be enough? Oh, just barely living here. Throws the Nike. He's not going to be able to get the hit they need. Draws is the spear. I can't believe he got rid of the spear. That's been what's used to clutch out so many of these, but we do got a oh. spear. Oh, my God. I'm so <laughs> scared about him picking up an unarmed oh. recovery high in the air. That wasn't high enough, but here comes the Lance from Boomy. Oh my god. A neutral light actually might do it here. He's hunting for it. Oh, this Godly, is can he confirm the edge guard here? The recovery oh. at the top, not enough. It was picked up too low. The weapon oh. toss goes down, and there is the high unarmed recovery. Boomy takes it. Last second in game five. Look at him. You can tell. Look at him. So he's breathing. Oh my god, dude. I can't imagine how he's feeling. Look, he looks like nothing's happened. He's like, yeah, I'll run It was close. I finished. I'm shaking more than he is right now. I mean, he's won world championships, plural. Yeah, but just like in the moment. Wow. Boomy just barely ekes that one out at the end. Godly going down in winner's round one of top 32 is rough. This bracket 
is It's crazy. brutal, man. I'm telling you, man. The Battle Boot's coming in, putting on some big combos. I mean, Boomia was just stepping on frogs, getting big kicks, serving punts all over the place. It was a rough time. It was a rough time for him, but then we saw that switch to the Rano, and things just started to turn around big time. Now, I've been frogging in the rice fields of South Louisiana. Okay. We didn't do any of those moves to catch a frog. We just shined a bright light in their eye, and then they just kind of stand there, and you try to grab them real quick. But, I mean, how many of those frogs were holding spears? <laughs> Actually, it might have been underneath the water, but I, I didn't see any of them. So I hope I never run into that frog in the rice fields of South Louisiana. <laughs> the frog people of Louisiana. <laughs> Holy. I'm sure they exist. There's a conspiracy for it somewhere. Definitely. Man, Boomy, I still can't believe how he barely, how he barely came back. And it was really probably that evener at the end of the game <laughs> on final stock when he took away Godly's second stock. You can see they both started that third stock at, at almost the same point. Oh my God. What a game that was too. Really came down to like that last hit. Oh, I got to see how many signatures Boomy threw out. Let me look in Odin's journal, the Twitch extension that you at home can also look at. Let's see, Godly threw out five. <laughs> Boomy threw out 19. Honestly, I, I expected a little bit more than that. Yeah, it, it felt like a little it, bit more than that. I bet earlier in the set it was probably more than that. Oh, yeah. And then once you saw Godly start to figure it out, Boomy woed back just a little bit. Not a lot, Not a but lot. just a little bit. Kept the game plan somewhat similar, but yes, obviously like, okay, this is certainly getting punished. If I keep playing this way, I will lose. But just look at the damage dealt as well. A little bit less on Boomy's side, but it's not about whether or not you get the most damage, it's whether you close out the stocks. And that is a popular theory in uh, campaign finance, is it's not that you have to outspend your opponent, yeah. you just have to spend enough. Yeah, and you, just, you don't just have to out-damage your opponent, you just have to do enough damage to get their stocks. You could do a thousand damage. You could do, uh, yeah, we, and we've seen Cody Travis do a thousand damage before, <laughs> but you could do so much damage, and if you can't end those stocks, then it essentially doesn't matter. But right. we have future sets coming up in the pipeline, but before we get to them, we're gonna be taking a quick break. We will see you in just a few moments.
And we are back here at DreamHack Dallas. We are in top 32 of 1v1. I am Sparky. Joining me is Skiff. And we just watched Boomy send Godly down to the elimination bracket in round one of top 32. Very early for a player of Godly's caliber. Boomy yes. has stepped it up today after a disappointing performance with Sandstorm in 2v2s yesterday. Mm, and that's the thing is like, <laughs> the crazy thing about this game, you see so many people have won so many championships, world championships even, and at any given moment, they could be an okay player, or they could be the best player in the room for at least a few minutes. And we just keep seeing that. And it's not like any of these guys are bad. They're not playing bad. Just everyone's playing incredible. Maybe a few whiffs we've seen today. We've seen a couple people have some execution errors. But for the most part, it's strong gameplay across the board. Absolutely, and that's why predictions are so hard. Like, we always, we always poke fun at how bad my predictions are and all that, but truly, predictions are so hard to do because oh. really, it doesn't even just come down to the day. It comes down to that literal moment in time when you sit down in the chair to play against your opponent. Now, oh, yeah, I forgot that you curse people when you pick them. I don't. That doesn't happen. I'm, it's not real. I'm just going off what I've been told. Everyone has dog water predictions. It's not just me. and... Blue Mammoth Game employees. I'm what do just they going know? I'm just going off what I've heard. Yeah, and people are lying. <laughs> people are just lying to you, Skiff. Well, you know what's not lying? What? The great action we're going to be getting in just a little bit. That's not a lie. I know that's right. It's going to be Raidish versus Lores, and I have not seen Raidish gameplay this weekend. I, he might have been on the stream during not one of my blocks, but right. when I'm not on the, the, the stage here, I'm I'm usually out there looking in the pools match to see what's going on there. So yeah, I have not seen Radish at all this weekend. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what is going on with Radish this weekend. Uh, well, apparently they're doing pretty good. Yep, because right now they're going to be taking on Lores here. We got South America PR3 versus North America PR4. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. So let's look at Radish's trip through the bracket so far to get to this point. Of course, he was in the same pool as Lores. Both of them came out on the winner's side into top 32. We talked about Lores previously, but Radish started off going up against... Uh, this is crazy that this is the name. I swear we didn't plan this. Uh, Radish went 3-0 over Beanster. This is, this is the bean block. We're, we're the bean boys, apparently. Uh, big bean boys. And after that, he went 3-0 over Turk No Ham. And then third, he went over 3-0 uh, over Blazy. So that's going to be the first big name that Radish took out. Except, uh, yeah, Blazy actually took out Sandwich. So I'm glad. Honestly, I'm glad Blazy lost. I'm glad. Have you ever thought about that, like, life is definitely a simulation? You start manifesting certain things. It and might it just be. popping up everywhere. Sandwick did win against Team Umizumi, so it's Sandwick versus Perplexity for Woo! a top 32 qualifier match. We could see Sandwick in top 32. Let's go, Sandwick! That'd be huge. Look at the viewer vote down there. Lores versus Radish. Honestly, I feel like people are kind of sleeping on Radish on this one. Dude, I, I love never... Lores. I'll sing the praises of Lores all day, but like, I feel like people are... This should be a little bit closer. Yeah, I look... I remember first when I first started really getting involved with the scene, watching Radish. Like I've seen a few, you know, misplays, just not quite living up to Three, the moment. Two, but lately, one, it's just ball. like I just can't count this guy out. And yeah, that's it, <laughs> that's really been the key. Now there were some misses for Radish at DreamHack San Diego, coming in 25th place. But like right before that, top eight at Spring Championship. Right before that, of course, got second place at the Winter Royale. So it has been several months since then. But it's also been a couple months since San Diego as well. So yeah. really, we're gonna see right here what he's been building up since San Diego. Now Radish is known to be one of those slower players. He can definitely slow things down and. So far, Lores is pacing this in a way that Radish isn't dealing very very well with. Yeah. And I mean, it's also one of those scenarios, too, where, like, I mean, it's no disrespect to Radish, because this is a very hard game to win a world championship in, right? He may never win a world championship, but they could very well beat your favorite players yep. any day of the week. <laughs> so, and the, <laughs> the funny thing about Brawlhalla is, in terms of 1v1s, like, a very few people have won world championships, even though we've had several. A lot of them have been won by Sandstorm, LDZ, and then like Im Im Impala. Yeah. <laughs> so three people, despite having so many world championships, we've only had three world champions. Yep. But, I mean, there's also still a lot of Brawlhalla left to be played yes, here. Yes, sir. And as we get further into this game, Radish is struggling a little bit, although he's been on the gauntlets pretty much almost the whole time, I feel like. And like he, he's an orb guy. 
100% at the end of the day, he is an orb guy through and through. That's really where we know him from. Of course, we know him for the Petra, but especially for that orb. One of the few orb warriors out there. I can't even really think of one off the top of my head. Sometimes people will swap to Petra like Godly, but you don't know Godly for Petra. As we can see, trying to get this orb play going. I mean, has done at least a solid job here of trying to even up the stocks. Now it's just a matter of staying mobile, trying to rack up this damage. And we all know Petra can rack up that damage pretty quick. But Loris has done a great job so far, oh. keeping everything still in his control. He's about halfway through this second stock. Of course, we mentioned earlier, Kaya does have very strong defense. Not the strongest in the game, but definitely some solid defense. Where she lacks is going to be in that strength. But of course, her signatures are still so fast. Mm -hmm. As we continue into this as well, I mean, Loris, like you mentioned, doing a great job really keeping everything in order here. But Radish, still, you can't count him out. That's a big hit. Not going to quite take the stock here. Keeping that juggle opportunity. Ugh, unfortunate, you aren't going to keep him in the air. But you were able to get an extra hit. Wow, so low. Living. Yeah, it's a low recovery that he picked up. He's going to be looking for either that recovery or probably, of course, the sidelight Sair. True combo, maybe just a raw Sair because he built up so much damage at that point. He's only maybe 120 damage behind, which, you know, it's it's not a, it's not the most, but it's not a little. So he's going to have to add up that damage. He's doing it so far. Already put out 50 very quickly. Now I believe he's put out 100. Whoa. God, this is too terrifying at the moment. They're even. Skip, they are even right now. I mean, that's just the power of Raidus, I'm telling you. He might not be winning immediately, but give him some time. Ow! Nice down here to clean that one up. The huge range that Lorez has, especially with that dare. Now, the orb is going to have solid range with yes. the dare as well, but he didn't have it in his hand there, and it wasn't at the right spot to be able to use that dare. So, Lorez, the falling down there with the perfect range placed perfectly. Yep, and that was actually some pretty close damage, too, if I, my eyes were correct here. I mean, I know you're the one with glasses, but sometimes I feel like my eyesight is just not holding up, you know? Well, if we're looking at damage numbers, Skip, yes. 598 coming out from Lores, 528 okay. coming out from Raidish. So, you know, relatively, relatively even between those two, just about a 70 damage difference between them. If we're looking at the damage per engagement, let's see, 33 Three, two, for Lores, 29 one. for Raidish. So still, you know, pretty similar between those two, but if you're looking at every single engagement, and Lores is adding up just four more. Yep. You know, it's not the hugest difference, but it does add up for sure. 100%. All right, but here we go. We're going to see if Raidus can find a way to try and push things back into his favor a little bit. We do see those teardrops, sweat drops, excuse me, that we could be crying. I don't know. I want to be crying with a 1 0 lead. Raidus, there we go. Big opening here. <sighs> Tried to go for a gravity cancel. Oh, geez, that's a really tough position here. Can Lores close it out? Tries to go for the damn, but not going to get it. Oh, but finishes up on the right side with that side air. That's a pretty quick one. That was an under 40 second KO. I believe it was about 37 seconds yep. to find that first one. Laura is halfway through this first stock as Radish spawns back in, grabs the gauntlets, starts off with the side air, kind of pacing back and forth, figuring out where he wants to go in. That gauntlet there, very strong, but he doesn't find connection with it. Sidelight into the recovery. There's the recovery from Laura as well. Oh. Juggle game coming out. And if I remember correctly, Laura's, uh, we actually talked about when they won game one, they adapted in game two and just played even more dominant. So while Raidus, I mean, Ooh. not too far behind, huge dunk to even things up, but still in the orange here. And that was a great choice from Radish. He knew the dodge was gone from Laura's because he gravity canceled the neutral signature to try to give him a little bit of a wall there to recover back to the stage. Normally that down signature is like pretty telegraphed on the edge, but it was so well placed there from Radish. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. I feel like Radish is playing a, a little bit more passive here. I mean, you've mentioned that Classic. he's a, Yeah, I mean, he is a slower player, but I feel like even more passive, and it might just be due to how Lawrence is playing right now. That's another one down. Another one down, and another one bites the dust. Yeah, if we're talking about pacing, the slower pacing coming out from Radish, I mean, some of the longest sets I think I've ever seen in my career is like Radish and Meg D. Those can drag on. Those are the two types of players that will just grind you down. That endurance really needs to come out when you're dealing with players like Meg D and then definitely when you're dealing with players like Radish, which is probably one of the reasons like Lores wants to end this as quickly as possible. We talked about the Heat getting the Godly. Radish finding the sidelight side air there for the KO. We talked about the Heat getting 
getting the godly earlier, the endurance is going to be a big deal for yes. these players. And that was a big pickup too. Fantastic play. And relatively evening things up. If Raiders can just find one more opening here, we could see a pretty solid evening of the game. But man, Laura just continues to pick up these slight hits, small hits, nothing too crazy, but creating distance for himself. Yeah, you saw him actually moving back completely. Gets the double the outside. Is that going to go? Yes, it does! All the way over on the edge. And I feel like, you know, the, the, the hands coming up, the shrug coming up, I feel like that's that's kind of how you got to be if you picked up that yeah. double D-light side air all the way on the left side. Laura is now up 2-0 against Radish. I feel like that's what you have to feel like losing that game to as well. Ah, that happened. Yeah. Good, good pickup. I got to go to the next game. All right? You got to find a way to turn your mentality around here. I don't know how Radish is feeling, but I can only imagine being down 2-0, especially in a situation like this. Two fantastic players. No one wants to go into the elimination side of bracket too early. Now, in terms of the damage efficiency from Laura's that game, you can see it right there. 514 is what he did. Split that up. We're going to average that across the three stocks. That is 171.3. Repeating, that is great KO efficiency, especially when you're a lower strength legend like Kaya. You turn red at exactly Three, 150. Two, one, you're not normally four. knocking out at exactly 150. If you, if you had a sword D-Light Sayer from the stage, if you had a D-Light Recovery from the stage, you're not knocking out there. So the fact that he's able to do that at 171 damage per stock is impeccable. Yeah. Oh, they're okay. Raid is starting off aggressive here, uh, kind of turning it up a little bit. And maybe they realize, all right, look, the slow burn isn't exactly the best option here. I got to get a little more aggro. Man, trying to chase him down, too. Kind of playing around that soft platform on the left side. That was the home base for Radish. Now they've moved over onto the right. Lores over on the corner. Radish just kind of playing around that weapon spawn. Doesn't want to engage off stage. Didn't have the range on that side light, but Lores was able to dash in and side light himself. Yeah. There we go. Nice build up right there. I'm trying to keep Loris juggled, but Loris has just been really good at getting back to stage, you know, getting back to safety, playing defensive when they need to. Side light side air, of course, coming yep. out. Radish with just a little bit of a lead here. We're about a minute into this game. That's going to interrupt the recovery, but Radish is able to get back to the main platform, reset his jumps. You see him forward dash, back dash. Just kind of going back and forth. Has stage control. Downsick comes out. Lores wasn't already committed to a signature or anything like that this time, so he's able to just fast fall down to get away from it. Mm -hmm. right. now we got the gauntlets in hand. I feel like we haven't seen a whole lot of gauntlets in the past couple games here. Maybe this is what he needs to really turn this around. Again, strong lead here. Big damage, too. That definitely has been a characteristic of Radish in the past is when, like, a guy I want to win is going up against Radish, and I'm like, yes, Radish has gauntlets in his hand, his weaker weapon, aha! And then he's like, no, nah, I'm also an extremely competent gauntlet player yeah. as well. <laughs> Very competent. But there we go! Ah. Just unable to even it up. Petra also has quite a bit of defense. She yes. also has very high strength. Yeah, it's just a bruiser through and through. Ah, missing that one. Will get punished for it. And Laura is able to even up the stocks. But it's not this a game of stocks here. The percentages are certainly different. We'll see if Raiders can find a way to battle back. Okay, getting the orb back out here. Nice. Yeah, beautiful we played. That turned Lorez red. This might be it. Oh! The orb toss follow-up. Bonking him in the head, knocking him out off the left side. Radish, what a fantastic job so far. Has essentially a full stock lead up on Lorez at this moment. But here comes the spear. Is this going to give Lorez the range that he needs to deal with the orb? All right, there we go. Putting on some nice, solid damage here. Ken, Dude, wow. his strength potential is so strong here on this final stock of Lores. Oh, big opening. See if you can stay on top of that oh, right, a little bit. Had enough active frames to get through the dodge that came out from Radish. Dude, this orb is coming through right now. Radish is finding nice. Yep, just the right amount of spacing two, to get win. these hits, but then also close it out. We're going into a game four, Sparky. Lores seems very concentrated. He's going to have to figure out how to adapt to this Raidish Petra, who has already done a great job of adapting to Lores's Kaya. Can Three, he keep it going, though? Two, one, brawl. That's what it all comes down to. Sticking with the same characters, no character changes at all. I like that. Quick opening right to the gauntlets. And I feel like you need to play with these gauntlets a little bit more, right? Again, quick frame data. You got to get right in the face. But we've been seeing some of these combos that Raiders has been opening up. 
the bow, man, is just not finding its way in. It's not quite as dominant as we saw previously. He is adding up some decent damage here. Bottom side of that downline, and then Radish picks up three. Lorez picks up the recovery, but right before that, Radish picked up three. Oh, he just happened to side air the wrong direction. They're trading back and forth. Lorez still has just a little bit of a lead. There's the sideline side air, gonna even everything up. Yep. Oh, oh that's that close. Huge. That was very close by the skin of their teeth. Keeping that orb in play here. Yep, dialing it back. Nice! Double recovery, picking up so high in the air. That is going to be the KO off the top. We could see this start to slip away from Lorez. Rage in a great spot. It's a massive lead. Back to back, in lights coming out. Oh, this is getting so intense here. Oh, what's the play? He's got to wrap it up. Yep. Can you close it out, though? Finish it! Ah! Unfortunate, wasn't able to finish their plate, and that means Raiders gets to keep the stock alive here, and they are already quite in the red, too. Yeah, Laura is really struggling to end this one. Even that side is going to bounce off the main stage, take away some of that force. He gravity canceled just above the bow D-Light. Lorez does turn it around, still get the KO, but what a beautiful GC D-Light that came out from Radish. Anticipating the bow D-Light from Lorez. Yep. And it is a little unfortunate losing that stock, right? But you got some good damage out there. You can keep that momentum going. Honestly, just being a little bit aggressive here. I think Raiders is definitely putting up the aggro. I think Lorez needs the spear at this point. Yep. The bow is just not making it work. Unfortunately, the weapon spawn is going to come in, but it's as Lorez is spawning back into the game. He's not able to make a move and grab it with iframes. He's being very oh. careful, even when in a sweat beat, and it's a bow. Not going to be what he's looking for until, hold on now, got the turnaround there, got that reset with the second side light the other direction. Okay, he's adding up some good damage here. E -e -e. Getting juggled. This is huge. Oh, Did that's he reset? Big. He wow. did not reset his jumps. Lorez just barely plucked him out of the air as he was coming in for a landing. The landing gear was down. The tires of the plane almost kissed the ground, but not quite. It's crazy because it might be like Lorez is listening to us. I'll show you how to play the bow. I'll show you what I got. <laughs> Good, do it. I like. I, I want Lorez to do really well. He's one of my favorite players right now. So you're like, yeah, prove me wrong. Go ahead. You doubt me? There is a weapon spawn on the field. No, either player making a huge move for it. Loris is playing around it. Yeah, I feel like Loris wants to kind of play that mid range a little bit more, right? Especially because you got the orb in play. Try to poke out here a little bit. Oh, oh that's big. Can he make it back? Loris can end it right Ooh. here. He's up 2 1 in the set. The recovery, not going to do it. It was so close. Oh, God, this is a little bit terrifying. Goes for the sick. Not able to get the hit that they need, but the goal is in hand for Radish. Neutral light coming out. Loris sent to the side. He didn't get hit with the side air. Turns around. It's the side air. Radish over on the edge. Oh, my God. Please don't do anything crazy, oh, Loris. Please don't. Oh, no. Please don't ah. do anything crazy. Please don't do anything crazy. Dude, it's just so terrifying here. Gets another bow. Where is his spear? <laughs> Not going to be able to I don't to understand. Ah. I swear I've seen him pick up 10 bows in a row. Dude, look at that red, though. Oh, oh my God. Oh, dude. I'm so afraid this is going to slip away from Loris. It's going to turn into purple, dude. Have we ever seen no. purple in this game? Oh, oh he's still living. Loris trying to find a way down. Another one. Oh, my God. Both these players literally on the last possible hits they could ever have. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good choice win. from Lorez there. D-Light in light is true as well. It kills significantly later than D-Light recovery does, but at that point, it did not matter. Look at how much damage he had to do. Oh 639. Lorez barely taking that 1-3-1. One, one. Did not want to force it to a game five. I want to see the damage on the other side here too. 508. My goodness, man. Dude, That's efficiency, do, man. Uh, having to do another 130 just to even catch up there. I mean, honestly, they wouldn't need to. It's just a couple hits and probably to turn that around. But man, those last interactions really could have been anybody's game. I forgot to breathe at one point. I felt incredibly lightheaded. I feel like I've seen so many moments like that, specifically with Radish. And when I saw him pick up the orb, at the end, I was like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I've seen Radish <laughs> clutch these moments, pick up the orb, side light, side air, hundreds. It feels like hundreds of times. Yep. And I thought that was it for Lorez in that moment. Man, what a game. Every set has been a banger so far today. I don't think any set has been truly dominant. Yes, we've seen a couple 3-0s, but like, it really came down to the wire. Maybe a couple 2 socks, but man, just lots of great back and forth gameplay from all of our competitors so far today. And the action's not even over with. 
That is going to be Lorez moving on. He's going to be going up against you. So we are going to see SA versus SA. One of them will have to go down into the elimination bracket. But let's check in on the elimination side. It's going to be Radish versus Jetbean. That is his next opponent oh. after losing to Lorez there. But yeah, Shu, 